ABC News presents Political Spirit of 76. This is the final chapter of this bicentennial election year. Tonight from ABC News Election Center in New York, the results. Election night. Good evening. I'm Harry Reisner at ABC Election Headquarters. With me are Barbara Walters and Howard K. Smith. And we'll be here for as long as it takes to determine exactly what happened tonight. At the moment, uh, in this first election of our third century, about 2% of the nation's precincts have reported. And in the popular vote, with about a million or a little bit more than a million votes counted, Gerald Ford is leading Jimmy Carter 53% to 47%. That falls in the classification of being interesting but not significant. We do, however, already have some projections. Howard K. Smith can tell us about one. Well, the first individual state projection we've had, Harry, is Kentucky. Kentucky goes to Jimmy Carter. ABC News projects that Carter will take uh, Kentucky with its nine electoral votes, thanks to the hard work done by Kentucky's congressional delegation and its governor, Julian Carroll, all Democrats. The interesting feature about that race is that uh, Carter won every group in the state, blacks, whites, Protestants, Catholics, people in cities, and people in rural areas. Uh, Barbara has a more significant result. Well, I have a result from Indiana. Indiana, ABC Project, has gone to President Ford. This was expected. It was close, but it was expected that Ford would win this. And had he not won it, it really would have been quite an upset. The blacks in Indiana voted nearly 90% for Jimmy Carter, and it was the biggest turnout of blacks in that state. It was a record number, but still it was not enough to offset President Ford's victory. 13 electoral votes in Indiana for the president. I think we should take just a quick look only at the people who will be assisting us in major areas tonight. Frank Reynolds will be covering the races for the United States Senate, 33 of them. Don Farmer will be covering all 435 races for the House. He knows all of the men and all of the opponents and will uh, be able to give us anything we need to know at any given moment. And Ann Compton will be following the 14 races for governor. We'll be hearing from them frequently. It should be a fascinating night. And one of the things we should uh, note at the beginning as we picked up that popular vote total. You can't tell much at uh, 7.04 at night about what's going to happen. And one of the things that uh, certainly will happen is that uh, initially, in the first couple of hours, Jimmy Carter will probably have a substantial electoral vote total that will not necessarily, uh, will not necessarily mean he's going to win the election because his votes will come in early from the parts of the South where he's very strong. The first clues will begin to come in a little bit later with states like Connecticut and Ohio. At that point, we'll begin to see how the shape of this year's voting goes. We will be hearing from time to time through the evening from Lewis Harris, who has been keeping track by, uh, for ABC News of the mood of the country all through this summer. We'll be hearing from Theodore White, who is writing his, what, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth making of the president <laughs> and is going to uh, give us a preface on it tonight. All of those people will help us find out what's going to, what is actually going on. I think people have begun to hear that it's a larger turnout of, of uh, registered voters than had been expected, at least it seems to be now from some of the returns, and it had been the feeling that this larger turnout would help Jimmy Carter, although there are now others in the other camp who say not necessarily because it's more Republicans voting as well as more Democrats voting, so don't necessarily take that as a harbinger of what's going to you had precedence for both, Barbara. When there was a very low turnout in 1948, it hurt the Republicans. Dewey, Dewey was defeated due to that low turnout. Yet the uh, low turnouts in, uh, in, for example, the last election, 72, uh, put Nixon across in the landslide. Some people say that the turnout is being affected by um, people's reaction to the media, and I don't mean television, I don't mean just us, I mean the newspapers and everything else, and that... Uh, they have been told all summer by all the surveys that they were apathetic and weren't going to vote. And they have sub said something rather strong tonight about uh, whether or not we can tell them what they're going to do. Uh, we don't really want to tell people what they're going to do. I think people don't realize how much we worry about what that effect might be. One other worry was that the fact that some states are coming in that, that the projections are being made might influence voters in polls that have not yet closed. And yet in, in surveys and examinations and studies in the past, it has turned out that this is not so, that early projections do not influence other voters in other states, uh, which is why you may be hearing projections even though your own polling booths uh, may not have closed yet. 
We, uh, next to the presidential race itself, the most cent some of the most interesting races are for the Senate. 33 Senate seats are up for re-election tonight. Frank Reynolds is keeping track of those, and we already have one important result at least. Frank, could you tell us about it? Yes, Howard. ABC News now projects, uh, not to anybody's surprise, I guess, that in Indiana, the first incumbent to bite the dust this evening is Vance Hartke, uh, the Democratic senator from Indiana. He will be defeated by Richard Luger, the former mayor of Indianapolis, by a comfortable margin. Now, Mr. Luger, Senator-elect Luger, as he will be when all the votes are counted, uh, is leading by, uh, oh, about five or six points. Six points, actually. And uh, that is a few points ahead of the projection for President uh, Ford. So here is Mr. Luger, who will take Vance Harkey's seat in the Senate. Two other races that we're going to be watching very closely tonight may give us some idea of the pulling power of the top of the ticket. They are in Ohio, where Howard Metzenbaum is in a ding-dong struggle with uh, Senator Robert Taft. This race is considered uh, almost too close to call uh, by any of the pollsters, although the heavy turnout there today is said to be an indication that perhaps uh, Jimmy Carter and Howard Metzenbaum may do very well indeed. The other state we're going to be watching is very, very close and very important, and it is Pennsylvania. The polls will close there in about uh, 50 minutes or so at 8 o'clock Eastern Time. And this is between John Heinz III and Bill Green, both attractive congressmen, uh, Green the Democrat and uh, Heinz the Republican. Heinz probably has spent more money than anybody else this year in American politics. It's estimated that uh, he probably will spend as much as $2 million in his effort to uh, win. I talked to a man in Pennsylvania today who said that the latest word shows green ahead by one percentage point. One percentage point. So that really means that they're practically in a dead heat. And uh, we'll have to be watching that to see whether the top of the ticket, Mr. Ford and Governor Carter, uh, have any effect on what happens in that senatorial contest. Well, there are quite a few governor, uh, governor races uh, to be decided tonight. And for a report on that, here's Ann Compton. Frank, ABC's first projection of the evening is no surprise in Indiana. The incumbent Republican Governor Otis Bowen is projected to win by a comfortable margin. Bowen is uh, expected to defeat the Democratic Secretary of State Larry Conrad, who is a protege of uh, the senator, the Democratic senator from the state, Birch Five. Bowen is a popular 58-year-old physician. Some Democrats were even lamenting during the campaign voting against Bowen was like voting against Marcus Welby. Bowen's coattails were expected to help President Ford in this state. And next door in Illinois, President Ford was hoping also to ride the coattails of Big Jim Thompson, the Republican candidate for governor there. Thompson's the six foot six former prosecutor who's uh, expected to take his two million dollar campaign rolling right over Richard Daley's Democratic machine and its candidate Michael Howlett, who is a state official in Illinois. In West Virginia, it is very likely to be a Democratic state. Jay Rockefeller IV, who is making his second run for governor, is expected to uh, uh, overcome the image of a carpetbagger from his, the Rockefeller family's northeast base. And uh, his competition is a former governor of West Virginia, Cecil Underwood, who 20 years ago, or about that, was elected governor. No big surprise is expected tonight, but then some of these 14 governor's races are very, very close, as close as the presidential returns are expected to be. Howard? And I have a, another projection, another state, Georgia. According to ABC News projection, Jimmy Carter will, of course, take Georgia with its 12 electoral votes. Uh, Georgia has, in the past a few presidential elections, strayed to Goldwater, to Nixon, to Wallace, and now, it, like the prodigal son, has come home and given its favorite son a vote. Harry was talking about uh, Richard Lugar winning the uh, most important Senate race so far. Lugar was so confident that he didn't campaign all the time, uh, Frank. He uh, came three days a week. He taught at the uh, Central College in, um, in Indianapolis. Well, the House races are a little more difficult than yours, Frank. And Don Farmer has those. And Don, you're welcome to them. What about them? Howard, we have a lot of changes expected in the House tonight, but not by party. Democrats fully expect to retain and maintain their almost two-to-one majority. Republicans may pick up 10 or 12 seats. But there will be some changes. For example, the leadership will be different. The Speaker, Carl Albert, is retiring. Tip O'Neill will take over. He's a tough, garrulous, old-style Boston politician. He'll be a tough foe for either president, especially if Mr. Ford's re-elected. Other changes may take place because of the personal problems of some of the people involved. I know you've heard all about that. 
There are stories of divorce and remarriage, which may affect some results. For example, in Indiana, Congressman Andrew Jacobs is the apparent winner. He was not in any serious trouble, but his wife may be. She divorced another man to marry Jacobs uh, not long ago. She's running in Kansas' second district. No returns on her yet. And there'll be other stories of personal problems. Actually, we'll be seeing 435 separate contests tonight, but they have no overriding cross-the-board issues. The Democrats are representing their constituents more and their national party less, it seems. And that trend seems assured no matter who wins tonight. So at this moment, to recap, there are 46 Democrats and six Republicans elected as, uh, or apparently elected so far. And that's because none of them have major party opposition. In fact, 30 of them are in races where they couldn't find anybody at all to run against them. So we courageously project them right now as the winners. And that's the look of the House right now. A postscript to Don's story in Indiana about Martha Keyes, who's running from Indiana. The problem seems to be that some of her uh, people who might vote for her think that since she's married a fellow from Kansas, she's not going to give proper representation to Indiana, but it doesn't seem to work the reverse. His uh, constituents don't seem to be worried about that. There are 19 women in the last uh, House of Representatives lineup. We don't know how many there will be in the future one, but it's not expected that there'll be too much change. Well, what kind of an evening is it going to be? Is it going to be a squeaker or is it going to be a landslide? We hope to get some clues from the man who's been providing clues for many years. Teddy White, Theodore Wright, Theodore White, a political analyst and author who has written The Making of the President in 60, 64, 68, and 72. How does it look tonight in 76, Teddy? For the past 20 years, we've had only two kinds of election in our country, squeakers or landslides. Kennedy's 60 squeaker followed by 64 Johnson landslide. Nixon's 68 squeaker followed by his 72 landslide. And we can't tell yet tonight whether we're going to what we're going to have or whether it breaks the pattern. All we're sure of is the transfer of confirmation of power. But in this campaign, power without any clear, predictable direction. I remember Kennedy saying in 1960, the morning after his election in Hyannis Port, the margin is thin, but the responsibility is clear. This time, the direction of this responsibility is not clear. This campaign has revolved around character and personality more than any other in recent American history. And the direction of power is hidden in their character and in their personalities. So whether squeaker or landslide, we face the same mystery of our future with which we began the year. Thank you, Teddy. Right now, we have got uh, oh, around 1,200,000 votes in nationally. About 2% of the nation's precincts have already reported. Gerald Ford, the incumbent Republican, has a 52 to 47% lead over Jimmy Carter. As yet, I say that's 2%, not representative, not uh, enough for any kinds of conclusions. Coming up next, more of our continuous election coverage right after this. With just a very few uh, votes beginning to come in as this election night begins, it's probably a good time to lay, take a look at the candidates and uh, what they're doing, how they're spending the evening. We'd like to begin by going to Tom Gerald, who is with President Ford's group. Tom? Harry, there's a, uh, an ambulance passing up Pennsylvania Avenue, but that's the only excitement going on here tonight. You may hear it in the background. The president is buttoned up, as they say. He's up in the mansion behind me on the second floor in the residence having dinner with his running mate and with a number of friends who helped out during the campaign, Joe Garagiola, the sportscaster, who added a lot of zest and pepper and uh, interest in the campaign in the latter stages, and Edith Green, the former Democratic congresswoman from Oregon. They're having a quiet dinner, and then uh, they're going to be following the returns. In fact, they probably already are. So far, the race in Indiana seemed to go as the White House expected. Uh, while we were there in Indianapolis a few days ago, one political observer said he thought that Richard Luger's coattails were broad enough to carry Gerald Ford along with, and that appears to be the case tonight. Uh, Mr. Ford will be following the returns, and later tonight, as a trend develops or as we have something more definite, he plans to go and see some of his supporters in a hotel here in Washington. Harry? We'll be going back to Tom and to uh, look at what, how the president spends the evening as the hours go by. At the moment, 2% of the precincts in in popular vote, uh, something like a million two hundred thousand. Gerald Ford is leading with 52% to Jimmy Carter's 47%. Obviously, as yet, not a significant difference. Uh, so far, no surprises, I would think, except the size of the vote. Would you agree, Howard? No, I thought, for example, um, that it was generally conceded that Vance Hockey, who has won the Senate in Indiana three times, has run out of luck. 
each time he's had a lucky streak. First, there was the Eisenhower recession that brought him in. Then there was some big split in the Democratic Party. Then there was Vietnam. And he just ran out of luck, and Mr. Lugar beat him tonight. In spite of uh, Lugar being once known as Richard Nixon's favorite mayor. Well, he kind of shed that. He shed it very fast indeed, and he was a good mayor. Now, we've been covering this terrible election year. I say terrible in that it's difficult. Uh, by intuition and impression and by asking a few people, but Lou Harris has been covering it by measuring it scientifically. Lou, what have you got to say about the results so far? Uh, Howard, uh, what we find here is Kentucky, which is the first state Governor Carter took. Uh, it was a little low for him. Indiana was about as expected for President Ford. That could mean the possible pitting of the South and the border states for Carter against the Midwest for Ford, in which case we'll have to wait till we get to the big populist East to see which way this election is going. One thing I would point out is that turnout in Kentucky and Indiana, where a substantial amount of the vote is in, was not higher, not higher than, in, than four years ago. So perhaps we'll find turnout higher elsewhere. We did not in those two Midwest and border states. Well, we'll have more results coming up next, more of our continuous election coverage right after this. ABC News is now able to make another state prediction in the state of Alabama with its nine electoral votes. Uh, it will go for Jimmy Carter by a comfortable margin. That, again, is no surprise so far. It does give uh, Mr. Carter now 30 electoral votes to Ford, for 13 for Ford in our projections. But that's, uh, again, what was expected that with the, South re the Southeast reporting first, uh, Governor Carter would take an early lead. It is not yet significant. And as uh, Lou Harris said, maybe even the turnout is not all that great, although you had another... Uh, well, in Massachusetts, it's reported that the turnout today could top the record, which was 91.6% who voted in 1960 for John Kennedy. Very, very uh, high turnout in Massachusetts, and Massachusetts has been expected to go for Carter. One, uh, yes. one thing that should be, uh, that we should also note, that if you are in an area where you can still vote, which you could if you were in New York City, for instance, and you certainly could if you were in California or most of the Midwest or the West. If you hadn't voted, uh, go vote. Mm -hmm. Make some kind of a decision. We've had several other independent reports on turnout among uh, uh, individual states. Ohio's turnout was very heavy this morning. It's attributed to the mass massive voter drive by organized labor. Maine, the turnout was heavy, heavy throughout the state. And so it is in many other states. Uh, Michigan, strong early this morning. Mm -hmm. At this point, we just to recap, Alabama and Georgia and Kentucky have gone for Carter and Indiana have, in terms of our projection in Indiana, ABC projects has gone for Ford. And there are no real surprises in any of those, except that uh, uh, maybe in Kentucky, Governor Carter didn't do as well as he might have hoped he would. Maybe in Alabama he didn't. But uh, of course, in this system, if you win a state by one vote, you get all of that state's electoral votes, which uh, at the moment gives him 30 to 13. Uh, I don't know when we'll begin to see the definitive things. The polls in Connecticut, which are re is regarded as a place that could be very decisive and very indicative very early, close at 8. All of Connecticut has voting machines. Uh, the Democratic uh, National Committee say Connecticut is the most important thing they're going to look at in the first hour. I'd like to go quickly to Frank Reynolds for a note. Yes, Harry, uh, ABC News. Harry, ABC News is now ready to project... Uh, the senatorial contest in Florida, as expected, Lawton Childs, the Democratic incumbent, is the victor by a wide margin. He will be the winner by a wide margin. Lawton Childs in Florida. Lawton Harry? Childs, I think, was the man who first won that seat by uh, walking up and down the state. And that's the national election story at 22 minutes after the hour. This is Howard K. Smith back in ABC News election headquarters with Barbara Walters and Harry Reisner. The national presidential vote count is very young and green yet. Two percent of the precincts have reported in throughout the nation. The results are forward with 50 percent and probably a little less than a little more than 50 percent. Carter with uh, with 50 percent. Also, it's changing as you watch in electoral votes. 
Carter leads with 38 electoral votes to Ford's 13 electoral votes, but as we pointed out often and will point out again, the early results are bound to be pro-Carter results. It's the same pattern that was followed in the Kennedy-Nixon uh, election in 1960 when in the first 10 results it looked as though Kennedy had swept the race, but by the evening, by the evening's end, the race was very close indeed. Uh, Harry Reasoner has an individual state result. If you remember in that case of uh, Kennedy and Nixon in 1960, Howard, there was no evening's end. At about 3 a.m., Pierre Salinger came out and said that Senator Kennedy was not going to claim victory that night. And it could be like that tonight. One of the reasons Jimmy Carter has that early electoral vote lead, 38 to 13, is that ABC News is now able to project him the winner in South Carolina by a comfortable margin. South Carolina had been believed to be leaning toward Carter, but a comfortable margin probably sounds pretty good to him. Barbara? Well, Georgia has already gone to uh, Jimmy Carter. ABC made that projection, and that's no surprise, because, of course, Georgia is the home state of the Carters. And in Georgia now, in Plains, Georgia, is Jimmy Carter's 78-year-old mother, Lillian Carter, and she is with Jim Kincaid. And I'll bet she doesn't feel 78. I'll bet she feels about uh, 21 with all the excitement tonight. How do you feel, Miss Lillian? How is the family? I feel wonderful, Barbara. It's just so nice to hear your voice. Thank you. I feel so confident. Have you seen your son recently, and can you tell us yes. what the family is doing? I saw him this afternoon down here, about two hours ago, and they in Atlanta. I'm staying in Plains. Miss Lillian, why did you decide to stay in Plains rather than go to Atlanta? Oh, well, the Plains is my home. I'm never crazy about going to any city. I just like a small town. Jimmy asked me the same thing. Why don't you go to Atlanta? But these people here have been so wonderful to us. They've given them money and their time, and I think this is my place. You've been listening to some of the returns coming in. What yeah. do you think of what you heard so far? I didn't hear too many of them. I was on, en route here, mm -hmm. and I didn't hear too many. What are the returns? Well, we've been hearing a, a, a significant uh, lead, if we can yeah. call it that, in these very, very early going in the electoral vote count. Yeah. But uh, there are a lot yeah. of other conflicting figures. Well, I enjoy anything is, if it's for Jimmy. If it's for Ford, I don't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> Miss Lillian, before we end this interview, I would like you to convince my colleagues in New York that I work very hard when I come to play. <laughs> he doesn't work at all. <laughs> <laughs> he just sits around and does nothing. No, he's a very hard worker. He, it's, it's hard for him to find me when he comes down here, but I think he's a very hard worker, and I think he needs a raise. <laughs> <laughs> well, I doubt if that'll happen. Uh, <laughs> People? Miss Lillian, you have said that you will not go to Washington if your son does become president. You will absolutely not move there? No, no Ma, Barbara. I'm a small town. I'm a hick. Do you know what a hick is, Barbara? <laughs> yes, yeah. I do know what a hick is. Well, I come from kind of a small town myself, not quite as small as Plain. Not as small How do you think your son, who is a, a small towner, who uh, may be a hick, uh, is going to do in that big city? He's going to do all right because he's progressed. Uh, slowly from a being a hick to a large town. I think it'd be great. Bob, I think he's going to be the best president we've ever had. Well, the returns will tell this evening what does happen. In any yes. event, we thank you, Miss Lillian, for thank being with us. And Jim Kincaid, it's been a pleasure to have you on with us. Thank you, Bob. It's part of the evening. Thank you. Howard? Uh, Harry Reasoner gave the results of the South Carolina vote just a moment ago. I think it's a matter of trivial interest that uh, Jimmy Carter's name appears as Jimmy Carter on the ballot in every state in the Union and the District of Columbia, but not in South Carolina. South Carolina law requires that his name go on the ballot with his full Christian name, uh, uh, James Earl Carter. Junior. In Washington, Senator Robert Dole, the vice presidential candidate on the Republican ticket, is standing by with Herbert Kaplow. Herb, would you come in? On the uh, patio of the Watergate apartment complex where Senator Dole lives, Senator, what's your theory as to why the turnout seems to be so heavy? Well, we had good weather, and I think there was a great deal of interest. Uh, maybe the debates, uh, I'm not certain, but they're, uh, we'll wait and see what the final percentage is. What did you think was the primary issue that you had to contend with? I think perhaps the economy and uh, unemployment as far as their issues. Uh, our strength uh, was in the president's efforts, uh, again, in the economy and also the peace issue. I think Howard has a question for us. Huh? Herbert, Time magazine suggested that the man who wins this uh, contest, the presidential candidate who wins, will be the one who makes the, the next to last mistake. Whom does the senator think made the next to last mistake? 
Well, I really don't know. I think perhaps it's a little early. I, mean, I may think of uh, something before long, but uh, right now it's uh, too early to tell. Uh, mistakes were made, of course, on both sides. I don't know who made the last one or the next to last one. You know, Senator, in line with that, when we were up in Oregon the other day, a Republican there showed me a poll in which one of the findings was when people were asked why they were f most for President Ford, the answer was he was, quote, the lesser of two evils. When they were asked why they were most for Carter, the answer was it was time for a change. Well, I think there, there may be some, uh, I didn't see that poll, but, uh, uh, and I don't, I think President Ford, of course, was the best choice because of the experience he had and his demonstrated leadership and that he was uh, a man of unquestioned honesty and integrity. Uh, I didn't see the particular poll in Oregon. Did you run into uh, these signs of public skepticism about these two people? Oh, I think so. I think you go up and down the fence or uh, after a speech, uh, uh, it was there. I think there was uh, some unrest, uh, some restlessness about uh, the candidates, uh, as there always is. I don't know any more this year than ever. Well, you, of course, have Watergate hanging over uh, the Republican Party, although you tried to uh, divorce the party from it. Well, Watergate uh, is our burden, as I've said before, and uh, it may cut... Uh, it apparently was uh, cutting some because Mondale used it almost on a daily basis. We had all, on the other hand, uh, uh, strength and peace and uh, a, a very uh, man of great character in President Ford. So I think we're going to win the election. Why did most of your campaigning seem to be among friendly audiences? Well, that was uh, somewhat our, not our strategy, but we felt, first of all, we needed to bring Republicans together uh, our convention, of course, followed theirs by several weeks. Uh, there was just a bit of disunity. Uh, we wanted to rev our troops up and get them to work, and uh, we think we've succeeded in that. It's early in the evening now, but is there any bellwether state you're looking toward? I don't know. Some indicate that North Carolina may be a key. Uh, it's a very close, uh, also my wife's home state, but uh, uh, that if Carter doesn't win big in Massachusetts, uh, I'm not... We want to go to Ann Compton now for a result in West Virginia. Howard, it appears that West in West Virginia, it is no surprise, Jay Rockefeller will be uh, taking, according to ABC News projection, will be taking the state of West Virginia by a wide margin. There's only a tiny vote in so far, but 67% of the vote over Cecil Underwood wouldn't be at all surprising. Rockefeller, of course, tried to run uh, four years ago hadn't quite shed the image of uh, an Easterner, a, a carpetbagger, although he says he had been in the state for uh, some 13 years. Rockefeller would be one of the youngest governors of the state, a more progressive voice than uh, perhaps some of the past governors. Rockefeller has spent a lot of his own money, well over a million dollars for the campaign that uh, is costing him about two and a half million. He will be running over Cecil Underwood, who uh, 20 years ago, almost 20 years ago, was elected as the youngest governor ever in West Virginia. Underwood has tried several other times to run for governor and senator, but has been defeated. And it appears, according to ABC News projection, that uh, he will lose again tonight. Uh, also in Indiana, ABC's projection has Otis Bowen, the incumbent Republican, hanging on to that state house over Larry Conrad, who's a protege of Senator Birch Bayh. Harry? Thank you, Ann. We should talk a little bit about how we do what we're doing tonight. As you've noted, we've made several projections. And we will project winners in each state shortly after the polls close. Here's how that works. We've selected some 3,000 election precincts across the country as being typical of certain categories of voters. And tonight, in each of those key precincts, there are volunteers from the League of Women Voters, the same organization that sponsors the presidential debates. And as soon as the polls close in the state, the League volunteers telephone the early vote counts to other volunteers that you see here at our computer center in Connecticut. Past voting histories are already in the computer. When there's enough information, our decision desk projects the winners. Coming up next, more of our continuous election night coverage right after this. We're back now. We want to bring you uh, some of the results of races that are too soon to call. One of them, which is very interesting, is in Florida. Now, Florida has been uh, predicted that it will go for Jimmy Carter. At this point, though, that's, it's quite close. With 4% of the precincts in, Carter has 53% 53, 53 of the vote, and Ford has 47%.
it was too soon to call that, but uh, it shows how how close, how many of the races still are, and uh, it is predicted will continue to be all night long. When we saw Senator Doe a few moments ago, I was thinking not just of him, but of Senator Mondale. And how's this for cool? Senator Mondale had said went to the dentist this afternoon that he'd had a. He said he'd been talking a great deal, and he figured this was a good day to have some work done on his teeth. And uh, at this point, we're waiting to see uh, uh, Jimmy Carter in plain. Is he, he's in plain shorts. Right? I suppose this would be the first day in. Uh in a couple of months when uh, the presidential and vice presidential candidates didn't really have all that much to do and a good time to go to the dentist. Mm -hmm. You always wonder how they get that in. Once your president is all right, the dentist comes the to dentist you. Comes the dentist comes to you, right? Yeah. Everything comes to you. And he doesn't like to. My dentist is the president's dentist and he likes to do work in his own, in his own office. office. He says the uh, tools are out of date in the White House. <laughs> I have a correction to make. I said that in South Carolina, James Earl Carter Jr. was the name on the ballot, the only state in the union. Well, James Earl Carter Jr. made a special plea to the state legislature in South Carolina, so they let him put the name Jimmy Carter on the ballot, too. So he's Jimmy Carter everywhere. Now, in Atlanta, Jimmy Carter is uh, approaching the Omni Hotel in Atlanta, and uh, we hope to have a report from there in just a moment. That's part of an Omni setter a World Congress Center, they've got a con convention hall, they've got a hotel, they've got a, a couple of sports arenas. It's uh, part of what has made Atlanta such an exciting city for contractors and builders and convention goers in the last few years. Probably for staffs of presidents of Carter Wins tonight. Here comes Mr. Governor Carter. Uh, since he's already apparently checked in, he will not be carrying his suit bag and suitcase tonight <laughs> as he has throughout the campaign. He hasn't sounded as hoarse as President Ford. President Ford could barely talk tonight, maybe because Jimmy Carter's been talking somewhat softer. Maybe it's better amplifying system. He has not been on the, had that voice breakdown. I think the uh, hoarseness of the voice is related directly to the Governor, amount you have to catch up. You, how do you feel about the turnout so far? Well, I think the turnout's very exciting, and it's not a surprise to me. In the last uh, couple of weeks, there's been a tremendous demonstration of uh, fervent interest in the campaign with uh, the size of the crowds and also with the intensity of feeling. And I'm very grateful at the large turnout. I think that's uh, something that works in my favor. Do you think the turnout indicates that perhaps the polls were al wrong all along and that it's going to be a bigger vote for you? Are you going to win by a big margin or is it going to be close? Know. have to wait and see. I don't know. You are heard in uh, Kentucky, Alabama, and Georgia right now. Are you very satisfied with that? Satisfied with those three states, yes. What, are you afraid that your uh, the governor didn't get that question? Well, that was David Snell questioning Governor Jimmy Carter, the candidate for the presidency, who is at present doing very well, leading in the electoral vote, though not much in the popular vote. The popular vote at present, with 3% of the nation's precincts in, reporting in, is 51% for Carter, 49% for President Ford. And the electoral vote is uh, 38 electoral votes for Carter to 13 for the president. But once again, we warn you, the early returns are bound to be pro-Carter returns. It was interesting just now to see uh, Rosalind Carter. We're going to have to learn uh, several new pronunciations. We already have. We've learned Rosalind, not Rosalind. Rosalind's easy. You'll, come, you'll get it. I'll get it. Coming up next, uh, more of our continuous election night coverage right after this. Well, we're now returning with 3% of the popular vote in. Uh, Jimmy Carter holding a narrow lead over Gerald Ford, 51% to 48%, just a little over a million each. Howard? Well, we have another state projection. The state of West Virginia has gone Democratic once more, as it usually does. West Virginia, with its six electoral votes, is projected to go to Jimmy Carter in tonight's election. It's no wonder, because everything was working far quarter there. Senator Byrd, the powerful senator from West Virginia, Jay Rockefeller, who may be elected governor tonight, both supported him. The UMW, the mine workers, support him. It's a Democratic New Deal state, and so he had everything going for him. There are some. There is a result, a very important result, in uh, in in another state nearby in the Senate race, and Frank Reynolds has that. 
Is Howard in Virginia? The independent Senator Harry Byrd, uh, according to ABC News projection of the available vote at this time, will be the victor in his campaign for re-election over Elmo Zumwalt, a former sailor. He was actually chief of naval operations, and this was his first try for political office. Senator Byrd continues the tradition of the uh, Byrd representation in Washington from the state of Virginia. He is actually an independent. He's so listed politically on the ballot, he votes with the Democrats in organizing the Senate, and then some Democrats believe he votes with the Republicans on every measure that comes before the Senate. But at any rate, according to our projection, he has or will be the victor in his race for re-election. We've also earlier projected uh, the victory tonight of Richard Luger, the former mayor of Indianapolis, over Vance Hartke, the Democratic incumbent from the state of Indiana. And ABC News, quite some time ago, projected, too, uh, the victory of Lawton Childs from the state of Florida. By a wide margin, he's the Democratic incumbent over uh, Dr. John Grady, the Republican candidate. One interesting thing about this was that uh, uh, Childs, the incumbent, actually challenged his opponent to a series of televised debates. The opponent, uh, Dr. Grady, is a very forceful speaker, but Childs wasn't afraid of him, and he wanted everybody to understand that Grady is a member of the National Council of the John Birch Society. That's something that Grady's proud of, and so he didn't attempt to hide it, and apparently uh, it didn't help him very much in the state of Florida. Barbara? We're all talking about Florida. Florida, one of the Big Ten states with 17 electoral votes. ABC projects that it has gone to Jimmy Carter. It has been a close race. It was expected to be a close race. It would have been an upset had it gone to Ford. 17 electoral votes. Florida projected for Jimmy Carter. Coming up next, we'll have more of our continuous election coverage. We'll bring you all the reports right after this. So far in the presidential race, Jimmy Carter has taken one, two, three, four, five, six states, and President Ford only one state. But no, two states. I believe Indiana and Florida. That's two states. No, no Florida went to Carter. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, and the, the right. interesting thing about that is that uh, uh, while we expected Jimmy Carter to take those southeastern states first and jump into a lead, he has already taken five more states than the Democratic nominee did in 1972. Uh, when Georgia government took one state in the District of Columbia. And I, he... I know it was confusing since I just reported Florida. What was going through my mind is that many people have said that Florida is really like two states, that the northern part is uh, votes like the north and the southern part more or less votes like the other, other way around. The southern part votes like the south. Help me. The southern part <laughs> votes like the north okay. and the northern part votes like the south. Okay, right. now I've got it right. And that's the, uh, that's the national election story at 52 minutes past the hour. Good evening, and we welcome you back to our coverage. Howard K. Smith, Harry Wiesner, and I'm Barbara Waters. And at this point, let us give you both the popular and the electoral vote. With 4% of the precincts reporting in nationally, the popular vote has Jimmy Carter with about a million and a half votes and 52%, and Gerald Ford with about a million four hundred thousand and 48%. But of course, the, the real count, uh, where it matters, is in the electoral vote. 270 needed to to win and Ford has 13 Carter has 61 that is not surprising since most of the states that have come in have been southern states and they have been uh, it was predicted earlier that they would probably go for uh, Jimmy Carter there are some important states which will be coming in uh, we hope fairly soon where polls have closed in Ohio and in Illinois and those are very important states to see which way things will go and also in Mississippi because Mississippi could still go either way that's a very close state and southern state you're uh, you're ignoring my state of Connecticut where the polls oh, were sure. presumably the polls were closed about a minute and a half ago but I it, care about your state of Connecticut because yours, yours may be the only state with a woman senator well, it's not likely, but it's possible it already has the only woman governor. Mm -hmm. so it, uh, but in any event, it's a state that could be extremely significant, a normally Democratic state, where uh, uh, this year, if it, is not, if it does not go Democratic, the Democratic National Committee will start to worry. You know, I don't think we've given enough attention to the state of Florida. 
it's the ninth biggest state in the union in terms of population. It's quite a prize for Carter to get 17 electoral votes more than any of the states we've projected so far. And uh, uh, it, it was denominated by Jimmy Carter as one of his three vital battlegrounds in the South, Virginia, Texas, and Florida, and he won it. Except that uh, it was, I mean, if, if one kept reading how things were going, it was expected to go to Carter. President Ford had tried to make inroads here. He really hadn't seemed to be able to. Of course, Florida was a state that Jimmy Carter took away from George Wallace, and that was a decisive factor for him in the South. Uh, in in uh, winning his projected victory in Florida, Jimmy Carter won all parts of the states except the suburbs, and usually this is again expected, and who knows if the suburban areas might more likely go for Ford and the cities uh, more democratic would go for Carter. The voter turnout in Florida appears to be about the same as it was in 1972. Carter's strongest supports in Florida came from blacks, that's a very important vote in all elections, particularly in this, and they gave him 90% of their support. So if it had gone for Ford, it would have been a great victory for Ford, but it is not really a surprise that it went for Ford. I think you may have an answer already to the question of whether that incident at uh, Jimmy Carter's church on Sunday, what it did to his black support, which is so important to him. You said 90% in Florida and mm -hmm. South Carolina, where uh, we have projected Jimmy Carter the winner. Again, 90% of the black vote went for Carter, uh, and, and that's where he won, in the rural vote. I have a result here of great interest, if I may read it. Uh, the polls in Plains, Georgia have closed and the vote is 481 for Carter to 99 for Gerald Ford. Name me those 99 oh, and I will name you 99 people who will not be allowed to house their peanuts in Jimmy Carter. <laughs> I, have, I have been in Plains, Georgia and there are not 600 people there. There's some kind of chicanery. No, the yes. chicanery is the district in which Plains is the metropolis. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why we have a secret ballot so you never know who those 99 people are. You know, of all of the elections, the House, the Senate, the, the governors, the president, it is only in the House that all 435 members every two years are up for election or re-election. A number of congressmen running for re-election this year have been involved in scandals, which makes for juicy reading, but it doesn't necessarily bring out the votes. But Don Farmas, who's covering the House for us, says that it appears that at least one of them has regained a seat, and I want to know which one. Barbara, it would appear that the first man uh, for whom we have a result tonight who's been involved in a scandal, uh, the election has gone to the man who was, in fact, involved in the scandal. And that's no surprise because he had no opposition, at least no Republican opposition. Robert Sykes, age 70, from the Pensacola, Panama City area of Florida, uh, has won uh, easily with nobody really fighting against him. The interesting thing about Sykes, I think, is that he was actually reprimanded by the House of Representatives, a rare fact indeed. It never happens. It happened to Robert Sykes, reprimanded for some financial problems that he was having. Uh, it didn't seem to matter. He won his primary election by 54,000 votes. Uh, this was the only threat to his long and, I suppose, prominent career in the House of Representatives. He's been there since 1940. The people of his district have spoken, and Robert Sykes is returning to Congress for what would be his, his 19th term. There are others involved in this. I suppose it all started with Watergate. Never before have we been so interested in the private lives of people who represent us in Washington. I guess Wilmer Mills was one of the first. He's gone now from the House. He was the granddaddy of all of the sex scandals, uh, Wilbur Mills and the Argentine firecracker. Mills has rehabilitated himself, and he is retiring from the House now in good spirits and with the respect of his colleagues. Another man, less so, I suppose, is Wayne Hayes, who has retired and resigned and will no longer be in the House of Representatives. He was this year's uh, major scandal. One we'll be looking at tonight in Utah. In the second district there is Alan Howe. He was convicted of soliciting prostitutes. He's expected to lose and perhaps damage some of the other Democrats who are running in other races in the state of Utah. We'll be watching those scandal-ridden races for you and reporting on them later on this evening. Harry? We're going to be keeping track, a running total during the night of the uh, uh, electoral totals as ABC News is able to project them state by state. Right now, Jimmy Carter has six states in his column in what we call the winning lineup board. Florida, Georgia, Alabama, Kentucky, South Carolina, West Virginia. None of them any substantial surprise, but Florida at least very good news for him. Uh, so far, President Ford, as expected in the early part of the evening, is running way behind in projected electoral votes. He has only one state, Indiana, which has uh, given him 13 electoral votes. But as we have noted, uh, not only are these projections, but they are projections from the part of the country that was expected to go for Jimmy Carter. As uh, Lou Harris noted earlier in 1960, 
In the first couple of hours, it looked like a Kennedy landslide, and we were all up the next morning trying to figure out who had won. We had a couple of significant results in, uh, among the 14 races for governor. I'd like to hear about them from Ann Compton. Harry, ABC has two projections to make now. First of all, in Illinois, no surprise at all, the Republican James Thompson is projected by ABC News to win by a comfortable margin over Michael Howlett, a state official, a strong Democrat, but one who uh, just seemed to be run over by Thompson's $2 million campaign. Very little of the vote in so far, but uh, Thompson is expected to run well ahead, and in fact, his coattails are expected to help President Ford. It was a hot race. In fact, the chairman of the State Board of Elections in uh, Illinois predicts that the voting could go as high as 79%, a record. Thompson was hoping to become the first governor ever elected with a million vote margin, but uh, that will have to wait for later results. Another projection by ABC News in North Carolina. This time it is a Democrat, Lieutenant Governor James Hunt, now projected by ABC News to win uh, with a comfortable margin over David Flaherty, a Republican, a former member of the cabinet of the uh, current Republican governor of North Carolina, that is James Holzhauser. You know, they used to say that uh, North Carolina's Democratic Party was all wings and no body. It had uh, problems for several years, but Hunt has the luxury of running with a, a very unified Democratic Party, and that is supposed to be helping Jimmy Carter in North Carolina this year, too. And that's uh, the two projections from the governor's desk. Thank you, Anne. We want to give you the national, the popular vote now. And of course, it has been said that this is an election in which one uh, candidate could win the popular vote and still lose the electoral okay. vote and therefore lose the election. But the popular <clears throat> vote, with 5% of the precincts reporting in, Carter with 1,790,000 votes and 52%, and right. Ford with 48% and 1,645,000 votes. So that's the way it looks now, but it, as, as we've said, it still is fairly close in the popular vote. Well, coming up next, we're going to have more of our election coverage. We're going to pause right now for this. There are many states that are too close to call, and we're watching all of the states with great interest, but some of these states in which it's very close are of particular interest. One in the south is Mississippi, and that has been a battleground state for Ford, and it will be extremely interesting to see what might turn out there. One percent of the vote, and it's 67 percent for Carter and 31 percent for Ford. Seven electoral votes. But what is interesting in this state, this is a toss-up, but it represents the dilemma uh, that a good deal of the south uh, had to face. That is, that Mississippi has not voted for the Democratic presidential candidate since 1956. But Jimmy Carter is a Southerner. In which way does the state go? With its Southern sentiments or with its Republican tradition? And we will see when we know uh, whom the state has finally voted for. The black vote could be particularly important here because it's expected that the black vote would go for Carter. And if it's a strong black vote, that could help them. But keep your eye on Mississippi because that's one of the Southern states that Ford has been hoping for. And if he loses it, it's a disappointment. There are other states which also present this kind of conflict and well, how and how it is. One of those states that presents exactly the same kind of a problem and opportunity for Gerald Ford is uh, North Carolina, which early in the campaign was regarded as solid for Carter, but uh, as the election day neared was thought to be very close. North Carolina has not voted for a Democrat since 1964 when it did vote for Lyndon Johnson. On the other hand, this year it returned to the Democratic column in the in the uh, governor's list, and it may very possibly go for Carter. At the moment, 3% of North Car Carolina's precincts are in. Uh, Jimmy Carter is holding a 59 to 41% lead, but that counted vote doesn't mean much, and there are not enough of ABC's key precincts in to make a judgment on how North Carolina will go tonight. Well, Harry, I have one state that is not too close to call, Tennessee. ABC News projects that Jimmy Carter will carry the state of Tennessee that is not, uh, he will carry it by a comfortable margin. It is no surprise because in the primaries, Tennessee gave Jimmy Carter his second biggest uh, ratio of the vote. Two states in the Middle West that we're watching very closely because they could be decisive. One is Illinois, the fourth largest state in the Union. And in Illinois at present, the raw vote is 6,600 for Carter to 5,300 for Ford means absolutely nothing because fewer than one precinct has reported in. In Ohio, a little bit more, one percent of the precincts have reported in, and Ford is ahead with 54,000 votes to Carter's uh, 42,000. In Cleveland, one of the two men who is fighting a very dramatic battle for the United States Senate 
Uh, Howard Metzenbaum is standing by. Metzenbaum faces Senator Robert Taft Jr. tonight, and Metzenbaum is going to be interviewed by ABC's Ron Miller. We go now to Cleveland. Mr. Metzenbaum, we're told that the people are still waiting in line to vote here in Cleveland. It's a record turnout of voters, apparently. I would think you're heartened. I am heartened. Uh, we wanted a large turnout, uh, and uh, we don't know exactly what that means, but uh, this is ex certainly what we felt was in our best interest to have the greatest number of people go out to the polls, and we also think it's good for democracy to have his, everybody get out to vote, whatever the result may be. I believe Howard has a question for you, Mr. Metzenbaum. Mr. Metzenbaum, you've lost two out of three races for the Senate now, and then once you were appointed to the Senate when William Saxby decided to become Attorney General, are you more confident tonight that you're going to win? Uh, I'm uh, not uh, confident. Uh, I'm hopeful. Uh, I'm anxiously waiting for the returns to come in. Uh, I think that uh, I have a good chance to win. But uh, I'll just wait until the results are announced before I start uh, uh, indicating any confidence. Uh, I addressed myself to what I consider to be the economic issues in this campaign, and I think I did get through to the people of Ohio what I consider to really to be the, uh, what was involved on election day, and uh, I think that it may help my effort. Uh, we'll wait and see a little bit. Uh, we'll Mr. know in a couple of hours. Mr. Metzenbaum, the issue that dogs you in the other two races was a personal one about your income as a businessman, a millionaire businessman. Do you think you've licked that now? Well, it makes it a little bit easier when you're running against another millionaire. <laughs> Only in this case, uh, he inherited his and I earned mine. Uh, I didn't hear much of that uh, during this campaign. And uh, uh, I guess uh, uh, many of the people to whom I spoke, many of the groups to whom I spoke, sort of indicated that uh, going to be a millionaire in the United States Senate, there ought to be one of them who's with the people, uh, and I think I'm that kind of person. <laughs> well, thank you very much indeed, Mr. Metzenbaum. We'll watch with great interest, and the whole nation will, the outcome of that particular dramatic Senate race. Harry? And we've got more word on the Senate, which we're going to get right now from a, a non-millionaire named Frank Reynolds. Yes, but I'm going to talk about a millionaire, Senator Kennedy of uh, Massachusetts. <laughs> Just to continue along the same line, ABC News now projects, to the surprise of absolutely no one in the United States of America, that Senator Edward Kennedy will be re-elected by a wide margin over his uh, Republican opponent, Michael Robertson. Uh, the last time Senator Kennedy won, it was in the 80% bracket. We don't know how big it's going to be this time, but it is no surprise. And also, another uh, projection from an eastern state, and again, this one is not... Uh, going to raise any eyebrows. Senator Harrison Pete Williams of New Jersey, according to ABC News, will be the victor in his race over David Norcross, a man who waged a good fight, but most of the people in uh, New Jersey had never heard of him until very shortly before the campaign came to an end. So those are the two projections uh, that we have right now. Senator Kennedy of Massachusetts and Senator Williams of uh, New Jersey, both Democrats. I was interested to hear Howard Metzenbaum uh, being cautious there a moment ago and talking about his prospects for the Senate. He's got to wait for the returns to come in from Cuyahoga County, which is the area around Cleveland there. And if he can come out of Cuyahoga County with more than 100 and 150,000 votes, actually, he'll be in pretty good shape because he'll have to offset the expected Republican uh, gains by Senator Taft, the incumbent, in uh, Cincinnati and Columbus. We had a report just a moment ago from Ohio that 30% key precincts are now in, and is that the trend is toward the Democrat, uh, Metzenbaum, but it is still too close to call. Barbara? Thank you, Frank. We'll just bring you up to date now. The electoral votes, 270 needed at this point. Jimmy Carter has 71 electoral votes, and Gerald Ford has 13 electoral votes. In the popular race, the it's 6% of the precincts reporting in nationally, and Carter has 53% of the vote to Ford's 47% of the vote. But of course, it is the electoral vote that is the, the count that's needed, and it's the electoral vote that sweeps you or dusts you or brings you into the White House. In addition to the various races that we've been reporting on, president and senator and governor and so forth, a great many states have referendum that can 
uh, really affect not only what happens in their states, but what happens in other states. In Massachusetts, for example, there is the severest uh, referendum on gun control, which would prohibit um, all civilians from owning guns. And if this passes, this could have influence on other states. There are many states that have uh, um, referendums about nuclear power. Atlantic City may make a difference to all of New Jersey because New Jersey is going to vote on whether Atlantic City can have gambling or not, and that could make a tremendous difference to the state. What are some of the others that you might have that you recall from your states? Well, they've got things all across the country. A number of states are voting on whether or not to limit expansion of nuclear power, which mm -hmm. could be a, a, a very serious or a very important change in the way the country is going. Uh, five states are voting on whether or not to require that bottles and cans be returnable for some kind of a deposit or to be recollectable. Uh, a, a very touchy economic issue because there are more jobs involved in non-returnable drink containers, but uh, the ecology is on the side of returnable ones. And it's, it's one of the first times that uh, you've been able to get a popular decision on it. In the past, only Oregon, I think, has had a law saying you had to have returnable bottles. Now tonight, five other states will decide. The ERA is a, a subject that's coming up uh, in the referendum, not in the election. Two states are involved with the ERA. Massachusetts is going to decide whether or not there should be a state ERA uh, bill passed, and Colorado as on their proposition uh, that the ERA, uh, state ERA, uh, could be rescinded. And a very important referendum in California, that which is known as Proposition 14, and which has to do with the unionizing of uh, workers on farms, and that's been an extremely controversial issue. We so all over the country, there are these things to take a look at, as well as the individual races of the people. Robert, the referendum I'm most interested in is a single state which has decided to let the people decide what the tax limit they pay shall be. Colorado. That's Colorado. Mm -hmm. Yes, you can't, raise, you can't raise any state, local, or federal taxes, it said, without the, without the people agreeing to. This is everything from, oh, what, school lunches, I guess, up to what you pay someone. Ah, this is very important, and we're going to stop discussing referendums to tell you about the state of New Jersey, one of the Big Ten states, extremely important. New Jersey has gone to Gerald Ford. It's been close. There are 17 electoral votes. New Jersey to Gerald Ford. This is one of the states that both the candidates were striving for. Uh, there had been some thought that Jimmy Carter might be hurt there because the Democratic governor, uh, Byrne, is unpopular and recently had a state income tax that was unpopular. On the other hand, uh, there were just as many people who would tell you that Gerald Ford wasn't going to get it. But it's important. It's uh, one of the states that people were looking at. New Jersey, 17 electoral votes to Ford. And we will have much more of this. The states are going to be coming in and we'll bring you background as well as the projections. That's the National Election Night story at 22 minutes after the hour. Good evening again for myself and Barbara Walters and Howard K. Smith. 8% of the precincts in this uh, country have now had their votes counted by the News Election Service. And Jimmy Carter is holding a 52 to 47% lead, about 3 million votes to President Ford's 2,700,000. Those are scattered votes, but we have been able through the evening to make predictions on specific states. The latest is ABC News predicts that Kansas will go for President Ford. Not unexpected, but our estimate is that it will be by a close margin. That's the home state, of course, of his vice presidential candidate. It had been thought to be comfortable for him. Barbara? We have a projection. ABC has a projection in the state of Massachusetts. Massachusetts has gone to Jimmy Carter by a comfortable margin. That is no surprise. 63% to 35%. Remember that Massachusetts is the only state in the last presidential election to vote for George McGovern. So by a comfortable margin, Massachusetts has gone to Jimmy Carter, and that's a goodly number of uh, votes in Massachusetts. It's 14 electoral votes, and it was reported just a few moments ago, ABC projected, and also no surprise, that Senator Edward Kennedy has won in Massachusetts. Barbara, Howard? Massachusetts is the only state that went for McGovern in the last uh, presidential election, but the other entity that went for McGovern is the District of Columbia. And ABC News now projects that the District of Columbia will go to Jimmy Carter in this election with all the District of Columbia's three electoral votes. You Harry? Might, you might get a situation where three electoral votes were the difference at this sometime tomorrow morning. Right now, the uh, uh, states in which ABC has made projections 
show an electoral vote lineup like this with uh, 270 needed. Jimmy Carter has 88, reflecting the early reporting votes from the southeast where he has a great deal of strength. Gerald Ford has 37. He picked up, of course, New Jersey 17. He picked up Kansas. And he is uh, that, that margin between him and uh, Jimmy Carter will uh, narrow very abruptly during the evening. There have been some interesting uh, projections, decisions, we think, in Senate races. Frank Reynolds? The state of Maryland is going to have a new United States senator. He's a familiar figure, however, Paul Sarbanes, who played a very prominent role in the impeachment inquiry of Richard Nixon on the House Judiciary Committee, according to ABC News, will be the winner in his battle with incumbent Republican Senator J. Glenn Bell. That's in the state of Maryland, Paul Sarbanes, the Democrat, by a comfortable margin over Senator Bell, who was not helped in this campaign by the disclosure that in his first campaign in 1970, he received something like $250,000 from a secret townhouse operation uh, operated by the Nixon administration in Washington. We have another projection in the state of Delaware, and this one is good news for a Republican incumbent. Senator William Roth will be the victor over Thomas Maloney, the mayor of Wilmington, and this will be by a close margin. So there is one Republican out in uh, Maryland and another Republican in Delaware being re-elected by a close margin. Here is another projection that ABC News is now prepared to make, and this one probably does not occasion much surprise. Senator Benson, Lloyd Benson of Texas, will be the winner by a wide margin over Republican Representative Alan Steelman. So Senator Benson, who at one time entertained hopes of uh, watching other returns on this night, will uh, be going back to Washington for, uh, from the state of Texas. And here is another late projection. Senator Weicker of uh, the state of Connecticut, ABC News now projects, will be the winner over Gloria Schaefer, the current Secretary of State in Connecticut. And this uh, victory margin will be comfortable. So Senator Weicker, whose campaign slogan was, he's no man but yours, or he's nobody's man but yours, who had a uh, vigorous campaign effort made against him by uh, Mrs. Schaefer, nevertheless has been, or will be, when all the votes are counted, re-elected to another term in the United States Senate from the state of Connecticut. He won the first time in 1970 because he was one of those involved in a three-way race. The Democratic candidate uh, had opposition in the general election from former Senator Tom Dodd, who was uh, persuaded to make an independent race. And so the two Democrats uh, split the vote, and Senator Weicker, the Republican candidate, who until then, I believe, had been a one-term congressman from Greenwich, and before that had been the chief selectman, or whatever it is, uh, in Connecticut, all of a sudden, after uh, only two years in Washington, found himself in the United States Senate. This was a straight two-person two race, and... Uh, Senator Weicker defeated uh, Gloria Schaefer. So Barbara, the only woman to make a try at getting into the Senate, did not get it from Harry's home state. Harry? And formerly your home state, Frank, and you ought to know it's not called a chief selectman, it's a first selectman. Also, like if before I said you were a non-millionaire, actually, I don't know, and if I maligned you and you are a millionaire, I'll correct it later. I'll make all my returns available when okay, you do. Thank you. And I don't hold it against either of you that the woman running didn't, didn't uh, make it there. Well, Frank couldn't vote there. Uh, We've got a useful new tool tonight that we should mention. Uh, one of the things Lou Harris and ABC have been able to do is have a kind of a national model so that we may get an idea of trends and on what's going on even before we have definitive results from key precincts in given states. One of the things the national model shows so far is that the turnout may not be so massive. It's running a little bit ahead of 1972 in the south, uh, about the same in the border states, maybe a little ahead in the Midwest, so far slightly behind. Howard, I think you've got a review Harry, the, uh, there hasn't been a single surprise in the way any state, or I believe any senator or governor, has gone tonight. It's interesting to me, the most interesting single result is the result in New Jersey with 17 electoral votes. Assuming that California goes Republican, as so many people have, and that New York, the other giant, goes Democratic, this contest could be decided by the Route 30 states. Those are the states that run along Route 30, from New Jersey through Pennsylvania, Ohio, Indiana, and Illinois. Well, out of those five states, Ford has now won two, New Jersey and Indiana. We might take a look at the two of the other important ones in that group, Ohio and Illinois. Ohio, with 4% uh, of the precincts having uh, reported in, uh, Ford is leading with 53% of the votes, and uh, Carter is following with 45%, but that's unlikely to be the final result 
because of our key uh, districts that we're watching as uh, weather vanes for the state, 69% of our keys, uh, it looks like a dead heat. The men are 50-50. The other state is Illinois. There, there's only 1% of the precincts that have reported in, and Ford, uh, Carter leads 59% to Ford's uh, 40%. You know, in New Jersey, uh, we were wondering how some states would be in terms of the coattails. And in New Jersey, ABC has projected that the Democratic senator uh, won the race, and that's uh, Harrison Williams. And yet, it's by a very close uh, count right now, ABC is projecting four. So Republican and Democrats aren't helping each other, and that's it. You wouldn't remember, Howard, because you grew up in the South. Route 30 is the Lincoln Highway. It was the first transcontinental paved road that runs uh, through Iowa, too, as well as those other states. Right now, down in Atlanta, Sam Donaldson is at uh, the Omni Hotel, the World Congress Center, where Jimmy Carter is going to watch the returns tonight. Sam, can you give us a report? Harry, uh, when Jimmy Carter flew up from uh, Albany, which is the nearest uh, big airport that will take his 727 jet to Plains, Georgia, he was in an ebullient mood, uh, very confident about winning this election. In fact, on the airplane, he was talking to reporters about how he intended to exercise great care in selecting his cabinet and uh, what he would do in the transition period between now and uh, January 20th. Oh, he always added that uh, that is assuming I win the election, but I think I will. And it's clear that uh, if uh, Jimmy Carter doesn't win tonight, he is going to be the most surprised person in Atlanta, Georgia. They were looking toward the solid south and the border states to provide them an electoral base of about 118 votes. Uh, they weren't counting on uh, Virginia. They thought they might even lose uh, Louisiana and uh, Mississippi, although uh, they thought they had a good chance of winning there. They are counting on winning Texas, however. And then I heard uh, you talk about the Route 30 states. Uh, they believe that uh, they were going to win uh, Missouri and Ohio tonight, which uh, meant uh, with the inclusion of New York and uh, some of those traditional Democratic states you've mentioned, like Hawaii and West Virginia and uh, Massachusetts, which meant that they would then have to only uh, pick up uh, one other state, and they think that'll be Pennsylvania. Or perhaps a shot in Michigan, perhaps a shot in Illinois. But if uh, not any of those, uh, then they were uh, prepared to believe that uh, many of those small states, Nevada, New Mexico, uh, even Maine, might uh, go for them. And in California, as you say, uh, uh, although most polls uh, put the president ahead there, the Carter Organization believes it has a chance of winning in California. So I just have to tell you, the mood is very up in the Carter camp here. And uh, Jimmy Carter believes, uh, as we speak, that he's going to be the next president. Sam? Yes, Harry. Uh, what, what are the mechanics? How are they watching it? Is, is there a little command center where they have uh, three television sets and a bunch of charts? Well, Carter went up to the 15th floor of this hotel when he arrived. Right now, he's down on the third floor talking to some supporters. Uh, I'm not quite certain what he's saying because, of course, we are not allowed to have uh, cameras in there that can uh, automatically and immediately broadcast it on the air, although we may have uh, tape of that later on. He'll go back to the 15th floor uh, where he will continue to watch it. They do have a three-set setup so that they can see uh, all of the networks. Sam, knowing what he expects, do you think he's been surprised by the way any state has gone in this election so far? I don't know, uh, uh, Howard, about uh, uh, the states as you have uh, read the role because I've been busy uh, running around doing things here and I'm not quite certain uh, what states you have conceded to Carter and what states what? you have uh, conceded uh, to Ford? New Jersey and Indiana, for example, have gone to no. Ford. If, they, if, 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 you, uh, if ABC has projected uh, Mr. Ford a, a, a probable winner in those states, that does not surprise Jimmy Carter. Sam, uh, one, uh, we have one late projection, which I would think would fall into his plans as you have outlined them, or what they hope. North Carolina, ABC News, projects will uh, uh, go in the Carter column by a close margin, but it was considered to be a state where he might be in trouble. Well, the we Carter believe people, now that he, uh, he will win it by a close margin, although 12% you know, of the precincts are, have only yet been counted. I must tell you, Harry, the Carter people never believed they were in trouble in North Carolina, and for that matter, they never believed that they would uh, lose uh, South Carolina. Have they, in fact, uh, apparently uh, won South Carolina? Or do we have anything yet on that state? Uh, I thought in North Carolina that uh, the Carterites were supposed to be getting worried and therefore they mobilized Sam Irvin in the last few weeks to go out and campaign for him. Is that wrong? Well, I read those stories also, Howard, but I, I have this very narrow perspective of being in that uh, 
cylinder uh, that uh, is called an airplane on the campaign. And when I say the Carter people, I mean uh, the uh, aides uh, immediately adjacent to the candidate and to the best that I can uh, sense it, the candidate's own view. I don't think they were that worried about North Carolina. Well, thank you very much, Sam. We'll be back with you from time to time through the evening. Coming up next, more of our continuous election coverage right after this. We're beginning to get some uh, counted votes from the state of Michigan, Gerald Ford's home state, and one of the states which, if he lost it, he would be very seriously upset, and uh, Governor Carter would be very happily surprised. At the moment, they're just 3% of the precincts in, and we don't have enough key precincts to make an estimate. But at the moment, with that uh, very small vote, uh, Jimmy Carter is holding a, a substantial lead, 59% to 48%. But we don't know where those votes are from or what it means. Well, Harry, in uh, Pennsylvania and Virginia, Jimmy Carter would be very upset if Ford won those states. He's counting on both of them. So far, we have very little from the two states. In the case of Pennsylvania, 4% of the precincts have been reported in. Ford leaves with 82,000 votes to 77,000 for Carter. And in Virginia, one of the three southern battlegrounds that Carter mentioned, along with Texas and Florida, 41% of the precincts have reported in. And Ford leads with 51% of the vote, Carter 49%. We've had a couple of interesting results uh, in gubernatorial races. Let's get a report from Ann Compton. Harry, we are ready to project two for you tonight, both of them Republican victories. The first in the state of Delaware. It would seem that uh, by ABC News projection that Republican Congressman Pete DuPont will indeed take the governorship away from a Democrat, Sherman Tribbett. Tribbett, who had had trouble getting his campaign going, had uh, not really taken uh, uh, too much effort into the campaign until possibly too late. DuPont uh, has three times been elected a, a congressman from the state, which amounts to a statewide race. He has, uh, despite his wealthy background, uh, DuPont has refused to take anything over $100 from each campaign contributor and seemed to do well. You don't need a lot of money for media because in DuPont there are no commercial U uh, VHF stations to uh, buy advertising on. The other state that ABC is ready to make a projection on is New Hampshire. That is where the current incumbent governor, Meldrum Thompson, looks like he is uh, carrying about 60% of the vote over a liberal Democrat, Harry Spanos. Spanos had tried to get some of the Republican vote away, uh, the moderate Republican, but Republican Thompson is going to hang on. Thompson, uh, according to the people up there, a tireless campaigner who uh, went vigorously through the towns and cities of New Hampshire. Uh, he's a skier, a snowmobiler, and apparently in the new fallen snow of this fall, he, uh, he is doing fine. In the state of Missouri, we don't have enough to go with quite yet. That is an interesting state to watch because the, uh, the results will depend a little bit on how, how the presidential race goes. The incumbent governor is Christopher Bond, now running a little bit behind, but that could be because the early votes are coming in from the urban areas, Kansas City, the home of his challenger, Joseph Teasdale, and possibly St. Louis. Uh, again, the Republican bond supposed to carry that state, but uh, if he does not, uh, a victory for Joseph Teasdale would be quite an upset. Harry? I think we have a projection on a new state. Barbara? Yes, we do. We have a projection in the state of Delaware. Delaware only has three electoral votes, but that was a toss-up state. And the toss-up has landed on the side of Jimmy Carter. ABC News projects that Jimmy Carter, by a close call, will win the state of Delaware. And you can see the figures up there. Democrats 55%, Republicans 44%. Delaware, it is now to Carter. At the moment, uh, with 11% of the nation's precincts reporting, the popular vote looks 52% uh, for Jimmy Carter, 47% for Gerald Ford, four and a half million roughly, uh, to four, just over four million. Coming up next, more of our continuous election coverage right after this. We've got enough information now, I think, so that it's time to check in with Lou Harris and see what he makes of it all. Lou? Harry, we find now that with a third of the popular vote in in our Harris ABC national model here tonight, this vote is just uh, nip and tuck. Jimmy Carter has less than a one-point lead nationally. He is benefiting from what appears to be the collapse of the McCarthy vote. We estimated McCarthy would receive 3% of the vote. It looks as though he's getting only 1% tonight. But President Ford is benefiting from the fact that the turnout, despite all those earlier stories, everything we've seen from the East, the Midwest, the border, and the Deep South indicates turnout is not up over four years ago. 
and as turnout goes down, forage chances go up. So Harry, it looks like our national model says now it'll be a cliffhanger, a long night, a sweat out in states like Ohio, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Illinois. Uh, it's a long countdown now. We'll sweat it out with you, Lou. Coming up right after this, more of our continuing election night coverage. Now, as Lou Harris says, it could be a very long night. Take, for instance, just Michigan, Gerald Ford's home state. Seventy percent of our key precincts have reported, and ABC News regards it as too close to call. I wanted to give a little addition to Delaware, which ABC just projected a few moments ago has cast its three electoral votes for Jimmy Carter. Delaware is one of those bellwether states, and the bellwether status is a state that's been right more often than not. Uh, Delaware has gone for the winner in every presidential election since 1952. Well, that doesn't say that they're right this time, but just this is what their past record has been, and they cast their electoral votes for Jimmy Carter. Barbara, there's another note about Delaware that should be made. Most challengers in big races suffer from lack of identification. We've got to go out and get people's attention. In this case, we've just heard from Ann Compton that Pierre S. DuPont IV, known as Pete DuPont, a very good congressman, is going to win the governorship in, uh, in uh, Delaware, and he suffers from over-identification. <laughs> the state has the DuPont Hotel, the DuPont Theater, the DuPont Airport, the DuPont Country Club, several DuPont office buildings, and three DuPont research centers. And now it's going to have the DuPont governor. Right now, 12% of the precincts have reported Jimmy Carter holding a 52 to 47% lead nationally. And that's the national election night story, 52 minutes after the hour. Good evening again. I'm Harry Reisner, here with Barbara Walters and Howard K. Smith. Right now, at this stage of the election night, a little after 10 o'clock in New York, 29% of the precincts in this country have reported and Jimmy Carter holds a 52% to 48% lead over Gerald Ford in the popular vote, 12.5 million to 11 and 3 quarter million. Howard has a new projection on one of our states, I believe. State of Louisiana. ABC News projects that Carter has captured Louisiana by a comfortable margin. That comes to me as a surprise, partly because I've lived there a lot of my life, was born there. It's a very conservative state, the most unpredictable one. It's voted Republican or the third party candidates for a long time. And um, the governor was lukewarm for Carter. His wife was outright for Ford. So it's a surprise, but we'll talk about that later. Right now, that in the uh, electoral vote column, according to our projection, means that Jimmy Carter has now accumulated 197 electoral votes out of the 270 needed for nomination or for election. And Gerald Ford has 61, uh, noting as we have throughout the evening that it was expected that Jimmy Carter would have the early lead in electoral votes, and that doesn't necessarily mean it won't be a close night. In fact, all indications are it will be a close night. We've got some interesting Senate results. Uh, can we I give one, one more projection before that? You may indeed. Okay. Uh, we have North Dakota, and North Dakota had been one of those states that was considered a toss-up, but it's gone to Ford by a close margin. Mm -hmm. So that's another state coming in. We were... Uh, we were speaking earlier of important Senate results, and one of them was certainly in Maryland, where uh, Paul Sarbanes, who was one of the major figures in the Watergate hearings two years ago, is uh, now, I think, just about making a victory statement. Uh, he has been projected by ABC News as the winner. I want to say to the thousands of people across the state who have worked in this campaign, how grateful Christine and I are for your help. You took us into your homes. You gave us countless hours of your time and of your effort. And we're deeply grateful to all of those men and women and boys and girls, young people all across this state who helped us in this campaign. I think we have a chance to move this country forward. I look forward to the opportunity of serving in the United States Senate with Governor Carter in the White House as President of the United States. That was Paul Sarbanes, the projected winner and now claiming victory in the Maryland Senate race. And for more on the Senate races, let's go to Frank Reynolds. Yes, Harry, Paul Sarbanes is just your ordinary Greek 
boy who washed dishes in his father's restaurant and then went on to Harvard Law and Oxford. And now he's going to the United States Senate. We have a projection to make in the state of Vermont. Uh, Senator Robert Stafford, the Republican incumbent, according to ABC News, will be the eventual victor there over Governor Thomas Salmon and by a comfortable margin. Uh, this was one of those races that a good many people thought might go either way uh, because uh, Governor Salmon is popular. He's obviously demonstrated vote-getting ability throughout the state. He had a very tough primary race, however, and that seemed to damage him. And then Stafford hasn't made any enemies and apparently a lot of friends in Vermont in the time he's been serving the state, both uh, in, the, in uh, the House and uh, finally in the Senate, and now he has been re-elected. And in the state of Wisconsin, this one uh, was certainly expected, uh, the eventual result. ABC News now projects Senator William Proxmire, the winner by a wide margin tonight over Stanley York. Senator Proxmire uh, never had any serious competition, any serious doubts about winning this race. Not only does he run well politically, you know, in uh, his home state of Wisconsin, he also runs to work in Washington. He can be seen bouncing up and down Connecticut Avenue and uh, heading up toward Capitol Hill for his pains. He has been mugged a couple of times. It's always puzzled me why a mugger would pick on a man wearing a sweatsuit galloping down the street, but they've gone after him a couple of times. Anyway, he'll be able to continue his running. And in Vermont, well, I, I give you Vermont, uh, Tennessee is still too close to call, much too close to call. Even with 77% of the precincts in, it is still 53% to 47% for uh, uh, Republican incumbent Bill Brock, but it is uh, very, very close. And so is Ohio, which may loom very large tonight in the presidential picture. Metzenbaum, the Democratic candidate, Howard Metzenbaum, in a rematch with Senator Robert Taft, 51% to 48%. We have 33% of the precincts in, but it is too close to call. Ohio is one of those states that it's always wise to approach with caution. As a matter of fact, it was 12 years ago that Robert Taft uh, accepted uh, congratulations and made his victory statement. He was then running against Senator Stephen Young. Uh, the networks couldn't get Senator Young to come out and make a statement of concession. He got in his car and drove back to Washington, and by the time he got there, he had won. So everybody's going to be very cautious about Ohio tonight. That, I believe, is it. Yes, Wisconsin, Tennessee, and Ohio. And that's the story on the Senate right now. Thank you, Frank. It's probably about time and a little bit after can New York time to kind of figure out where we are. Well, we know where we are. ABC News has projected 197 electoral votes for Carter and 64 for Ford. So far, things have been going almost as expected, almost as the pollsters figured they would go, which means it's going to be very close. If you were looking for good news and then you were in the Jimmy Carter camp, you would uh, say you were glad you had New York, and you would say probably that you were especially glad that you had Missouri and Louisiana. Uh, if you were looking for good news, if you were in Gerald Ford's camp, you'd like New Jersey. Uh, what else would you like, Indiana. Howard? Connecticut. Indiana. Yep. But Indiana you'd expect. Mm -hmm. Connecticut. Connecticut would be the unusual one, or the one that might give some kind of an indication. Mm -hmm. So both sides at this point have had some good news. I'll tell a secret of, to the public about what we've been doing. We've been rehearsing this with uh, figures that we've falsified on purpose, the things we thought would happen. And you know that all of those things have come true so far tonight. Everything we said would happen has happened. Why didn't we just tape it on Saturday then, aren't we? We wouldn't have yeah, to do it we, tonight. We still do have some places of many states that we have not uh, heard from, still want to keep an eye on. In the South, for example, Mississippi. Uh, Mississippi has, with its southern uh, tendencies, would want, uh, of course, would want Jimmy Carter, but it has a Republican tradition. We don't know how that's going to go. It's too close to call at this point. Uh, New Mexico, as we go our west, which has voted uh, for the president in every election since it's entered the union. We still don't know what the story is in New Mexico, 43% of the precincts in, and it's Ford 53% to Carter 47%. Uh, Oklahoma we still can't call uh, yet too close, Colorado is too close, and of course that big prize of California, we have none of the precincts reporting yet. The polls haven't closed there yet, and there are a number of states still up for grabs. We've got a map that gives a kind of a, a, a look at how things have been going so far. The uh, dark blue, the darker shade, have gone for Carter. The lighter ones have gone for Ford, but uh, except for New York, Ford has gotten the, the big one in New Jersey, and uh, at the moment, as we've noted, it is about as predicted, which means that nobody knows yet. Just think of the big states that we don't know about yet. Michigan, Texas, 
Wisconsin, which at the, so far is going in a very interesting way. 10% of the vote in, rather substantial lead for Jimmy Carter, 55% to 43%, which wasn't necessarily expected. But I don't know where those votes are from. That may be the big cities where uh, Lou Harris's national model indicates Carter is doing very well tonight. You know, uh, if you look at that same map, you notice that uh, the whole solid South and all the border states have gone for Carter, with the exception of uh, Virginia and Mississippi, which we have no results on so far, if you count Texas as being in the Southwest, not in the South. Shall I just tell you what Mississippi is at this point? With 26 uh, percent of the precincts in, Mississippi has 52 percent for Carter and 47 percent for Ford. Well, we are now in the, in the situation in the evening where we're going to be getting some rather substantial results from uh, what Mr. Smith so charmingly calls the Route 30 states. And I call the Lincoln Highway states. And something, uh, there will be some decisive things happening. Coming up next, more of our continuous election coverage right after this. As we noted, we have a new and very useful tool tonight, which is uh, a sort of a national model that Lou Harris has put together for ABC and which sometimes can show us something that is happening by region or by group before we have definitive results in a given state. And Lou has now seen enough of the national model, I think, to have some things to say. Harry, I think we have something definitive here to say for the first time tonight. In the popular vote in our model, with over 50% of the vote in, Jimmy Carter has a 51 to 48% lead, a three-point lead. Now, that's not a lot. When you look at it on a regional basis, and there's enough in from these regions to draw some conclusions. He's ahead in the east by 57, 52 to 47 percent, a five-point lead, only behind in the Midwest, which was supposed to be Ford's strong region, by 50 to 48 percent, holds a commanding lead in the border states. And you notice all the states in the border states that have come in, Carter has has been projected the winner. He's winning there 56 to 44 percent. And the deep south, he's just sweeping 67 to 33 percent. What this indicates now, as far as our national model goes, is that the burden has gone almost entirely over to Gerald Ford to win all the close ones to still be in this race. It's getting very close to the point where Carter could wrap this up if a few of the big states were to fall his way, and I mean states such as Texas, Illinois, and Pennsylvania, uh, then then, then uh, this election would be over. So it may not be quite as long an evening as perhaps we'd anticipated. And when uh, Robert Strauss said that they only, the Democrats only had to win two of the six big states and the Republicans had to take them all, exaggerating. But I think a little earlier, uh, Sam Donaldson or Tom Darrell said if the, if the Republicans lose two of the five remaining big states, they're out, they're in trouble? Harry, I think that's right. What, what you begin to see is that Gerald Ford, while winning in the Midwest, is not winning enough yet. And he's going to have to win those by uh, very close margins and get all the breaks. That's the key. If he doesn't get the breaks in the Midwest, then uh, even if Ford goes on and uh, takes the West, it won't, simply won't be enough. Uh, I want to give one projection just while we're at it, which may not change things very much. It's an almost predictable ABC projection in Utah, President Ford, by a wide margin. That's four electoral votes in Utah we project to President Ford. Lou, um, what you were saying is this, this is not quite what was predicted in the polls. Is it the undecided that's made this difference? Can you tell that yet? No, e even more interesting, Barbara, is that turnout for all of those early reports, and we have half the vote of the country in in our model, it turned out it was just not running any higher than there was four years ago. There wasn't this great surge, uh, whether it's New York or other places where you've got all these reports. What, what is happening is that Carter is able to eke out about a point or two on a uniform basis across the board more than let's say the poll showed and is winning a number of these states on a close close basis but so far tonight all the breaks have gone to jimmy carter and not to gerald ford now the calls uh, the projections on the big states have yet to come and they are very close but as i say again the burden of proof is now on Gerald Ford to get all the breaks, almost, in order to win this election. Thank you, Lowe. Uh, we've got, I think, an interesting and important Senate projection now. And uh, Frank Reynolds? 
Yes, Harry. Uh, in the state of Tennessee, the only Republican incumbent who is up for re-election this time, Senator William Brock, apparently is not going to win re-election. ABC News now projects that his Democratic opponent, James Sasser, the former Democratic state chairman, making his first bid for elective office, will unseat uh, Senator William Brock. With 81% of the precincts in now, we have Brock trailing 53 to 47%. Apparently, the plurality that he expected to get uh, from uh, East Tennessee was simply not big enough to overcome the margin that uh, Sasser rolled up in the normally Democratic areas of uh, Nashville and uh, Memphis and West Tennessee. Uh, Brock had always said that he was uh, going to be in trouble if Jimmy Carter ran very well in Tennessee. Well, Jimmy Carter has run quite well in Tennessee. This is a state where Sasser, who was one of Carter's original supporters, long back when people were talking about Jimmy Who, uh, Sasser has talked a great deal about the Carter connection in Tennessee. And apparently it was enough to help Sasser win that victory. And according to ABC News, he will take Senator Brock's place in the Senate. Brock is a one-term uh, senator. He defeated Albert Gore six years ago. Harry? Thank you, Frank. Coming up next, more of our continuous election coverage right after this. Well, the vote has been counted and reported in one-third of the country's precincts now, 33% of them. Jimmy Carter holds a 51% to 48% lead over Gerald Ford, 14.5 million to 13.5 million. There's one job that uh, I envied in the con during the conventions and one job that I envy tonight. It's Jim Kincaid in Plains, Georgia, holding down a rocking chair. He's got, uh, right now, he's got somebody with him, so he's rocking harder and may even work up an interview. Jim? <laughs> well, the reason I'm rocking, Harry, is because that's the only way to keep warm. And as you can see, uh, the crowd that Jimmy Carter drew here earlier this evening is staying on. Indeed, Plains is about 10 times its normal population just now. And they are choosing to accept every ray of hope as, uh, as an absolute definite uh, omen that their man will win. I have with me uh, Billy Carter, the, uh, the man's brother. And uh, his eyes are a little red rimmed from lack of sleep. But uh, aside from that, how are you doing, Billy? Doing fine, Jim. Uh, <coughs> I, 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 I told you earlier, tomorrow's a nice holiday in Plains for uh, Carlos Warehouse, Carlos Farm. Service station will be closing down. It's paid holiday for everybody here. So, because Jimmy Carr is going to be the next president, no, no doubt about it. You're pretty sure of that? I'm sure of it. It's better every minute. Billy, what about this crowd? Uh, uh, I think you... it's a great crowd. Uh, behind the hills, we've got the planes on that one over there. Yeah. <laughs> Come from several other states, of course, but. Uh... Are you interested uh, now in seeing uh, about what plans can be made for Plains' future in the event this all comes about? I would like I would like to be, but uh, I, I think Plains is already going to hell. I'm gonna let it go. <laughs> okay. Well, you heard it straight from the man. He runs a filling station and the warehouse and all the rest of it. We'll just have to check with him later. Then can trade in Plains' future. Thank you, Jim. Uh, Plains, I think, would take either victory or defeat uh, calmly tonight. It's a town that is pretty hard to shake up. We're waiting still on, uh, on the Midwest and on some pretty important uh, races, which, according to Lou Harris, might uh, one way show us it couldn't be all that long a night. Harry, I'd like to point out the state of Illinois right now with 21% of the precincts. I wonder if we can throw that Illinois scorecard up. 21% of the precincts are in. Carter leads 55% to 44%. And the interesting thing is, all those votes come from downstate, which is conservative, for territory. Uh, Chicago's own vote has not yet uh, come in. They're still waiting for Cook County's vote, Partic where Carter will be strong. Particularly interesting because the Republican candidate for governor, Jim Thompson, won easily with those votes from the downstate. Uh, speaking of governors, I think we should get a quick report from Ann Compton on what's happening in the governor races. Harry, there are two that we should report on right now. ABC is projecting in North Dakota the incumbent Democrat Arthur Link, the fiddler player who uh, has never lost an election. Link, uh, ABC is projecting him in a close margin. It was supposed to be wider than that. Uh, Link in a close margin in North Dakota. The other state we'd like to project is Rhode Island, a state uh, with the heaviest Catholic population in the country. 
that to a democratic state with the ABC projecting the Lieutenant Governor Joseph Garahi over Republican James Taft. And uh, what has the makings of an upset tonight, it is still too close to call the state of Missouri. Now that was supposed to be the state where Republican incumbent Christopher Bond was going to do just fine. But his opponent, Joseph Teasdale, a lawyer, had saved all of his campaign money to make a one last desperate run in the last three weeks of the campaign with a media blitz. Well, Teasdale so far has held a bond well below 50% of the vote, and uh, it could well be that, uh, the, uh, that Christopher Bond will lose. Uh, Harry? And that's the national election night story at 22 minutes after the hour. One-third over, 36% of the nation's precincts have reported in. Carter leads 51% to Ford's 48%. And I believe that Barbara has an individual state result. I do. Thank you, Howard. ABC projects the state of Montana. ABC projects President Ford there by a comfortable margin. That's four electoral votes to go to Ford with 55% uh, for Ford and 45% for Carter with 2% of the precincts reported. Now, this isn't really a surprise. Uh, Montana has gone Republican in five of the last six elections. Still, it was close. It would have been something if it had gone for Jimmy Carter. That would have been a surprise. And by the way, this doesn't have any significance, but uh, one must mention that the Montana Ford Committee's election night party is in the Carter room of the Northern Hotel in Billings, Montana. They may have to just change the name of that tonight. So it's Ford in Montana. Um, I want to switch all the way back to New Jersey to talk not about the presidential election, but about one of the referendums that could affect a lot of the people in this country. Uh, one of the referendums in New Jersey, the most important, was about gambling, to legalize gambling in that state, but to keep it in Atlantic City. Atlantic City would have casinos, and a great many people who would go out to Las Vegas would now be going east and would go to Atlantic City. Just to bring you up to date, the ballot in New Jersey on that now, with tallies in from 345, of the state's more than 5,000 precincts. This is the way it looks, 115,000 votes in favor of the legislation and about 80,000 against. So, uh, they too thought soon it, to uh, say, but get your chips ready. They thought it might pass this time. They tried once before. To that was for the whole state. No, uh, it was also for Atlantic City, and they well, turned it down. I see, I thought it was everyone, not no, just Atlantic City. Let's, that. Uh, let's take a look at the electoral vote. The electoral vote, uh, Ford has 72 electoral votes at this point. The Carter's 197, which means that victories for Carter in Illinois, Texas, and Michigan would give him exactly 270 electoral votes. Uh, I understand that uh, Secretary, Governor John Connolly is in Texas, in Houston, Texas, available for an interview, and we'd like to talk with him. Uh, Mr. Connolly, what's Texas going to do? That's the state that mystifies us. Howard, I think it's mystifying all of us at the moment. Uh, our latest returns down here give uh, uh, President Ford 598,544 votes, Governor Carter 589,603, uh, or a difference of 8,941 out of over a million, uh, almost a million two. Uh, so you can see it's, it's going to be a very close race and a very long evening. Yes. Reminds you a little bit of 1960 in that uh, Kennedy race when uh, yeah, it sure does. Texas took a long time to come through. Yeah, that uh, 46,000 votes, uh, Howard, that year. That's the only. That's the total difference between uh, President Kennedy and uh, and Mr. Nixon at that time. Did uh, Senator Benson's victory surprise you? No, not at all. No, Howard. There have been very few surprises uh, to me, really, not only in Texas but throughout the uh, the nation tonight. Uh, I, I haven't kept up with it, obviously, as well as you have, but uh, uh, I, I really think that, uh, Governor, that uh, Governor Carter ran well in the areas where he was expected to, and the president's running well in the areas where we thought he would run well. I think, did, did you, you hear me point out that if Carter should win Illinois, Texas, and Michigan, he would have 270 electoral votes? Yes, I heard you say that, I, and I assume that the other... Uh, that the base that you added those two was very firm. I, I'm not. Uh, I'm not sure uh, of what you're adding those three to. I'm not sure he's going to carry Texas. Uh, I haven't heard the latest in Illinois. I think the president's going to carry Texas. Very frankly, Howard. Well, Governor uh, Connolly, uh, this is Harry Reisner. If, what yeah, do you? Harry. Uh, 
you're figuring, I think, about roughly what we're figuring on the reported votes in Texas, 50% both ways. Do you know where the votes are from? Do you know where, what's your, what's your confidence based on that President Ford's going to pull ahead? Well, I think uh, it's generally conceded that the rural vote's going to be primarily Democratic and vote for Carter. I'm not sure that's true this year. Uh, this vote's from all over the state. This is a million two, and it's, uh, it's from all over the state. It's probably a, th uh, a third of the vote that will be cast in Texas. I have been estimating uh, three million five to three million six. So I think it's pretty much over the state. Uh, and uh, the significant part is that, uh, that President Ford has, has closed the gap and has now taken the lead, and I suspect he will continue to do so. And the thing that pleases me is that, that uh, President Ford's running considerably ahead here in Houston, Harris County. This is where one-sixth of the votes are going to be. Uh, and he's now I, I, yes, running something like 25,000 votes ahead, the last figures I saw, and I'm sure that'll hold up and, and, uh, and expand uh, considerably. So we, he may come out of Harris County with uh, uh, something like a 90 to 100,000 vote lead, and he ought to come out of Dallas the same way. And in all of West Texas, uh, which will be fairly slow reporting, uh, the president ought to do well. I, I really am going to be very surprised, and I'm, I must say terribly disappointed if the president loses Texas, and I don't think he will. Robert Strauss said he wouldn't dare go back to Texas if, the, if uh, <laughs> uh, Carter lost. Does that make you feel well, sorry? <laughs> well, it may, no, he'll be welcome home. <laughs> okay, Governor, thank you very much. Thank you, Harry. Okay. I have one brief apology to make. Uh, Barbara Walter said when they voted before in New Jersey it was for statewide casinos, and uh, for reasons which I can't understand, she was right. Coming up next, more of our continuous election coverage you, right after this. <laughs> Frank Reynolds has a report on a senatorial race in Montana. Montana is a Republican state with a reputation of electing Democratic senators, but we don't know. Frank, what about it? Well, Montana has lived up to its reputation as a Republican state because uh, Montana's electoral votes are going to go to President Ford, and the seat held for so long by Senator Mike Mansfield, retiring now, will be taken by the Democrat. According to ABC News, we now project the Democrat, John Melcher, uh, representative, the victor by a wide margin over his Republican opponent, Stanley C. Berger. So that is a Democratic seat kept in Democratic hands. Incidentally, I been racking my brain, I can't think whether there is anybody in the Senate now who is a physician, doctor, but with the election of uh, Senator-elect Melcher, they will at least have a horse doctor because he is a veterinarian. <laughs> I <Howard>? think <laughs> some of the senators, that might be very appropriate. A remarkable lot of ticket splitting tonight. The case that uh, Frank just mentioned uh, was, has been a traditional case where Montana's gone Republican presidentially, but for Democratic senators tonight, it's gone for the Republican senator. But in New Jersey, Harrison Williams, the Democratic senator, incumbent senator, won by a wide, handsome margin, but uh, lost the state presidentially. And in Missouri, the same thing happened. The Democrats won the state, but the Republican uh, uh, John Danforth won the Senate seat that is now held by Stuart Sanning. I had way back earlier in the evening when we were talking about some of the uh, some of the women who might be involved, and we know that there is not going to be a female senator now because Gloria Schaefer has lost in Connecticut, and uh, we had some female governors, which uh, were possible, two of them, which were possible. But way back in the early part of the evening, I talked about Martha Keyes, remember, who was from Kansas and who last year married uh, Andy Jacobs from Indiana, and they thought that this might do her some harm. Well, we understand, although it has not been projected yet, that she has won. So. Uh, marriage did not hurt her chances. In Massachusetts, it was uh, no surprise that Senator Edward Kennedy won, and also it was no surprise that the state of Massachusetts went for Jimmy Carter. That is a solidly democratic state and a liberal state. Senator Kennedy is in our headquarters in Massachusetts now. Good evening, Senator. You've probably been following things as we have. First of all, congratulations to you, and uh, you have another six years to look forward to in this. And the Senate, congratulate you. How do things look to you at this point? Well, obviously, I'm uh, immensely grateful to the people of Massachusetts for uh, the very uh, strong support that they uh, uh, gave to me. And I, I think uh, Mr. Cobb ought to be uh, very happy by the strong support that uh, the people give for, for him. So we're, uh, we're very uh, hopeful up here in uh, Massachusetts about the future. And I think for Mr. Carter's chances for uh, carrying uh, uh, the day, it seems to me, and looking over the uh, the country, that 
uh, people are voting for a change, and I think they've uh, admired the long, tough, and difficult road of progress that Mr. Carter's had over the period of the year, and, and I think uh, we'll have a, a new president in January. President Kennedy, you did uh, some campaigning uh, for Governor Carter. Uh, can you tell us how much you did and what were the states possibly where you made your greatest effort, where it may have helped him? Well, uh, of course, uh, I'm immensely grateful that uh, Mr. Carter had a very warm response in uh, Massachusetts. He hadn't campaigned here during the course of the primary. He, up to New Hampshire, he went down to Florida and hadn't spent much time. But I think uh, he, he was uh, very well received here. And, of course, I had a very wonderful day with uh, Mrs. Carter down in Rhode Island. Um, and I campaigned in some of the other states in the state of New York, New Jersey, out in uh, Ohio. But primarily my efforts were uh, here in the state of uh, Massachusetts. And, of course, we're, we're very grateful to get uh, to be reelected, and we're wishing him the very best of luck this evening. Senator, uh, this is Harry Reasoner. Will uh, it do something for Massachusetts' psyche not to be the only state to go for one presidential candidate? Is it going to be a healthier state from now on? Well, I, the, the people up here uh, feel that they've been uh, been left out uh, by uh, the national administration, and they've uh, they of course uh, have a great sense of pride that they uh, they really tuned in on uh, on uh, Mr. Nixon back in 1960 when he was running against President Kennedy, and uh, they they never really forgot that in in uh, in '68, and they strongly supported uh, Mr. McGovern, and uh, they're they're sending a very clear message now uh, that I'm sure my own campaign that. They're interested in jobs and the restoration of the economy and the basically bread and butter uh, issues of health care and education and respect for the elderly people. And uh, I think uh, they, they want some leadership. They're tired of drift. Uh, they want to get on with the uh, trying to deal with the problems. And they believe that Mr. Carter offers the best opportunity of doing so. And I do, too. Senator, do you think that you've at last convinced the people that you're not running for president <laughs> this year? Oh, I'm, I'm looking forward to... Uh, getting back in the uh, in the Senate and we've got a lot of great opportunities for for work there and uh, and we'll look forward to it and uh, I wish uh, I wish uh, uh, Mr. Carter the best of luck this evening. Well, thank you very much indeed Senator Kennedy and congratulations on your success. Coming up next more on our continuous election coverage right after this. We now have a projection not unexpected in a mountain state Wyoming it's projected by ABC News to go for Gerald Ford by a comfortable margin. Uh, again, that is not a surprise. That's a, probably Gerald Ford's strongest area, that mountain area. We should get a report now on uh, the way things stand in various branches of the Congress and the state races, and we'll begin with Frank Reynolds. Well, there have been a number of uh, turnovers in the uh, Senate uh, picture uh, tonight, but uh, it doesn't really make a big difference in the overall picture as yet, because certain Republican gains have been offset by Democratic gains and vice versa. But here's the way it looks right now. Uh, just going down the list of those uh, whom ABC News projects as winners in their Senate contest. We'll begin with Daniel P. Moynihan, the Democratic candidate in the state of New York. And that is a gain for the Democrats, taking away the Republican conservative seat held by uh, Jim Buckley. In Pennsylvania, the Republicans are keeping that seat. John Heinz, uh, the pickle heir and ketchup uh, magnet is uh, hanging on to the uh, seat being given up by Hugh Scott for the Republicans. He defeated Bill Green, Congressman Bill Green, in a very close race tonight. In Tennessee, Jim Sasser is taking a seat belonging to the Republicans. He's defeated Representative or Senator uh, William Brock. In Michigan, a seat now held by a Democrat will be held again by a Democrat. Donald Regal taking uh, the seat uh, that's being given up by Phil Hart. In Vermont, the Republicans are retaining their seat. Senator Robert Stafford being re-elected tonight. The same is true in Connecticut, where Lowell Weicker is uh, successful in his bid for re-election. In Indiana, the Republicans are gaining because they are taking the seat held by Vance Hartke, the Democrat. The winner there tonight will be Richard Lugar. Now, the rest of the list in Montana, that's a, still a Democratic seat. John Melcher uh, taking the seat being given up by Mike Mansfield. In New Mexico, again for the Republicans, Harrison Smith, the astronaut, uh, is uh, on his way to defeating Senator Joseph Montoya. In Texas, no change. Lloyd Benson re-elected. In Maryland, a change for the Democrats. Paul Sarbanes defeating Senator J. Glenn Bell. In Missouri, a change for the Republicans. Attorney General John Danforth defeating former Governor Warren Hearns and taking the seat being given up by a Democrat Stuart Symington. 
In Delaware, no change. Senator William Roth hanging on to his seat. In Rhode Island, John Chafee, the Republican, taking the seat being given up by John Pastore. That's a gain for the uh, Republicans. In Massachusetts, Minnesota and New Jersey and Maine and Wisconsin and Virginia, no change. All the incumbents re-elected. We might also point out that uh, John Stennis of Mississippi and uh, Robert Byrd of West Virginia were re-elected tonight, mainly because they had absolutely no opposition at all. So, just looking quickly at the lineup, the present Senate has 62 Democrats. As of right now, they have elected 55, the Republicans have 38, and as of right now, they have elected 35, but we still have 10 Senate races to go. Now for a report on the House, here's Don Farmer. Well, if you're a Democrat from Kansas and you believe in love and politics, you're happy tonight. Martha Keyes has won her re-election. She is the apparent winner in Kansas' second district. Uh, she's married to Andy Jacobs of Indiana, who also won. Uh, in spite of all obstacles, she has won, it looks like. Altogether, there were 19 women in the 94th Congress. 16 of them were up for re-election. Of the 16, seven are apparent winners so far tonight. None of the incumbents who are trying to get re-elected have so far lost. Freshmen, all together, there are 49 Watergate Democratic freshmen. So far, 15 of them have won. One of them has lost. That's Tim Lee Hall of Illinois. Ken Heckler of West Virginia. He was a congressman. He tried to run for governor, lost the primary, had to become a write-in candidate. He's losing and apparently will not be returning to the 95th Congress. Reverend Robert Drynan of Massachusetts, one of the two Roman Catholic priests in the House of Representatives. He had a very close race up there in Massachusetts. Apparently, he is winning tonight. Henry Helstowski. He's one of those who has been in trouble. He was, in fact, indicted earlier this year on charges that he took some bribes to help illegal aliens stay in this country. We're told that Helstowski apparently is going to lose tonight and will not return to Congress. His opponent is a Republican from East Rutherford, and his name is Harold Hollenbeck. And that's the look of the House right now for a look at the governorship races and Compton. Don, the Republicans are doing well in the Northeast, in the Midwest, the, Re the Democrats well in the South and in the uh, Far West. Let's take a look at some of the races. Uh, in Illinois, Jim Thompson, the Republican, taking a seat from the Democrats. In North Carolina, James Hunt, uh, the Lieutenant Governor, taking a seat from the Republicans for the Democrats. West Virginia, Jay Rockefeller, the Democrat. North Dakota, Arthur Link, the incumbent Democratic Governor. Vermont, a challenger, Mr. Snelling, the Republican. Montana. The current governor, uh, Tom Judge, re-elected. Rhode Island, the lieutenant governor, Joseph Guerra, he elected. Moving on to the next uh, board. They aren't going to give me the next board. The, uh, well, there were several more races. We are still waiting for Missouri, which uh, seems to be something of a, of a cliffhanger. Still waiting to see whether Christopher Bond can retain his Republican seat in Missouri. Howard? Thank you very much, Ann. I'm sorry you didn't have that second board. We'll find out what they did with it in just a moment. Coming up next, more of our continuous election coverage. Bridge in a moment. Forty-four percent of the precincts. This is the popular vote. Carter has fifty-one percent of the vote, and Ford has forty-eight percent of the vote. And that's the popular vote, and you can see the actual figures there. And Harry has a projection for us, an ABC projection for us at this point. We are now uh, prepared to project it in the state of Arizona with its six electoral votes. Gerald Ford will win by a comfortable margin. That continues a pattern that has been establishing in the popular vote in Arizona at the moment. Uh, uh, Carter is ahead 56% to 42%. That's 13% uh, of those votes have been counted. That obviously reflects, uh, I suppose, Phoenix and uh, some of the parts of the state that would not go for Ford when it's all over. Mr. Ford will have run there by a comfortable margin. The electoral picture, it looks like this. 270 votes needed to claim the presidency, and at this point, Ford has 85 of those votes, and Carter has 197 of those votes, but there are still some very important states that haven't come in, many of them states in the Midwest and the West, and those could be the decisive ones if they come in fairly soon for Carter, or it could go on and on. Well, uh, Barbara, we haven't looked at Virginia for a long, long time, and most of the votes are counted, but it's a dead heat. You look at the card for Virginia, 87% of the people have voted, or the votes have been counted, and Ford has 51% to Carter's 49%. It's been jumping around between 50 and a big 50 and a small 50 all evening. Also in Mississippi, uh, and that's a, that's a state that's kind of holding everything up in, in the South in terms of it all going for Carter, that's still uh, too close to call, with 45% of the precincts in. 
Uh, Carter has 51% of the vote, Ford has 48% of the vote, and we're still sweating it out for Mississippi. Besides, uh, beside a couple of the states that I've been watching, Barbara and Howard, you people have landslides. Uh, <laughs> I've been watching Iowa, where I was born. 41% uh, of the precincts have reported in Iowa, and it's 49% for Ford, 49% for Carter. Uh, I've been, <laughs> been watching Texas, which uh, uh, is a critical state. 53% of the precincts in Texas have now reported. 50% for uh, Jimmy Carter, 49% for Ford, 1% for uh, Gene McCarthy. For a while, Eugene McCarthy seemed to be using his 1% in Texas in favor of President Ford. Now he's shifted and is using it in favor of Jimmy Carter. Uh, that, that big state out west, California, it is much too soon to tell. The only thing that we do know is that there's been a, an exceptionally heavy turnout to be reported in California. 85% of the registered voters have gone to the polls in Los Angeles County, so it's going to be a big vote there. We have standing by in Washington Senator Henry Jackson, and he is with uh, Frank Tomlinson, and we'll go right now to the senator. Senator Jackson, uh, just a little while ago, Jim Baker, the president's uh, campaign manager, predicted that this election is going to be won in the West. Have we reached a point where you can reach and win the election in the West? Well, Frank, uh, the election will be won before it hits the West. Uh, I believe the political arithmetic is with uh, Jimmy Carter. He's going to win it before he hits the West, uh, West Coast, especially California. Well, when... When they get to the West here, there are 98 votes in the 11 Western states. Uh, how many do you think Jimmy Carter is going to take? Well, if you believe the polls, it's going to be rough sledding out here. But I think that uh, California, with the heavy turnout, uh, could be a turnaround and, and could be uh, for Jimmy Carter. I, I think it's going to end up that way at this point. As Barbara noted earlier this evening, we are not going to have a woman to be seated with you in the U.S. Senate because you have no opposition basically here. Uh, but uh, there is a woman running for governor here, Dixie Lee Ray, a former head of the Atomic Energy Commission. How's she going to make out? She's going to win. Uh, you know, it's been a popular thing to do to walk down the street and say, uh, what's your party affiliation? Usually they say, I vote for the man. I think in the state of Washington, at least, in one of the top offices, they'll be saying, I'm voting for the woman. Why is it here in the state of Washington that you, Henry Jackson, last time you got 87% of the vote? Seems the only question with you right now is whether you're going to get 87 again or maybe 90. Well, uh, our people are very independent-minded. Uh, I've received these big margins while at the same time they'll be voting for uh, a Republican governor or for so some other Republican for statewide office or for the White House. It's, uh, I think, uh, typical of the West. Our people uh, do vote for the person. How much of a, a role is, is the Watergate playing in this thing right now tonight? Uh, neither Playboy or Watergate uh, really uh, have been a topic of uh, conversation out here that I could find. Neither one had an influence? Well, I can't say. Maybe uh, subconsciously, yes, but not overtly. People have not been talking. Once in a while, they'd come up and whisper to you, what about Playboy? And, but that was a rather rare thing, and, and uh, Watergate uh, came up peripherally rather than uh, directly. Barbara, I believe you have a question. <laughs> yes, I'm sorry. It's a little hard for us sometimes to communicate when we can't see each other. But, Senator, I, I wonder, as you sit there tonight, you must have some, uh, some memories. You must have some feeling of it, it might have been I. Do you feel that? Do you look back and say, if only I had done this or that? <laughs> if you say yes, I, you know, that, you, that you're not thinking of this at all, I'd be surprised. Well, Barbara, I've campaigned uh, hard uh, for uh, Governor Carter in Florida, New York, Connecticut, California, and into Utah. And, uh, you know, when you go into politics, uh, you run, you, you must recognize that there can only be one winner. And I'm pretty philosophical about it. And I, uh, sure, I have some second thoughts. Uh, we made some mistakes along the way. But uh, I've been wholeheartedly for Governor Carter from the very beginning, and I'm proud of that. Thank you very much, Senator. It's nice to see you all the way across the country. Good to see you again. And the weather is nice out here, Barbara. Thank you.
Earlier this evening, ABC News projected Daniel Patrick Moynihan, the winner in the New York Senate race, and apparently his opponent, James Buckley, uh, was ready to concede. Just a few minutes ago, Buckley made this statement. But I want to say this, that we've had six years in the Senate of the United States, all of us, you and me, we have shown that we, in New York, we in New York have grown from a, what was considered a fringe 39% to something which was a serious contender for freedom, for sound government, for common sense, for the principles that will allow our communities and our families to, de to, de to determine their own destinies. We're gonna to continue to work, all of us, you and me. We have got New York on the move. We got the country on the move. I intend to continue to work with you to ensure that we have sound government and freedom and the conservative cause. In any, in any struggle, there are setbacks, but in every struggle, there is progress, and we're on the right side, and we're gonna make it. <laughs> and so I wish Daniel Patrick Moynihan well, because I wish New York well, and I wish the country well, but we are gonna be there pushing our points forward, and we're going to succeed. This country is going to continue in the direction of the conservative cause, the control cause. James Buckley, in a cheerful concession speech tonight, conceding that the next senator of New York will be Daniel Patrick Moynihan. Coming up next, more of our continuous electric election coverage right after this. Welcome back to our election night coverage. I want to talk a little bit at this point about women and talk to two women. First of all, the situation about women. The only woman who was running for the United States Senator, Gloria Schaefer, was defeated in the state of Connecticut and Lowell Weicker was uh, re-elected there. There is one woman still running for governor, still has a chance uh, for governor, and that's Dixie Lee Ray in Washington. Uh, there, are nine, there were 19 women in the House of Representatives. And women are doing well this evening in the House. There are 13 up for re-election, and all are leading in their districts. And also one new woman has won, uh, Barbara Mikulski of Maryland, whom they say might be another Bella Abzug. Well, I don't know if there could be another Bella Abzug, but Bella Abzug will not be in uh, the House of Representatives this year because she ran for Senate in New York, and she lost that primary election and so at least for the next uh, two years she will not be part of the scene uh, in Washington in the House. But Bella Abzug is with us tonight uh, here in New York and you see her and also in Houston joining us Congresswoman Barbara Jordan and we welcome them both. How do you feel tonight when you look you see Buckley you know that Moynihan won here in New York and you think it might have been Bella Abzug. How do you feel? Can you hear? How do I feel? Yes. Well, I want to congratulate Mr. Moynihan. I think uh, that uh, New York needs a vigorous representation, and I hope he can give it to us. I think uh, you always have a certain amount of disappointment. I won't deny that. But uh, he won, and I congratulate him. And I think and hope that uh, we will all be better off for it. I want to come back and ask what you're going to be doing for the next two years, at least, because I'm sure you'll be doing a great deal. But as I mentioned earlier, we have Barbara Jordan in Houston. And I wonder how you feel at this point about the fact that we will have women in the House, but we don't have any women in the Senate. How do you feel women are doing? Well, Barbara, in the main, women are doing well when it comes to representation in the House of Representatives. It is a serious and deep disappointment to me that there still will be no woman in the United States Senate. I think that that is a situation which must change, and perhaps in time we will change it, but I am very disappointed that the Senate remains an all-male citadel of political power. How do you explain it, Ms. Jordan, that uh, I, when I came to Washington, there were two women in the Senate, 
Now women have gained special rights everywhere, and there are no women left in the Senate as of last election. What happened? What's happened? You know, I know that people find it difficult to believe, but I firmly believe there is a feeling that is very strong among men in the populace and some women that the United States Senate is not a place for a woman. I think that that is very latent, but it is real, and I feel that that is what is happening, that attitude is surfacing, that the Senate is not a body for women. How about you, Ms. Abzug? Do you, what's your opinion of that? Well, I'd like to say that uh, in the history of the Senate, uh, only two women actually ever were elected in their own right. Most of the women were elected as, uh, you know, condolences for the death of their husbands. I think that the public, by reason of polls, and even in my own election, I lost, if you recall, by one point. The public is ready for it, but I think there's an enormous amount of resistance on the part of those in power, which is essentially male, and in that sense, I agree with my colleague, Barbara. There is a resistance to allowing women to be at the very top, whether it's in the United States Senate, at the top of a trade union, at the top of a corporation, at the top of a broadcasting system. Uh, we find this uh, very interesting. Women are moving up little by little. More women are running for office in the state. Uh, women are running for office in the Congress. But when we get to the very top, that's when they give us the push. And I think we all have to realize that that has got to change. I agree with Barbara that we can't go into our 200th anniversary without making sure that next time around we get women into the Senate and we make the power structures respond to it much more uh, in a more committed way. And I think if Carter wins, who has made a strong commitment to women on all levels of government, that that should considerably help and cause a change in the attitude of those at the top of the power structures of our country. Mrs. Abzig, I listen to you talk, and I think as soon as this uh, election race is over, you and I should sit down and have a cup of tea and chat a little bit. We've got some, we've got some things to discuss. I, I do want to ask... I uh, certainly look forward to that. Thank you. I would like to ask you one more question while we're, we're still with you. What are you going to do for the next two years? You, you must have thought ahead. You're certainly not going to leave politics. So what do you see as your strategy? Well, I really haven't uh, had a chance to talk to myself yet. I've been working very hard in the Carter campaign since the election uh, was over in the primary. Uh, I expect to be able to remain in the public arena fighting for the things I've always fought for, peace, rights for all people, especially women, economic security for people. I'll be out there. I'll be having lots of cups of tea, though, before I decide just what it is that would be most effective for me to do. Congresswoman Jordan, what about you? People expect great things from you. You'll be back in the House. What about Senate or even further after than that in the future? Well, uh, Barbara, I am not going to write anything out of my political future. Uh, I don't know whether it will be the Senate or some other uh, area of endeavor, but uh, suffice it to say, I'm delighted to be returned to the House, and I fully intend to remain open to whatever opportunity appears to be logical and practical for me. Thank you very much, Congresswoman Jordan. We congratulate you on your re-election tonight. And to Mrs. Abzug, there will be a great many people who will miss you very much in the House, and we expect to see you continuing in politics, certainly. Thank you. Coming up, more of our continuous election coverage right after this. A quick look now at the uh, popular vote. Half of it's been counted, 48% of the precincts reporting in. Carter, 51%. Ford, 49%. Meanwhile, there have been some more results in the United States Senate, and Frank Reynolds has those. Frank? In the state of Nevada, it comes as no surprise to anybody that uh, Senator Howard Cannon will be uh, re-elected to a fourth term. That's the ABC News projection at this point, with uh, not very many votes in, but not many are required to uh, make a projection about Nevada, particularly when Howard Cannon is the candidate. Uh, Cannon... Uh, has been in the Senate for three terms. Actually, he became famous, however, when uh, he was, as chairman of the Rules Committee, he handled the hearings looking into both uh, Vice Presidential Designate Gerald Ford and uh, Rockefeller. Now let's go to, Moynihan, to uh, Daniel Patrick Moynihan here at his headquarters in New York. They said that New York was on the ballot this November 2nd, and New York won. Yeah. Yeah. 
would like to thank Senator Buckley for his gracious statement. It is the case that he represents a political view in this country and that he will carry on fighting for that view as he ought to do. And I'll go on fighting him and that view. And <laughs> So there is uh, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, the newly elected senator from the state of New York. We have one other uh, projection to make at this point. We had the man on the air here just a short while ago, Senator Henry Jackson of the state of Washington. Uh, ABC News now projects with absolute certainty that he will be the victor in his bid for re-election. He's defeating George Brown, an airline pilot. The last time around, Senator Jackson got 82% of the vote in 1970. The only question now is whether he will uh, actually increase that kind of a margin. So that's the story on the Senate. Thank you, Frank. Just to bring you up to date, right at this point, electoral votes, Carter 197, Ford 85. And we'll have more of our continuous election coverage right after this. Carter 197, electoral votes, Ford 85. That's the national election night story at 22 minutes after the hour. I'm Harry Reasoner. Good evening again for myself and for Howard K. Smith and Barbara Walters. Uh, we are now well into this election night. It is very close. At the moment, with a popular vote, 51% of the precincts in the country have reported. Uh, Jimmy Carter is holding a 51 to 48% lead, which has been about the way it's gone for the last two or three hours. We now have a new projection, though, that is of importance and encouragement to the President Ford's forces. His home state of Michigan is projected by ABC News to go to Gerald Ford by a very close margin, giving him 21 electoral votes. The Michigan popular vote at the moment, uh, Jer uh, Jimmy Carter is still ahead, 51 to 48 percent, but that's a margin that has been shrinking very steadily, and uh, we project that eventually the state will go to Ford. Barbara? Some more good news for Ford. His uh, second home uh, is Colorado because of Vail, where he has a condominium, and Colorado has gone to Ford by a close margin, and that was a state that was very close. It only has seven electoral votes. Well, that's not bad, but if you add up a whole bunch of those electoral votes, you can really begin to sway things. So it's good news for Ford that he is Colorado. And that leaves the uh, electoral vote total at the moment, as uh, according to ABC's state projections, with 270 needed. Uh, Jimmy Carter has 197. Gerald Ford, 113. We'd like to take a look now at some important uh, gubernatorial races. And for that, we'll go to Ann Compton. Harry, we have a call now for the first woman for the evening to win a statewide race in the state of Washington. ABC News is projecting that Dixie Lee Ray, the Democratic candidate, a novice to uh, uh, politics, uh, beating John Spellman, a local county executive in, uh, in the Seattle area, Dixie Lee Ray by a comfortable margin. She uh, is a newcomer to politics, ran a somewhat unorthodox campaign, running as an outsider by uh, and a non-politician getting the nomination, but uh, during the regular campaign, she uh, called in for help from many of the establishment Democrats in the state. Another ABC projection in the state of Utah. This time, another Democrat making it a clean sweep of the western states for the Democrats this evening. Scott Matheson, a railroad lawyer, uh, defeating a repo coming from behind in the polls, as a matter of fact, to take the governorship of Utah, following behind uh, the incumbent Calvin Rampton, who did not seek uh, re-election. Scott Matheson with now about 54% of the vote over Vernon Romney, a distant relative of not only Governor George Romney, but uh, some high officials in the Mormon church. Scott Matheson, a railroad lawyer, now the new governor of Utah. And ABC News is projecting in Montana the incumbent Thomas Judge will be winning. The, uh, uh, there was something of a local scandal in the state of Montana. Judge overcame that, overcame Republican opposition. So those are three states uh, where the Democrats have come out on top uh, in the western end of the state, in the, of the country. Some Senate results from Frank Reynolds. Yes, Ann, and we have one that I think is probably going to be a bit surprising to a good many people. In the state of Wyoming, there is going to be a new United States senator, according to ABC News projection at this time. Malcolm Wallop, the Republican challenger, is going to be the victor when all the votes are counted. Wallop is 43 years old. He's a rancher. He also happens to be a Yale man, and uh, he was born in New York. 
An interesting thing about him is that he has proposed that uh, senators be limited to two terms. Might be interesting to see 12 years from now how he feels about that. He's defeated a longtime power in the Senate, Gail McGee of Wyoming, who was trying for his fourth term. McGee was the chairman of the Post Office and Civil Service Committee, and uh, the challenger, uh, Mr. Wallop, uh, got around to blaming McGee for uh, poor mail service in uh, the state of Wyoming, and apparently that was one of the factors that may have contributed to his defeat. So there's an incumbent who was a real power in the Senate in terms of longevity and chairmanship of some powerful committees, and Gail McGee has gone down to defeat, according to our projection, Senator-elect Malcolm Wallop, a Republican from Wyoming, will take his place in the Senate. That's it for the Senate right now. I'm sorry, Barbara? Barbara, I consider that to be a real upset, the McGee defeat. He was defeated by a man named Malcolm Wallop, who likes to be shown riding horseback, a real Westerner, yet he was born in New York City of British parents. <laughs> he's, a, he's an emigre to <laughs> McGee's territory. Yeah, he sounds like an athletic renaissance man. Nothing but a dial tone. <laughs> Even at, at this point, uh, things are very close, obviously, but... But there are still some states where we are just much too close to make any kind of a projection, uh, even in the South, where so many of the states uh, have already gone for Jimmy Carter, for example. Uh, Mississippi, with seven electoral votes, we still don't know what, what that's going to be, and 55% of the precincts have already reported Carter is ahead of Ford by only 3%, 51% to 48%. Um, as we go out west, for example, New Mexico, and people take a look at that state uh, for many reasons, one of which is it's voted for a winner since it entered the Union in 1912 in New Mexico with 67% of the precincts reporting, Ford 52 to Carter 48%. Oklahoma's another state much too close to call still with 97% of the precincts in. It's Ford 58 to Carter 49, and McCarthy, as you can see, with just 1%, so there's still lots of States coming in and still perhaps some surprises. We've got uh, three among the states I'm keeping track of that could almost uh, end the election one way or another. My original home state of Iowa now has reported 72% of its precincts, uh, by which time you would assume you could get a result, and it stays 49% to 49%. Uh, Gerald Ford with a little bit higher 49% than uh, Carter's uh, 49%. And McCarthy, the 2% there, uh, may be making the difference. In uh, Wisconsin, 37% of the precincts in. Uh, Carter ahead, 53% to 45%, but it is from areas that makes uh, the state as a whole too close to call. In Texas, it remains Carter 51%, Ford 48%, with 65% of the precincts in, in Texas. Those three states could make an awful lot of difference. Uh, we've got a man, we've got a man standing by in Los Angeles who, uh, has campaigned for uh, Jimmy Carter, even though he campaigned against him in the primaries, and who may have something to say about the very important state of California. Governor uh, Gary Brown is out there. Good evening, Governor. Good evening. How are you? Um, I'm pretty good. Have you figured good. out uh, 35 minutes after the polls close how California is going to go? No, but I wouldn't be surprised if it followed the national trend. In the I think the country is, uh, follows a certain mood, and Jimmy Carter has been able to project the sense of leadership, the uh, obvious uh, fact that government has to take the lead and yet at the same time I think he's been uh, prudent in, in terms of fiscal matters and the people have been responding to it at least as far as I can see. What's your guess Governor Brown as, as to what happened to Jimmy Carter's overwhelming lead after the Democratic Convention? How did he, how was it dissipated? Well uh, when I look tonight it looks to me in uh, fairly good shape. The, the large uh, numbers that we saw uh, very early in the in the season, I don't think you can take too seriously. Ford hadn't been nominated. The exposure of the last uh, 45 days hadn't occurred. And as things come together, people tend to follow their own particular political party. It it tends to narrow down. But I'm very impressed that when we add together the South and looking at some of the industrial states, that uh, a Democrat, Jimmy Carter, is doing quite well. But in California, Governor, don't you put any credence in the last field poll which gave Ford a 6% lead in California? Well, there's so many polls that I uh, don't keep up with them, really. There's the Corey poll, and Pat Cadell has his polls, and Field has his. I think the, it comes down to a question of what the voters are looking for. And with Gerald Ford, there was the 
really a request to just keep things the way they were. There was no sense of, of the future, no possibility, uh, and no opening to, to new directions. And Jimmy Carter, with, with uh, his commitment and his activism and his democratic constituency, uh, I think uh, when you t cut away all the commercials and, and all the talk, it comes down to a question of, of trying something new, of looking to the future, and using government uh, to solve uh, a number of the problems that are affecting us as a people. Governor, at this point, with just 3% of the precincts in California reporting in, we have that Ford has 53% to Plot has 47%. Obviously, it's too soon to, to know. But from your own uh, uh, material you're receiving there, the northern part of the state usually goes Democratic, and the southern part of the state usually goes Republican. Does that seem to be holding up as in past pictures? Well, I, I wouldn't. Uh, that's often been said, but the early returns are absentee votes that are traditionally Republican. So I would not at all, be, I wouldn't be at all surprised to see uh, Jimmy Carter carrying California because I think this state responds in the same way that uh, some of the other states would. Pennsylvania, Illinois, uh, some of the eastern states. Uh, we're concerned about the environment. Uh, Ford had very little to say about that. Jimmy Carter, a great deal to say. Uh, Governor Carter talked a great deal about nuclear proliferation. And up until the last week of the campaign, uh, Gerald Ford had almost nothing to say about that. So I think people are looking for hope, they're looking uh, for the future, and on almost each of the significant turning issues, employment, environment, energy, uh, and as a matter of confidence in government, uh, Jimmy Carter was presenting a case that uh, more people could identify with. Governor, when you were campaigning in the primaries against Governor Carter, there wasn't very much uh good feeling between the two of you but then you didn't know each other very well well now you well, I wouldn't I really wouldn't describe it that way I uh, was a, an opponent I tried to uh, set the, the case as I saw it and uh, as far as feelings go when you run against somebody you try to make your be best case and I think Jimmy Carter made his so I think that was a uh, rather exaggerated by the necessity of making these differences appear greater than they sometimes are. Well, how do you feel about him now that you have been with him on a, on a personal level? Do you feel close? Do you consider yourself friends? Or is it a good democratic political relationship? How would you describe it? I think it's a good relationship. I'm impressed. Uh, certainly the last day when the Gallup poll came out and that incident in Plains, I was very impressed by, the, by uh, Governor Carter's ability to take it all with uh, a degree of equanimity and, and calm that uh, will serve him very well in, in the troubled waters of the White House that, that I think he's going to find himself in. Governor, so I was very impressed with that the last if day. If Carter wins and stays in office eight years, you will still be a very young man when he's out. Do you Someone have any... said I'll be younger than Gerald Ford is now in 1994, so <laughs> I'm not in any great hurry. Well, thank you very much, Governor. Thank you, Governor. Coming up next, more of our continuous election coverage right after this. Well, it's a quarter of 12 on the East Coast. 54% of the nation's precincts have had their votes counted. And in that popular vote, Jimmy Carter continues to hold a 51 to 48% lead. There are still some states that are too close to call that could make it go either way. Lou Harris has been watching not only the votes as they came in, but uh, the reports from his and ABC's own national model. Lou, what's your report at the moment? Uh, Harry, we find with two-thirds of the national model vote in that that three-point Carter lead seems to hold. Now, we have some very interesting analysis here. Some of the key groups in the population who voted very differently tonight from the way they have in the past. Uh, first, two that didn't. The black vote now is firmed up to an 81 to 17 point uh, Carter lead. That is substantial. They didn't turn out in bigger numbers, but gave him a very handsome majority. The Spanish speaking, 70 to 29 percent, a very big lead indeed. However, among white Catholics, we find that Ford is ahead 50 to 49 percent, and that's a big setback for Jimmy Carter. He just somehow never sold himself to the white Catholic group. An interesting one, and we've now got nearly all of the Jewish precincts in, our count shows 54 to 44 percent for Jimmy Carter. That is not a good showing by any standard here. But then he reverses it by being the first Democratic candidate, I'd guess in about, uh, oh, about 30 years, except, well, maybe Lyndon Johnson in his landslide, to carry the, be ahead with the white Protestant vote, 48 to 46 percent. That's the biggest surprise to me, and when we trace it down, 
You can see that it comes down to the White Baptist group, Jimmy Carter's own religious group, going for him 57 to 43 percent. That's interesting because in 1972, Richard Nixon took that vote by three to one, White Baptist. So there was a religious issue working here, and one working very strongly for Jimmy Carter. In fact, I'd say that if you didn't have this turnaround of Carter making up all the ground lost among Catholics and Jews by getting a, a huge majority, a 14-point majority with White Baptists tonight, uh, he'd have been in deep trouble. Thank you, Lou. Harry? Thank you. Uh, there was an interesting answer the other day, that question that uh, got Jimmy Carter in trouble in Playboy about lusting in your heart. There was a candidate in California who said he lusted after women in his heart every hour on the hour, but because he was so busy campaigning, he would have to settle for that. That's S.I. Hayakawa, <laughs> this, the unusual senatorial candidate who is right now, I believe, with Bill Redeker in Los Angeles. I'll just bring that again. He's already quoted this. That's, that's correct, Harry. Dr. Hayakawa, you are somewhat of a political phenomenon in this state. This is the first time you have run for elective office, and the California poll last week placed you within two percentage points of incumbent John Tunney. Why are you so popular? Why are you so well received? Well, I have a reputation from outside the political area altogether through my writings, my lecturing, my uh, textbooks that people have been studying in school for 35 years, my newspaper columns, and also my work as president of San Francisco State College, which received a large amount of notoriety. And that was your opposition uh, at that time, I believe, eight years ago to uh, campus radicals, was it? Yes, not? it was. Uh huh. You are 70 years old, and that has been used against you politically. How do you respond to the criticism that because of your age, you cannot make the traditional claim that you'll serve for many terms and accumulate seniority that would benefit California? Well, there are several answers to that. The first is that, that very few senators going for the first time go in with an already established national reputation in another field, so that in a sense that there, there isn't the need to uh, establish a lot of seniority in order to get heard. But another answer I've often liked to give is that I could serve three terms, not only be 88 when I'm finished, and my mother's alive and well and in full possession of her faculties at the age of 92. 92? Yes. Your stand on various issues has sort of defied categorization. In some cases, you've admitted you had no ideas whatsoever. Is that still the case? Well, uh, I'm sure it's still the case for people who've served in the Senate for a long, long time. But uh, after a few years of, pub of practice in public oratory, you learn how to conceal your ignorance very, very well. But I haven't learned to do that yet. There is a heavy voter turnout in Southern California. Will that help you or the incumbent? I think it'll help me very, very much because something like 35% or more of Democrats are voting for me. And if I get a full Republican turnout too, then by gosh, I got it made. Dr. Hayakawa, thank you very much. Back to New York and Barbara Walters. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hayakawa. With 64% of the key precincts in California reporting, it's still a 50-50 split, much too early to call. And um, coming up next, we'll have more continuous election coverage right after this. Well, coming up next, more of our continuous election coverage right after this. Well, as projected results go, this one is rather sensational. The third most populous state, Pennsylvania, ABC News projects it will go to Jimmy Carter. Jimmy Carter takes the third most populous state after having taken the second most populous one in New York City. And that is the national election story at 52 minutes after the hour. With Harry Reisner and Barbara Walters, I'm Howard K. Smith in ABC's election headquarters. We just reported that the third most populous state, Pennsylvania, has been captured by Carter. The national figures now in popular vote, 57% of the uh, votes have been counted. Carter leads 51% to Ford's 48%. Barbara, have you some other results? Yes, I have the, a projection for the state of Oklahoma. Oklahoma, with eight votes, has gone to Ford by a close margin. This state was considered a toss-up, and if uh, Ford needs some good news, it's just eight votes, but they are for him. The um, electoral vote 
is Ford 121 to Carter's 224. It would take very little more to put Carter across if he could win the big states. 46 votes would do it, 46 electoral votes, according okay. to our projection. We've been keeping track through the evening on separate cards of how the, these two candidates have put together their winning states, and beginning with Jimmy Carter, uh, he has accumulated uh, his 224 electoral votes, beginning in terms of size with New York, the second biggest in the country, then Pennsylvania, the third biggest, Florida, which was not a surprise but was uh, very necessary for him, Massachusetts, North Carolina, and Georgia, all expected, although North Carolina could have gone the other way. Missouri was, a, I think, at least a moderate surprise for Jimmy Carter and heart heartening for him. And Louisiana, uh, Howard K. Smith, who grew up there and has studied the state, says this year that uh, is a surprise to him. Maryland, no surprise. Minnesota, no surprise. Tennessee and Alabama, of course, no surprise. Kentucky, he uh, figured to do it. South Carolina, he figured. Arkansas, West Virginia, Rhode Island, and Delaware. Washington, D.C. was no surprise. That's his total of 224 with the big ones that he's gotten so far that are extremely important, New York and Pennsylvania, and uh, there's some big ones still to come. If you want to take a look at what this looks like in the map so that you can have some idea of which way various sections of the country are going, we'll show you our map now. And the blue is for Carter and the yellow is for Ford. And you can see, of course, in the far west, it's too early for us to call those states. And out there is the state of California with the largest number of electoral votes, 45. And we said earlier, it's still a split with the key precincts uh, reporting in. So we, it's much, much too early for us to call California. I have the impression that President Ford has got to really make some sweeps of the remaining big states in order to catch up and win. Mm -hmm. I think he has to win them all, really. I mean, if. Uh... If he lost either Illinois or Ohio, uh, or a combination of states like Wisconsin and Iowa, which are so close that it's unbelievable. Iowa remains at 49-49. I think you've still got Ohio tied up. But uh, it is a case, as Lou Harris pointed out a couple of hours ago, where President Ford now has to, he cannot afford to lose any more major states. And uh, Jimmy Carter could lose one or two of those and still make it. I don't know whether Governor Brown was talking the way a politician talks or not, but if he knew something we don't know about the trend of opinion in California, well, that would be the ultimate disaster for Ford. Well, at this point, it is from, from our projection. He may have insight that we don't, but from our projection, it is not known yet. The only thing that is known is that it was quite a heavy voter turnout. But in general, as we look back, there are not too many surprises tonight. We had heard it wouldn't be a very heavy voter turnout, and Lou Harris says that, that from uh, what he's been able to judge, it has not been a very heavy turnout. There have not really been surprises. We knew that Ford would have this uh, kind of a problem beforehand. So it's almost been um, a more predictable election than we had thought maybe a, a day or two or three ago. Well, if you look at the popular vote, 51 to 48 percent, which is the way it has stayed now, I think, since about 8.30, nationally. That's almost exactly uh, what the polls figured would happen if you split the undecided. It was a 1% margin one way or another, and if you split it according to the way they expected the undecided to go, they figured Carter would lead by 3%, and he has all evening. But it's amazing how these uh, states that matter now that have not been uh, projected stick to their, their almost even races. You mentioned Iowa a moment ago. It just won't budge from that uh, neck and neck condition. You know, we have Oklahoma with 97% of the precincts uh, already in, and it's still uh, Ford 50 and Carter 49. Well, take a look at uh, take take a look at the state of Texas, uh, which is very important. Uh, the Democratic National Chairman uh, Robert Strauss made a $5,000 bet that uh, Carter would take Texas, so he has a strong <laughs> personal stake in it as uh, well as a matter of principle. Texas, 72% of the precincts are reported by now. Carter is leading by 51 to 48%, exactly the same figure as his national one. And yet, uh, the people on our uh, desk who are keeping track of it and checking it on and out feel that you cannot call it yet. Well, we'll be right back, coming up next on our continuous selection coverage, right after this. Waiting for us down in Tucson, Arizona, his home, Pima County, is Congressman Mo Udall, who made a very big splash, especially in Wisconsin in the primaries, 
and we're going to talk to him now. He makes himself visible. There he is, Congressman Udall. Tell me, uh, is it uh, true that a Democratic president can work better with a Democratic Congress than a Republican one can? Well, sure it's true, and uh, that's one, been one of the big issues this year. Did, did the people really want more stalemate, more vetoes, more congressional energy programs as opposed to presidential energy programs, or did they want some cooperation? I think one of the things that people are saying out there across the country tonight, if, if Carter wins and it looks like he will, is that they want the Congress to cooperate with the president. I think we will cooperate with him. If, Congressman, tell me, um, you were the only candidate in the primaries who applied a sense of humor. Do you feel that it's dangerous for a politician to use a sense of humor when campaigning? No, it's the only way you survive, and uh, y humor counts for a lot. Uh, not cruel humor, not vicious humor, but the best kind of humor, I think, is that that's poked at yourself or, or maybe at your opponent in a kind sort of way, but not a vicious way. Congressman Udall, this is Harry Reisner. Uh, one of the things that uh, Jimmy Carter talked about at the Democratic Convention shortly after is a, a mandate to work with the Democratic Congress. Now, somehow a 32-point lead in the polls has been dissipated, if he wins, it will be by a very small margin in the popular vote. Is that going to give him a problem? Well, Jimmy Carter didn't run with, he didn't win by and large with the help of the members of Congress. He ran a kind of an independent campaign. And having won, if he does, very narrowly, he's, he's not going to have a big victory, a big mandate. He will have won very narrowly. I think it's more and more apparent that he'll have to work with the Congress, and I believe that he will. Beyond this, uh, the Congress is in a much more aggressive, independent mood. Uh, we've reformed the Congress. We want to be heard from. We want to be consulted. And uh, there's a disposition to cooperate with the President Carter. I think we'll be trying as hard as we can. But we want to be equal partners in this operation. And that would have been the case uh, whoever won tonight. Congressman Udall, I remember a little while back at one point we were talking, and you said that you rather thought that your future role might be similar to that of Barry Goldwater in the Republican Party, that you'd keep things kind of stirred up and that you'd speak out when you had something very strong to say, even if it was in your own party. Is that how you see yourself? I think so. I'm serene and happy tonight. I campaigned pretty hard for Jimmy Carter, and I want to be in a, a member of the House after fighting the seniority system all of the years. I've got a good chunk of it, and I hope I'll be in a position to speak out, to support him when he's right, and I think he's going to be right most of the time, but, but, but to act as a spokesman for the millions of people who work for me and help me in this presidential campaign. You think you'll try the primaries again four years from now, Congressman? No, you know, we've had a pattern the last 30 years, eight years of Democrats under Truman, eight years of Republicans under Eisenhower, eight years of Kennedy Johnson, and eight years of Nixon Ford. We're now going to have eight years of Jimmy Carter, and I want to be in the Congress part of that time to help him. And so uh, I had a great adventure. It was, uh, it was a great adventure to campaign all over this country. I think I had one good chance at it, and I'm not looking forward to going back to that uh, road again. Thank you very much, Congressman Udall. Here in New York, where uh, one of the dramatic Senate victories tonight was that of uh, Patrick Moynihan over James Buckley, at Moynihan headquarters is Bettina Gregory, talking to the Senator-elect. Harry, with me is Senator-elect Daniel Patrick Moynihan of New York, who ran a very tight race against uh, the incumbent, Senator James Buckley. Senator, did you expect to win so easily or so quickly? Well, you said it was a tight race. I, I gather we won fairly well. I expected to win, not perhaps by as much as I did, but then there was a strong support across the state. New York was on the ballot this year. We need to make a claim on Washington, and obviously I proposed to do so, and that's what the voters chose. Senator, there was an extremely heavy voter turnout, particularly in New York City and especially in the ghetto areas. You received something like 77 percent of the black vote. Do you consider this a mandate from this segment of the population? Well, surely. Uh, the, we're all minorities in New York, you know. I've been happy to have got 77 percent of the Irish vote. I don't suppose I did. But the Puerto Rican uh, New Yorkers, black New Yorkers, uh, yes, we are New Yorkers. We want this city to live and the state to grow, and we've got a battle on our hands. Not much good news ahead for us, you know. I know that. I think the people know it. Senator-elect Moynihan, this is Howard Smith. I never expected we would have this confrontation when I knew you back in London. 
when you were a student? I was just telling Bettina 26 years ago, Howard. <laughs> I wish Paul Niven were here to see it. I do, too. Congratulations to you. Thank you, sir. Tell me, what are you, what are you, uh, why do you think more was not made about the fact that you were in the Nixon and Ford administrations? I should have thought they'd have made much about that. Well, I, I went around and said that I'd worked in the cabinet, the sub-cabinet, the last four presidents, and I knew the national government. I wasn't afraid of it. We had, that one had to use it. That, uh, it wasn't a question of getting it off our back. It was getting it on our side. And this notion that the American people are afraid of their government and think it's an alien institution is not so. At least it's not so in New York, and a good thing too, Howard. Pat, uh, Pat you said uh, to your um, voters, you'll know I'm there. Now, what are you going to do, first of all, to let them know you're there? I think the first job we are going to have is to get New York City's financial situation in shape, and the next thing is to call on the president-elect. I hope it's going to be Governor Carter. And, sit down and see about the democratic platform. I helped draft the platform. I drafted most of the urban planks in it. And he has come out very strongly on behalf of welfare reform, which is the, a plank I wrote, and he so said. And let's see if we get down and get some legislation together and get it up to the Congress and get it passed and get some of that burden off New York, which has carried it alone or almost alone for too long now. Well, congratulations, Senator-elect, and thank you very much. Thanks, I'll Howard. see you again. Coming up next, more of our continuous election coverage right after this. We're back now. I want to talk with you about one of the referendums which can affect anyone who likes to gamble throughout this whole country and particularly affect those who like to gamble in the state of New Jersey. New Jersey had a referendum which would approve casino gambling, uh, make gambling legal in the state, but uh, only restricting it to Atlantic City. And the New Jersey voters have approved casino gambling in Atlantic City. That vote is not complete, but it's substantial. It's been running four to three in favor. That should rejuvenate the city, and it will mean that a great many people who went out west, who went out to Las Vegas, will be coming east to Atlantic City, and that could mean much for that city and for the whole state. Howard has a projection for us, and then we'll have more referendums later on. I don't know whether this is anticlimax after that or not. <laughs> Alaska, the biggest state in the Union, two and a half times as big as Texas, covers four time zone, goes to Ford. ABC News projects that President Ford has carried Alaska. One of the states which uh, we still do not know about, one of the states which is still very close, is Mississippi, one of the southern states. It's now part of 51% and Ford 48%. And a man who knows a good deal about the South and its temperament and its moods is with us right now. George Wallace is in Montgomery, Alabama. Good evening, Governor Wallace. And may I ask you, first of all, since you did do campaigning in Mississippi for Governor Carter, have you had any word that we might not know about about how that state's going? So, uh, Governor Carter uh, is meeting at the present time. Uh, it's always been very close in Mississippi during this campaign, but I think you'll carry Mississippi in, and, and all of the South, including Texas. <laughs> Governor, what is your mood like tonight? Uh, this, this is an election that might possibly have been yours. How do you feel this evening? I feel good that uh, we have now seen a deep Southerner elected uh, president of the United States, which means that regardless of where you're from, Georgia, Mississippi, Alabama, or Michigan, a young reporter traveling with us one day turned to me in an airplane somewhere over central Illinois and said to me what I think says it best. I think we're having some audio yes. troubles, Governor. Uh, yes, Governor, we're having some difficulties hearing you. We will try to come back with you later. We're having some audio troubles, so we'll have to return now to our studio. Perhaps if you can stand by, we can continue our conversation just a little bit later. Let us give you the electoral vote picture right now as it stands, Carter, with 224 electoral votes and Ford with 124. And we'll have more of our continuous election coverage right after this. We'd like to express our gratitude once more to the League of Women Voters. I'd like to explain to you why. When we project the winner of an election, we base our projection on early vote counts made immediately when the polls close in a state very early. And right there in all of our 3,000 key precincts we've chosen across the country, 
of volunteers from the league. They telephone the first returns to other league volunteers you see here at our computer center from in Connecticut. Our political specialists take it from there and make the projection. But back at the source in those 3,000 key precincts is where reliability starts. We found through several election years that the women of the league report accurately and on time and from 99% of the precincts, and that's an amazing record. The League of Women Voters, by the way, is the same organization that sponsored the four debates, three presidential ones and one vice presidential one. I think, uh, I think it's an appropriate time to look at a little arithmetic on electoral votes. At the moment of you know, ABC's projected totals, Jimmy Carter has 224, Gerald Ford has 124. That means that uh, Jimmy Carter needs 46 for the 270 he needed to win, and President Ford would need 146. The point is that, well, that sounds good for Carter. He has to get the 46. There are 190 electoral votes still up for grabs, still not projected. They are in uh, big states like Illinois and Ohio and Texas. They are in smaller states like Wisconsin and Iowa. And there just doesn't seem to be any movement. In, uh, in Texas, for instance, uh, with 73% of the precincts reporting, uh, Jimmy Carter has a 52 to 48% lead, but it is still too close to make any intelligent call. Iowa sticks stubbornly at 49-49 and has, I think, since the first vote came in. People from Iowa, I hear, are very stubborn. They are stubborn. Yes. Right. Uh, <laughs> lest you, all of you in Iowa call in and say, how dare she say that, you do know that your native son is Harry Reasoner, and he has, from time to time, known to be somewhat stubborn. Right. Mississippi is still a toss-up. That southern state is still, and with 64% of the precincts in, it's still Carter 51 to Ford 48, and, and, and no, uh, no call there. Uh, New Mexico, which has uh, four electoral votes, is still a toss-up. And in uh, New Mexico, they usually do go to the winner they have since they were, began in their statehood. Howard? Well, Barbara, that's the national election story at 22 minutes after the hour. In a moment. Good evening. Welcome back to our election night coverage with Howard K. Smith and Harry Reasoner. I'm Barbara Walters, bringing you the results this year in the different races. We'll take a look now, first of all, of what the popular vote is, what the national popular vote is, with 61% of the precincts reporting. Carter has 51% of the vote and almost 26 million votes, and Ford has 48% of the votes with some 24 million. And the electoral, Carter is leading. He has 224 votes. Ford has 124 and 270 are needed in all. And that's the way the overall view is right now. Harry can give us another view of it. It's uh, interesting to look, that, uh, look at that on a colored map of the United States, which we have been keeping up through the evening with the states where ABC News has made a projection. The darker color, the blue, are states that have gone for Carter. The lighter color, the yellow, the states that have gone for Ford. As you can see, uh, the South, except for Mississippi, which is still in doubt, was extremely solid for Jimmy Carter. And the uh, big underpopulated areas of the uh, western Midwest and the mountain states and the plains are almost solidly for uh, Gerald Ford. Uh, Ford made his inroads in the Northeast, in New Jersey, and in uh, part of New England and Connecticut. And uh, Jimmy Carter took New York, the, the second of the 41 electoral votes in New York. But uh, we're dealing with now however, is uh, the fact that it's early yet on the West Coast, too early to call those elections in states like California, and that there are a lot of stubborn states which refuse to commit themselves, left in the Middle West, and some, even one in the East. I'm dealing with Iowa, for instance. 98% uh, of Iowa's precincts have been counted, and it remains 49% to 49%. At the moment, uh, Gerald Ford has pulled ahead He's got a fairly high 49% of nearly a 4,000 vote lead over Jimmy Carter. That difference in Iowa could be one of the cases where Eugene McCarthy held the balance of power. Texas, 74% of the precincts in Texas have reported. Uh, Jimmy Carter has been holding a 51 to 48% lead, a million three hundred thousand to a million two hundred thousand. Uh, but Texas is too close to call. Wisconsin, the other uh, the Midwest state that I'm watching. 55% of the precincts in, a 4% lead for Jimmy Carter, 51 to 47%, but no verdict. Barbara? 
Harry, we have, uh, ABC has a projection in New Mexico with four electoral votes. New Mexico has gone for Ford, and that's a close election. But what is particularly interesting about the state of New Mexico is that it has voted for the winner in every presidential election since it became a state in 1912. And they have gone for Ford. This may break their record. Then again, they may have another winning year. Harry talked about California, and from what we can tell so far, uh, looking at the key precincts that we are watching in particular, it is still 50-50 in California. There's no way of telling now which way the vote is going. Ford uh, supposedly had an edge in that state, but it's 50-50 as, as right now. Mississippi is particularly interesting in the South because they had a dilemma that so many of the states in the South faced and they have not seemed to be able to come to any conclusion yet. That is that Mississippi has Carter, who is their uh, a southerner, who is their southern son, and a great many people lean towards him, and yet by tradition, it is a Republican state. It hasn't voted for a Democratic presidential candidate since 1956. It's still a toss-up. Uh, it was felt that if there was a very strong black vote there, it would help Carter. But the state seems still to be struggling with which way it should go, and we don't have, we're not able to call that as yet. Barbara, Harry talked about stubborn states. Well, the two most stubborn are in the Middle West and the near Middle West, and if they voted for the same man, they could put Carter across. One is Ohio with uh, 67, two-thirds of the votes counted. Ford leads 50 to Carter's 48%. In Illinois, 58% of the votes counted. Carter leads 50 to 49%. Incidentally, in Illinois in 1960, John Kennedy got 50% of the votes and Richard Nixon got 49.8%, and they had to wait until late the next day to find out those figures. I hope we don't have to do it tonight. I'd like to find out where those votes are from. Uh, in the Kennedy and Nixon election, they had a terrible time getting the votes in from Chicago because of the necessity for sending horses out to bring in McCowan and everything else. And <laughs> It wasn't until uh, it was known how many votes they needed from Chicago before the votes finally came in. There was a little hanky-panky, too, Harry. Uh, they have discovered that in San Antonio, Texas, where they were waiting, too, there were some precincts where more people voted for Kennedy than there were voters in the precincts. That's vote early and often, right? Is oh. that, that's a, Fortunately, that's a... all of that kind of thing has disappeared from American politics in the post-Watergate area, and there will be no more <laughs> hanky-panky. We were uh, talking a little while ago and had some audio fraud. We were talking to Governor George Wallace of Alabama. We now believe, Governor, that we can speak to you and uh, hear you, thanks to the miracles of modern electronics, without any further problems. Can you hear us? Yes, Harry, I can hear you. Folks. Governor, I was curious about one thing. You, uh, you began your career in national politics with a frequent thing, that, with a frequent statement that you wanted to send Washington a message. Do you think, uh, do you think your message has gotten through in this election? Well, I think one of the messages that uh, I tried to send through to Washington and to the nation was that uh, the people of our particular region uh, are qualified to run for the presidency, and I think that uh, the people of our nation uh, have recognized that a long time. And I do feel it would be good for the country, and uh, I do feel that there is a new attitude uh, about bureaucracy and uh, about big government. Governor, what about your future plans? Uh, what lies ahead for George Wallace? Well, of course, I'm still alive and in good health, and uh, I am leaning toward the possibility of running for the United States Senate in 1978. Uh, against whom would that be? Would that be would someone retire? Is Senator Sparkman going to retire? Uh, I'm not sure. I do not mean to say that I'm announcing against uh, Senator Sparkman. I've always supported Senator John Sparkman. He's a very good friend of mine, but. I was under the impression that uh, the possibility we might not. I should not uh, uh, impress you with the fact that I've spoken to him about it because I have not. But uh, if that contingency arises, of course, I certainly will lean in that direction. Governor, there had been some talk that your wife might run for governor of Alabama. Uh, is there uh, still the feeling that she might? Can you tell us if there is a point of view in the family on that? Well, of course, uh, my wife has a very independent mind and does what she wants to do, and if she decided to run, she would run, but uh, I don't think that she's going to run, doesn't have that in her mind, but uh, that's a question you really have to ask her. Do you have any opinion on it? Would you like to see it happen? Would I like to see it happen? Well, of course, uh, let me say that if I decide to run for the Senate, if that occasion arises, I don't know uh, whether we'd be both running for the same thing or not. Uh, 
Uh, I'd like to, I would like to see her do whatever she wants to do. That's very admirable, Governor. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing George Wallace at future election nights. Thank you. Thank you. Let us bring you up to date on the electoral votes again. 224 for Governor Carter and 128 for President Ford. And electoral votes in each state are made up by adding the number of uh, representatives, the number of representatives in the House, plus the two senators. And that's how you get the electoral count in each state. Well, we'll have more of our continuous election coverage right after this. Let us recap for you now the national popular vote with 64% of the precincts in. It is Carter with almost 27 million and Ford with 25 million, 51% to 48%. Harry has a... It's in an election this close, there are going to be a lot of arguments uh, we will follow up. One of them has already started. Uh, Richard Rosenbaum was the New York State Republican chairman asked for a court order late tonight to impound all of the voting machines in New York City, saying that he'd received allegations of tampering with them in some districts. He's not saying that that's so. He's just saying that, well, they check it, particularly since uh, um, his man lost the state, according to our projection, that we have to have the machines under surveillance, Rosenbaum said. Also, in this uh, election, of course, along with the president, all 435 members of the House of Representatives are up for election, 14 governor races in the country, and 33 uh, senators, one-third of the senators uh, were running. And we have a report from Frank Reynolds to bring us up to date on what's happened in the Senate races. Well, we have two races now that we are ready to project, and uh, they are bad news for the Republicans. First of all, it's kind of historic simply because of the state itself, Nebraska. A Democrat is going to win the seat now held by Roman Ruska. Uh, Mayor Edward Zorinsky of Omaha is projected, according to ABC News, as the eventual winner of that race against Republican Representative John McAllister. Very interesting story involved here, Mayor Zorinsky was a uh, registered Republican until November of 1975. Then he found out that he was going, not going to be able to get the Republican nomination for the Senate, so he sim simply switched parties and became a Democrat. And the Democrats weren't wild about that. They had a bitter primary, but he won, and now he has apparently defeated the Republican odds-on favorite at the beginning of the campaign, Representative John McAllister. And uh, we have another instance of a Republican seat being taken by a Democrat, though no incumbent is involved. This is in the grand and glorious state of Hawaii. In Hawaii, Spark Matsunuga, the Democratic candidate, uh, now a member of the House, is projected as the winner over former Governor William Quinn by a comfortable margin. Now, also, we have only four states uh, left to be decided as far as the senatorial contests are concerned. They are Ohio, Arizona, California, and Utah. And I th do we have a projection on Utah, Dave? Yes. yes, we do now have a projection on Utah. And it is another instance of an incumbent being unseated. This one is kind of a surprise, too, because of the seniority. In Utah, Orrin Hatch, the Republican candidate, is going to, according to ABC News, defeat Senator Frank Boss, who was trying for his fourth term in the United States Senate. And Orrin Hatch, the Republican candidate who filed only at the very last moment, is a conservative's conservative, had substantial help from Ronald Reagan. Reagan, as a matter of fact, endorsed him in the primary, which was uh, rather unusual for him to do. And Orrin Hatch, according to ABC News, will be the next United States senator from Utah. That is a Republican gain taking away one Democratic seat. Now we have only three states left to decide and they are cliffhangers. Ohio is, of course, one of the most important ones. We have a substantial percentage of the vote in from Ohio, 71%. Howard Metzenbaum, the Democratic candidate, clinging to a rather narrow lead, 51% to 48%, for the incumbent Republican Senator Robert Taft. And in Arizona, with 30% of the precincts in, we're still unable to project a winner in the contest between Dennis DeConcini, the uh, Democratic candidate, and Republican Representative Sam Steiger. 
but De Concini is leading rather handily here at this point, 58 to 42 percent. And the next big one is California. And California, with only 7 percent in, S.I. Hayakawa, he of the Tamil Shanter fame, is leading incumbent Democratic Senator John Tunney, 53 to 44 percent. But that is such a big state, and we have such a small sample that it is impossible to make a projection on that one at this point. So we have only three to go. And now for a report on the races for the House of Representatives, here's Don Farmer. A couple of months ago, Congressman Guy Vanderjack of Michigan made a prediction that this year the Republicans would win 76 House seats in 76. That was a couple of months ago. About a week ago, he said, well, maybe we'll win about 15. Right now, the Republicans haven't won any. Of course, we've only, we've uh, seen the apparent winners in all but 25 seats in the 435 there are. Right now, the Democrats are holding a net gain of one seat. That's a surprise. Republicans were expected realistic to, to realistically to get perhaps 8, 10, or 12 seats. That's the way it stands now. There still are 25 seats to be filled. We're looking at the blacks in the House. There were 17 before this election. There are still 17 for the 95th Congress. All of the incumbent blacks have won, including Harold Ford of Tennessee, that state's first black congressman. He was the only one who really had a problem. That, of course, does include Barbara Jordan and Andrew Young, Jimmy Carter's most influential black colleague. Taking a look at women in the House of Representatives, there were 19. Three decided not to run or were defeated in primaries for higher office. Of the 16 who ran for re-election, all of them have won, and there will be, or at least are apparent winners, and there will be two new women in the Congress. Congresswoman Mikulski, it would appear, has been elected in Baltimore. Congresswoman Okar, it appears, will be the new congresswoman uh, from Cleveland. The Republican leader, John Rhodes of Arizona, has been re-elected. He'll be back. Uh, of course, the majority leader, Tip O'Neill, the man obviously who will be the next Speaker of the House, will be back. Alan Howe, the congressman from Utah, the freshman Democrat who was arrested and convicted of soliciting prostitutes, he was expected that he would lose. Alan Howe has lost. He lost to Dan Marriott, the Republican candidate in the Salt Lake City area. So Alan Howe will not be back. And if you take a look at, uh, if you take a look at some of the other members of Congress who have been afflicted with various personal problems involving uh, sex or money or some other thing. Uh, just quickly, I see that John Flint of Georgia has won re-election. Henry Helstosky of New Jersey has lost. Um, also having won, John Young of Texas, John Jenrett of South Carolina. A mixed bag, I think we could say, in terms of the, those uh, possibly affected by scandal or, or some bad headlines this year. Right now, it looks as though the House will be younger than ever, but the uh, party, uh, party ratio will not change so much, and the Democrats have a firm hold on their two-to-one majority. Harry? We have a projection now from the West Coast in the state of Washington with nine electoral votes. ABC News projects that President Ford will take that state by a close market margin, bringing his electoral vote total to 137. Coming up next, more of our continuous election coverage right after this. Jimmy Carter is leading in electoral votes 224 to Ford's 137. Sam Donaldson has been covering the Carter campaign since those early days in the primary. He's in Atlanta, Georgia now with two men who are very close to and very involved with Jimmy Carter. Sam? Barbara, I'm here with uh, Hamilton Jordan, uh, the uh, governor's campaign manager, and uh, with Jody Powell, his press secretary. Mr. Jordan, what's your assessment at this point in the evening of how the race is going? Sam, we're encouraged. Uh, there are a lot of states out uh, yet, but uh, among those states that are out, we have good prospects, and uh, in many of them, uh, we have uh, just learned, I think, that uh, New York is is uh, solidly in the, the Carter column. So uh, we're waiting and watching and uh, are, are optimistic. Mr. Powell, what's the governor's mood tonight? Well, he feels good, obviously. I think uh, the first reports this morning of the uh, very high turnout uh, started the day right. Uh, as you know, that's always a good sign for Democrats. But beyond that, in the face of the uh, gloomy predictions and uh, uh, editorials both in print and on the air about how the American people were turned off, they didn't care, they weren't going to vote, uh, there was no interest in this election and so forth. I think the American people have spoken very eloquently in response to those and have shown that they do care, that uh, they are interested, they, they were willing to come out to vote, and whether we win or whether President Ford has been reelected, that is uh, very encouraging to us and it was very encouraging to, to Governor Carter this morning, I know. Do you have doubts about the election? Are we in a point right now where it could go either way? Well, I, I suppose that mathematically it's possible for it to go either way, but uh, just from the figures that, that we've seen recently, it looks as if Mr. Mr. Ford has a, uh, 
a tough job to uh, uh, to get to 270 from where he is now. Uh, and on the other side of the coin, uh, our our prospects are very good for reaching 270. So uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't trade positions with President Ford right now, but it's mathematically possible. Mr. Powell, I know you've been asked this question by me and others many times, but uh, why do you think uh, the governor's uh, race developed into a very close one when uh, last summer it appeared that uh, he might be a runaway? Well, because American presidential races traditionally are, very, are relatively close. And uh, this was a, a tough race between uh, two pretty good candidates, and uh, it was bound to be close. Thank you very much, Jody Powell and Hamilton Jordan. Take a good look at those men, because if uh, Governor Carter wins, you'll be seeing a lot of them. Jody Powell probably would be press secretary, and Hamilton Jordan will have some position close to uh, President Carter, if he becomes President Carter. Coming up next, more of our continuous elections coverage right after this. The popular vote stands right now. Uh, Jimmy Carter has almost 28 million, and Ford has almost 20, no, has 26 uh, million. 51% for the Democrats, 48% for the Republicans. That's the national election night story at 22 minutes after the hour. Coverage in a moment. Good morning from New York. A good evening in parts of the country still. Uh, from me, Harry Reasoner, from Barbara Walters and Howard K. Smith. Two-thirds of the precincts in this country have now had their votes counted in this election. Jimmy Carter, the Democratic candidate, continues to hold a 51% lead to President Ford's 48% lead. Carter with about 28 million votes. Uh, President Ford with something over 26 million, with two-thirds of the votes in. And one new state ready for projection. Howard? Well, Harry, there are only two southern states, if you leave Texas out of the south and put it in the southwest, that have not um, produced results, but now one has. Virginia. ABC News projects that uh, President Ford has taken Virginia and its 12 electoral votes. This comes as no surprise because an early October Richmond Times-Dispatch poll, Ford led 7%. Virginia to Ford. In the uh, electoral vote total, as projected by ABC News, that now means that uh, Jimmy Carter has 224, 46 short of what he needs. Uh, President Ford now has 149. It's interesting to note that since uh, the last state was projected for Jimmy Carter, uh, Mr. Ford has won three. He's picking away at that lead. But at the moment, the odds would still seem to be with a man who has 224 votes as opposed to 149. Barbara? Well, let's you take a look at how that looks in the map so you can get a visual picture of it as we show the map of the dark blue are the states which have gone for Carter and the yellow are the states which have gone for Ford. And that's how it looks in the national picture. In addition to the various elections, presidential, gubernatorial, territorial, and the election for the House, there are a good number of national uh, of referendums on uh, the ballots of different states, and some of them have national significance. We said earlier that there will now be gambling in Atlantic City in New Jersey. That referendum seems to have passed. Casinos just in Atlantic City, but that could make a whole difference to the state's revenue and will certainly change the whole picture in Atlantic City. No slot machines, they say, yet, but casinos. In Massachusetts, there was a very important referendum in that it could have uh, meaning for the rest of the country, and that was a proposal to ban all handguns for civilians. Only military and uh, museums could have handguns, and that proposal was defeated. Also in Massachusetts, there was an equal rights amendment, a state equal rights amendment, and people were looking at that. Uh, last year, the state equal rights amendment was uh, defeated in New Jersey and New York. In Massachusetts, however, it appears to be headed for approval. So that's good news for the ERA, even though it's in a state level, it could have further implications. We've, uh, you got any more referendums? I was, no, I didn't have more referendums. I was going to catch up a little bit. I thought we'd catch up on our states. I still have some stubborn ones. Sure Shall I go through my state? Well, Maine, I've, I've been neglecting Maine, but it, it still has, it is a toss-up. It still has uh, not come through with a final story for us, even though 70% of the precincts are now in. As you can see, it's 49, 49% really uh, for each. So we're up in the air as far as Maine is concerned. California, of course, that is a big prize with 45 electoral votes, but the last report that we got from the key precincts that we're reporting in, it was um, still about 50-50 as, as you look at the board there. It's 53% for Ford and 46% for, for Carter. 
Uh, Mississippi in the south. Mississippi is now still the only uh, state that has not come through one way or the other. They seem to be having a battle over the southern Sun Carter and the traditional Republican sentiment, and it's still too close to call. And we don't have the news uh, as of yet to report from Hawaii. So those states still to come. Well, we still have our same two states in the Middle West, uh, Illinois and Ohio, who together, if they voted for Carter, could put, put Carter across. If they vote against him, they could put him far back. Illinois, the vote is 50% uh, to 49% favoring President Ford, but the actual raw numbers are just 3,000 apart. In um, Illinois, still only 61%, however, the Chicago city vote has been counted in Ohio. 75% uh, of the votes have been counted, and Carter, lead, Carter leads by a few thousand votes, 49%, a big 49%, to Ford's small 49%. Uh, the states that I've been watching that are still indecisive begin with Texas, which has now counted 79% of its votes, and uh, Jimmy Carter has held a steady lead there, 52 to 48% for some time, about a million and a half to towards a million three hundred thousand. Uh, Eugene McCarthy is pulling down one percent of the votes in Texas. Uh, we regard it as too close to make a, a call on. Iowa, with 94 percent of the precincts reported, uh, for a long time was absolutely steady at 49 percent for each candidate. President Ford has now opened up a lead, 50 to 49 percent, a lead of about, about 9,000 votes, and that's 94 percent in. That might begin to be some kind of an indication. Wisconsin, 64% of the precincts have been reported. Uh, Jimmy Carter has held a lead there since the beginning of the evening, 51 to 47% now. Uh, but that's still because of where the votes come from and the question of what the uh, farm country in Wisconsin is going to do is something that we cannot yet make a call on. We'll be watching those states as the evening goes on. It's a, it's a kind of a night that we all referred to uh, is happening in 1960 when John Kennedy and Richard Nixon fought it out all through the night. I remember being in the compound at Iannisport, and they finally let us go to bed at 3 o'clock in the morning. It was John Kennedy's long night and uh, one of your first long nights uh, in recording this kind of thing, wasn't it, Theodore White? Yes, I wish I could offer you some comfort tonight, uh, Harry. This is the classic pause in the squeaker, but I think it's different tonight, and I have the slightest sense of foreboding. 1960... That was between midnight and 3 o'clock in the morning when four states were still out. Michigan, Texas, Illinois, California. From 12 o'clock to 3 in the morning, that vote climbed from 241 to 261, and there was still 269 needed to nominate. It was 3 o'clock when Nixon threw in the towel. I wish I could uh, uh, say that was going to be the case tonight. 1968, we went through the same thing again, that same three-hour pause at this time of the early night or late night when Illinois, Texas, Ohio, and California were, uh, were all holding up Nixon's squeaker. And Nixon decided he had won at 3 o'clock in the morning and invited the staff in for drinks, and they celebrated their victory and just kept on waiting for Hubert to concede. But both times there have been two states that bother me immensely, Texas and Illinois, where the vote counting is uh, uh, sometimes fluid and flexible, especially, you'd say, commonly accepted epithem that uh, you can always steal half a percent or one percent of a vote in the tight election and that holds true mostly in Texas and Illinois. We've just been told that the White House has asked that they impound all the voting machines uh, here in New York State and that's a rather uh, disconcerting thing. What really is uh, beginning to bother me is though I think Carter's uh, popular vote lead will be unquestioned or it leans to Carter it may be that if Ford carries through in these states and he's showing much stronger as the evening wears on, we might get that uh, almost tragic situation where the popular vote goes one way and the electoral vote goes the other way, and I hope I'm wrong. Well, it has happened in this country. And, it, uh, it's, it's happened three times before in American history, but they were, one was 1824, that was a fuzzy election, that went to the House. In one way, Teddy, it might be a good thing in that I think it might stir people at last to, to reform that electoral college which hangs on us like an appendix that ought to be taken out. That's the Aaron Burr Amendment to the Constitution, the 12th Amendment, and I think it's a terrible amendment. I don't think you want to destroy the federal system, but the college as it's presently 
constitutionally constructed as a time bomb ticking away in our, in our political system. It should have been re revived long before, and whoever wins this squeaker, I hope he wins it on both sides, electoral and popular, because otherwise, after 10 years of tragedy and assassinations and Watergate and everything else, to have this country face that kind of constitutional question is more than I personally want to bear. Thank you, Teddy. We'll probably know uh, how we come out on that after the three-hour Memorial Theodore White pause that you speak of. <laughs> Coming up next, more of our continuous election coverage right after this. We've said that uh, Ohio cannot collectively make up its mind, but it has made up its mind about a senator. And Frank Reynolds has the story. Yes, and it's taken two elections uh, for Ohio to make up its mind uh, between these two men, Howard. But ABC News projection now indicates that Howard Metzenbaum, the Democratic candidate, will defeat Republican incumbent Senator Robert Taft. How about that? A man named Taft is going down to defeat in Ohio. This is a rerun of their 1970 race when uh, Taft defeated uh, uh, Metzenbaum. Metzenbaum since bounced back into the Senate and uh, then was subsequently defeated by John Glenn in a primary. And now, according to our projection, ABC News will have Metzenbaum defeating uh, Senator Taft. In Arizona, we also have a projection that we're ready to make. Uh, Dennis DeConcini, the uh, Democratic candidate, will defeat Sam Steiger, the Republican candidate who is also a representative in the, in the House of Representatives. This is a seat that is now held by Paul Fannin, a Republican who is retiring, so that's a Democratic gain. And in Ohio, a seat is being taken by a Democrat that now belongs to a Republican. We want to go now to Ohio and to uh, correspondent Lem Tucker, who is standing by in the Taft headquarters in Cincinnati. Hello, Lem. Hi, Frank. Most of the people who were here at Robert Taft's headquarters left before the ABC projection. About 15, maybe 20 minutes ago, the senator's press aide came down, said that as far as the Taft people were concerned, um, it was still too close to call and that the senator was going home and go to bed, get a good night's rest, and that tomorrow morning at 11 o'clock they would hold a press conference at which time he'd uh, talk about the election. Uh, a very curious comment, he said uh, the exact time of that press conference will be announced. The 11 a.m. press conference is somewhat indefinite, for, uh, it appears. In any case, there was never a mood of real uh, excitement here tonight from 7 o'clock on, 7.30 when the polls started closing. There were very few people, most of the time fewer than 100, and there was a solemn mood. Uh, perhaps they saw this coming or felt it in their bones. In any case, Robert Taft II, son of the senator, did win tonight here in Ohio. He will go to the Ohio State Senate carrying on the fifth generation of this staunchly Republican family. This is Lem Tucker, ABC News, at Taft headquarters. And the national picture shows ABC projecting 224 electoral votes for Jimmy Carter, 149 for Gerald Ford, but it is far from over. Coming up next, more of our continuous election coverage right after this. As we know, that a close election always means that there will be challenges, particularly in important states like New York, where uh, uh, the lead that Jimmy Carter has is very small, and already the voting machines in New York City are being impounded after a request by the state Republican chairman. The White House is taking an interest in this and in New York City, and in New York State in, in general. And we've got a report now from Tom Jarrell. Tom? Hello, we learn now that President Ford personally authorized uh, his people in New York State to take steps to secure the safety of those ballots, as they put it here, because the president believes there could be some irregularities in the handling of the ballots in New York State. Uh, this is the background, as uh, given just moments ago by White House News Secretary Ron Nussen to reporters here. He said this afternoon a New York City attorney who has been active in Republican politics named Fred Perota of the law firm of Rogers and Wells, a telephoned a, uh, attorney here at the White House, Jim Cannon, and he told Cannon that uh, if it was a close election in New York State, that uh, the White House should be prepared to take some steps to secure the ballots in New York State. Well, then uh, later on tonight, after the returns were coming in, and it became very evident that it would be a close race in New York State, Perotta called back 
and he said that he now believed that there was reason to uh, take some steps to secure the ballots in New York State to make sure that they were properly counted. Uh, at this point, uh, the White House aide, Jim Cannon, told the president, and Mr. Ford thought it over, and he authorized his men then to go back and uh, take some steps with the courts for the security of the ballot. Uh, the White House uh, attorneys uh, contacted the State Board of Elections Unit in New York State and also Governor Hugh Carey's office and told them formally that the White House wanted to take steps to, us, uh, to assure the security of the ballot. Uh, the White House also contacted Dick Rosenbaum, the state Republican Party chairman in New York State, and uh, authorized Mr. Rosenbaum to seek a court order and also to seek uh, steps from Governor Kerry for the security of the ballots. Uh, we don't know uh, here at the White House yet if a court order has been issued or what steps Governor Kerry may take. Uh, obviously, this uh, does throw a cloud over the uh, entire outcome of the New York uh, uh, returns until they can be thoroughly uh, checked and uh, perhaps recounted if the White House succeeds uh, in this effort to secure the uh, ballots, as they put it, uh, which, of course, is another way of saying impound them. Harry? Well, Tom, I don't think there'll be much trouble about impounding the voting machines. Uh, the state attorney general has already moved men in in New York City to watch them and the assumption that the court order will be granted. That is not unusual, particularly in an election where right now, with 84% of New York's precincts reporting, uh, Jimmy Carter's lead over President Ford is very slight. They both have 50% of the vote. Carter, 2,700,000. Uh, Ford, 2,681,000. It's within about... Uh, I make it right about 40,000 out of a total of five or six million votes. But Harry, if this goes into several recounts, the way the Harkey Rowderbush contest in Indiana for the Senate did some years ago, six years ago, it could take a year before we know who is president of the United States. It conceivably could. I would assume that, the, that that involves some paper ballots and actual counting. In New York, it's a matter of merely checking did they add up the voting machines right. It's a mostly machine. Uh, and it's not the first time that. Uh, they have decided that it would be nice to know where the voting machines are the next morning, just in case, which is all they're doing so far. You two have gone through this, of course, more often than I have. That doesn't mean that we would sit here for a year, does it? Uh, we would sit here for a year, Robert, if it's <laughs> necessary. Ann Compton, I uh, think there's been more ticket splitting this year than there's been in any election that I know of. In New Jersey, Senator Harrison Williams won easily, but the state was carried by the Republicans. He's a Democrat. In Illinois, Republican James Thompson won the governorship handily, but the presidential race is nip and tuck. And you can go right down the line, Delaware, Washington State, Rhode Island, Montana, the split right along the, every one of the states. Howard, what I found interesting going through some of these returns is that only two states, I have found only two incidences, Vermont and Rhode Island, where the president, uh, the, the candidate for president who has carried the state has had virtually the same raw vote and percentage vote as the uh, gubernatorial candidate. In all the rest of them, it is the gubernatorial candidate who has not only led the ticket, but uh, outpolled both uh, percentage points and raw points above whatever uh, presidential candidate there is. Of course, there is one hang-up now. We still have a cliffhanger in Missouri, the one state that uh, is breaking the rules tonight with 80% of the precincts reporting. We still have the expected winner, Christopher Bond, two, uh, four percentage behind uh, Joseph Teasdale. That is, that is still a cliffhanger. Same thing could happen in California. Coming up next, more of our continuous election coverage just after this. It's interesting. We were talking about the possibility of recounts tying up who, the question of who is president of the United States for a year. That could have happened in 1960. And I think it's one of the things where both the enemies and friends of Richard Nixon agree. It was a grand gesture on his part. He chose not to ask for a recount. Thank you, he right. chose not to tie things up, and that uh, might have saved a lot of trouble. And that's the National Election Night story at 22 minutes after the hour. This is uh, Howard K. Smith with Harry Reasoner and Barbara Walters in ABC News election headquarters. The national popular count is now almost three quarters over with 71% of the precincts reporting. Carter has 51% of the vote, the Fords 48%. And one uh, individual result that adds to Ford's total is ABC News projects that President Ford has carried Nevada uh, and he has carried it by a very close vote. Uh, Harry? 
And another uh, result that adds uh, even further to President Ford's electoral total, in the state of Iowa, which has been very close all evening, President Ford has opened up a lead now of about uh, 11,000 votes with 97% of the precinct reporting. He's 50% to Jimmy Carter's 49%, and ABC News projects that that lead will hold up, that Mr. Ford will take Iowa, and it's nine electoral votes by a close margin. The electoral vote, which is, of course, the vote that elects the president, is now Ford 160, Carter 224. Ford still has a long way to go. California could help out an awful lot, but they still wouldn't put him across. Um, we Barbara? can take a look at uh, Howard if, if we uh, want to now. We can take a look at how the map looks. You can see where the support has gone for each candidate by taking a look at our map, which uh, should come up on the board and will outline the state. Do we have it? There we go. The dark blue is for Carter, and the yellow is Ford. And you see down in the south, that's Mississippi, which is still not come in, which is still holding out. Way up in the north, that's Maine, which is still a toss-up. We still don't know how that's going. Texas, still too close to call. California, of course, that's the big one that Harry just mentioned, and that is at this point uh, too close. With 13% of the precincts from California reporting, it is forward by 51% to Carter's 48%. It's becoming somewhat of a tighter race. Uh, Carter had started out very strong in California, and his lead had just uh, fallen and fallen, so that Ford was predicted to have a, a lead in that state. But as we said, it's too soon to really know what's going on there. By the way, a very important proposition in, in California, a referendum, Proposition 14, which would uh, guarantee secret ballot elections and other proposals that would boost farm workers' organizations, that seems to be going down in defeat. It was something that uh, uh, Governor Brown had supported, and it, it seems to, uh, as we said, be going down. We have uh, a report uh, from Hawaii, at least a beginning report, Hawaii, which has traditionally been a democratic state. It's 50-50 uh, at this point, where you see 100% of the precincts. That doesn't mean, that in this case, that 100% of the precincts have reported. That means that, uh, that in Hawaii, 100, there is a partial vote from 100% of the precincts. It's not all of the vote of all of those precincts, but it's still 50-50 there. Well, we've still got a couple of, uh, of squeakers in my area. The state of Texas, uh, with 26 electoral votes, which would be very big for either man who gets it. 82% uh, of the precincts are now reported there. Uh, Governor Carter has been holding a pretty steady 52 to 48% of the vote, with 1% for uh, Eugene McCarthy. Both uh, of America's major wire service, Associated Press and United Press International, have uh, given the state of Texas to Governor Carter. ABC News has yet feels there are some elements there that might uh, mess things up, and we have not called that state. Similarly, in the state of Wisconsin, 78% or 70% of the precincts in Wisconsin have reported. Uh, Jimmy Carter has 50% of the vote to Gerald Ford's 47%, much closer, and with a, presumably a good deal of the farm and, uh, and western part of the state still to come in. And those two vital Midwestern states refused to come down off the fence, Ohio and Illinois and Ohio, with 85% of the precincts having reported in, Ford and Carter both have 49%, with barely 1,000 votes between them. And in Illinois, the same situation. Carter, 49%, Ford, 49%, and there is less than 1,000 votes between them. Well, a while ago, we talked to you about Lou Harris's ABC National Model, which shows you how this vote might come out and what the effect of the vote so far has been. And it proves that issues have had a, a role in this vote so far. For example, Jimmy Carter's campaign strategy, stressing the issues of unemployment and jobs worked well for him, helping to build his slim lead in unemployment-impacted precincts. Voters went strongly for Carter, 61% to 39%, getting on the two to one. Tax reform was another issue that worked strongly to Carter's favor. Among those who considered tax reform a major issue, Carter was able to poll 61% of the vote to the president's 38, again getting on towards two to one. Inflation, however, was not an issue which worked to Carter's advantage. People concerned with this issue voted for Mr. Ford, 59% to 40%. Harry? We now have a projection in the important state of Texas, which has been a squeaker all evening, 26 electoral votes, 
ABC News now projects that Texas will end up in Jimmy Carter's column uh, with 52% to 48% of the votes now, and uh, ABC News believes that he will continue to lead. And ABC has a projection vote in the state of Mississippi. Mississippi, uh, we project, has gone to Jimmy Carter. It's a very close race. Seven electoral votes. Ford was hoping to get this. This was one of the southern states that he did hope to get. But Mississippi has gone to Carter. Well, in the Senate, there are a lot of familiar faces that won't be around next year. And Frank Reynolds is keeping a record of them. Frank? Well, you know, Howard, it's not been a very good night for incumbents, but I must say that uh, the failures have been evenly split. Uh, four Democratic incumbents will not be coming back to the United States Senate, and four Republicans will go back to Washington only to pack their bags and get ready to head for home. Of the uh, Democrats who are uh, being retired by the voters tonight, first there is Vance Hartke of Indiana, who has served in the Senate uh, since 1958. He's had three terms. He tried for a fourth and didn't make it. And Joseph Montoya of, uh, Era of New Mexico, who has served two terms. He is being displaced by the astronaut Harrison Jack Schmidt. Perhaps most surprising of all, Gail McGee of Wyoming, who has served three terms in the Senate. He was defeated tonight and will not be coming back. He's an important committee chairman. And as a matter of fact, he ranked 17th in seniority in the Senate. But his longevity didn't help him with the voters of Wyoming today. And Frank Moss of Utah has also served three terms, a total of 18 years in the United States Senate, but he will not be coming back. Among the Republicans, one interesting thing about them, three of them, their names begin with B, and none of the Republicans who has been uh, defeated tonight uh, served longer than one term. We'll begin with J. Glenn Bell of Maryland, defeated by Paul Sarbanes. He was elected in 1970, and then uh, Senator... William Brock of Tennessee, he was defeated tonight. He, too, came into office in 1970. And uh, Jim Buckley, of course, of New York, who was defeated by Daniel Patrick Moynihan tonight. He came in the, the uh, victor in a three-way race in 1970, but in 1976, in a straight two-man race, he lost. And the most famous name of all, I guess, uh, Senator Robert Taft of Ohio, defeated tonight by Howard Metzenbaum. He will not be coming back. You know, when you add that up, that's eight incumbents defeated, and it is, since we have uh, eight retiring senators who did not stand for re-election, that means we're going to have at least 16 new faces in the United States Senate, and we have only one race still to go, California. Either we'll have uh, the familiar teeth of John Tunney or the tam o' and mustache of S.I. Hayakawa. Howard? Frank? Almost all of those could have been expected, except the one with, involving Gail McGee. That came as a complete surprise to me. He's very popular. Let's take a look at the electoral vote, the one that decides who will be president. Right now, Ford has 160 electoral votes, and Carter has 257, getting awfully close to that 270 which will decide. Coming up next, more of our continuous election coverage right after this. You. You. Us. Well, uh, the electoral vote, as we said, is Ford 160, Carter 257. That is just 13 short for Carter of the number needed to, uh, to go over the top and be elected. And Ohio is obviously one state that could give it to him. So we're watching Ohio very closely. Well, another combination of things that could give it to uh, Jimmy Carter... Uh, Wisconsin, for instance, which, uh, where he holds a lead, 50% to 47%, and where a factor may be the votes of Eugene McCarthy, who's getting about 2%. Wisconsin wouldn't put him over, but if he got Wisconsin, all he would need would be one other fairly small state to do it. Uh, whereas now, uh, Mr. Ford cannot afford any more losses in electoral votes. And, of course, we still have California, but uh, California at this point, Ford with 51 percent, Carter with 48 percent. It had been said earlier that if uh, more than 55 percent of the vote came in, that Carter well, would probably win, and if less than 50, that it would go for Ford. At least that was one of the, uh, one of the uh, discussions that pollsters were taking. The, uh, it seems now that the voter percentage has been about 56 percent, and that's equal to the number four years ago. So it hasn't been a great voter turnout, but it hasn't been, it hasn't been very bad. The predictions they were making at some point during the summer that it would be the lowest voter turnout since Calvin Coolidge was elected in 1924 is certainly not held up. No, uh, 
Ford has got to win almost all the remaining states to make it. Almost. 160 to 257, according to uh, ABC's projection. Wisconsin, which is, well, I don't know whether it's leaning toward uh, Carter or not. It's giving him a 3% lead with 72% of the precincts in. Would give him 11 votes, which would uh, bring him to 258. And then it could be either Hawaii or Oregon or a small state could bring him. Uh, Bill Wordham is now at uh, Carter, at the ballroom where Carter is in Atlanta. Let's go to Bill Wordham. Bill, can you hear us? Well, I don't know whether you can hear me here in the World Congress Center in Atlanta. There's a huge crowd, 25,000 strong, we are told, waiting here impatiently for Jimmy Carter to come in here and make what they confidently expect will be his acceptance speech. The crowd is somewhat subdued now, although you can hear music playing in the background by a rock group and a country western group that have rocked the foundations of this great hall. But the, as I said, the crowd is somewhat subdued because they've been here at least six hours. It has been a long night. It is being a long night. And uh, you, as you look around the hall, you can see people sitting on chairs or sitting on the floor with looks of weariness on their faces. But this weariness dissipates rapidly when any, anybody comes in here to make an announcement. Congressman Andrew Ford of Georgia, one of Jimmy Carter's most stalwart and earlier supporters, was in here just a few minutes ago. He just came in to talk to the crowd and remind them that Jimmy Carter was, uh, in his words, a great guy. And of course, they all applauded. They applauded anything he said about Jimmy Carter tonight. Ever since they've been here, since 8 o'clock, they have been absolutely convinced that Jimmy Carter is going to win, and they're even selling buttons in this hall here tonight that say, President Jimmy Carter. Along the uh, side of the hall, there is a VIP walkway, and there are two or 3,000 people here close to the walkway who are going to get to see the governor walk in personally. These people are those early supporters and constant supporters of the governor. Elsewhere in the hall, among this large 25,000-strong crowd, there are people from all over the South and from states in the Northeast also, but mostly Southerners, here to welcome the victory of their native son. I can't see the TV screen in the back of the hall, but they put up an announcement just now which brought on that response. And this is the kind of thing that's been happening all night long here. A quiet period followed by cheers and shouts as their man gets ever nearer to victory. Now back to New York. Well, Bill, even if he should not make it by some uh, combination of votes, I think it would be historic nonetheless that after over a hundred years, a Southerner got that close on his own without being somebody's vice president. Remarkably historic. And of course, in Atlanta, they should feel particularly good because not only is Jimmy Carter from Georgia, but this is where he kept the seat of his... Um, a uh, whole organization. They didn't move to uh, another place. They stayed in Atlanta, and everything was run from from Atlanta. So they've been really very involved all the way through. That worries me a little bit, Barbara, because I think Georgia is a great state, but it's a middle-sized state, and it's a very narrow base from which to run a national campaign. I just pray that the administration won't be run from that narrow base if, well, if he wins. There have been those who have already talked about it being a palace god, similar to Richard Nixon's palace god. After all, most of the men involved with, uh, with Jimmy Carter are quite young, uh, 31 years old, 33 years old, the oldest. Well, there are only two who are, uh, who are considered, uh, shall we say, middle-aged or not. 43-year-old Gerald Rafchoon, he's one of the old men of the group, uh, and he's in charge of the media, he's in charge of the advertising. And uh, Charles Kerber, who's 59, I consider that very young, but 59, he is by far the oldest uh, involved with Jimmy Carter. And just how much they will um, uh, keep to themselves and, and how much they will control the major jobs, of course, no one knows. You know, I had a chat with Jimmy Carter. I asked for it without cameras, just a quiet private chat. And I said, why don't you get Clark Clifford to help you if you plan to make a transition? He's the world's best expert. He wrote the memorandum, which Truman followed and won the 1948 election with. Carter said nobody from another administration. So they have a man named Jack Watson who's doing it, and I think I don't have all of the ages in my head, but I think he's something like 33, and he's been in charge of the transitional uh, stages, and it's a name no one knows. And uh, 
however caught to trust him, and that's what's important. Well, on the other hand, every president brings his own people. Uh, every president-elect brings his own people on the assumption that Jimmy Carter may be a president-elect, 13 electoral votes from now. Uh, and uh, they don't all then go to Washington with him. And Jimmy Carter is being uh, very precise in saying he doesn't know what's going to happen to Hamilton Jordan and Jody Powell and all those young people. They may or may not be in positions of power. Well, let's come back to this. But coming up next, more of our continuous election coverage right after. Good morning in these early hours of the morning. If you went to bed early and you just woke up now and you want to know what's going on, there is still no decision yet in the presidential race. We'll give you the electoral vote first with 270 votes needed to declare a winner. Carter has 257, Ford has 160. That means that Carter just needs 13 more electoral votes and he will become the next president. The popular vote looks like this. Uh, Carter has 51% of that vote, and Ford has 48% of that vote. Carter leading that as well. If you translate those figures, the popular vote and the electoral vote, to a map of the United States, and color one guy one color and another one the other, this is the way it looks. The darker color, the blue, is Jimmy Carter. The yellow, the lighter color, is uh, Gerald Ford. The reddish areas are yet undecided. It's. Uh, it's not quite two countries divided by the Mississippi River, but certainly Jimmy Carter has gotten the preponderance of his strength in the East and in the South. The most recent acquisition was Texas. Harry, I don't think we've given enough attention to one factor in this campaign, and that is named Eugene McCarthy. In almost every one of these very tight states, <clears throat> McCarthy is making the difference. For example, in Maine, Ford has a one-point lead over, over Carter, but McCarthy is pulling 2% of the vote away from uh, uh, Carter. If McCarthy were not there, Carter, Carter would presumably have a 1 percentage point lead over Ford. In Oregon, Ford has a 3 point lead over Carter, but McCarthy is pulling 4% of the vote, enough to put Carter in the lead. In hotly contested Illinois, Carter has a precarious 1 point lead over Ford. McCarthy is getting 1 percentage point, just enough to make it even. McCarthy is pulling 1% in the Ohio race in what otherwise would be a dead heat between Ford and McCarthy and, and Carter. And in Wisconsin, a race too close to call also, McCarthy is drawing 2% of the votes. So McCarthy is playing quite a role in this election tonight. If you look at it nationally, however, I think he has 1% uh, of the vote on the national level. Lester Maddox had none. Lester Maddox said earlier this evening that he thinks the outcome might have been different if, and I quote here, George Wallace hadn't joined the enemy, the enemy in uh, Maddox's terms being Jimmy Carter. In Wisconsin, where uh, Eugene McCarthy is a factor, 76% of the precincts are in, but uh, Wisconsin's 11 electoral votes are still not uh, uh, assignable to either Carter or Ford, although Carter maintains a regular three per rep steady 3% lead over President Ford in spite of the Eugene McCarthy vote. If Wisconsin came in, that would give uh, Carter 268 votes, he'd be too short. And at that point, he, one of a number of states could put him over. Oregon, Hawaii, Maine, any one of them. Mm -hmm. Barbara? And, uh, there is still California sitting out there with its 45 electoral votes. We're going to go now to the Ford headquarters where Charles Gibson has a report for us. <coughs> And this is the ballroom of the Sheraton Park Hotel in Washington, which was intended to be the site for what the Ford people still hope will be the victory party for the Ford Dole ticket. There has been about four to 6,000 people in this room through the night. Their enthusiasm has stayed relatively high. A lot of them have left, but that was primarily because they ran out of food more than anything else. They have kept the enthusiasm up with some music. Lionel Hampton and Al Hurd have been playing uh, throughout the evening, a little dancing, but for the most part, the crowd has been keeping track of results on a giant television screen, and I am now up on that screen, if you can hear people yelling in the background. It has been a unique way of keeping enthusiasm up because the, it's just one screen. It's about 15 feet high. You can barely see it behind me. And the Ford people make sure that there are good results up on that. There is someone flipping channels, and they make sure they find the good reports for the president and they have a typewriter which types information into that screen and they have made sure that the crowd has heard a lot about the states that the president has been carrying and not much about the states where he hasn't been doing very well. 
They are waiting, of course, for the president to come. The Ford people said the president would be down about 11 o'clock. That hour has slipped back and back and back, and now they say the president will come when he has something definitive to say. And once the president has told this crowd they can go home, then probably at that time they will. Charles Gibson, ABC News, in the Sheraton Park Hotel in Washington. Thank you, Charles. We thought you might want to know from time to time how we go about making the projections that we do. At the heart of our projection system is the League of Women Voters. The League has volunteers in our 3,000 key election precincts across the country. And as the polls close in the state, a woman in each precinct telephones the early vote count to other volunteers you see for our, here at our computer center in Connecticut. And using that early raw vote and information already in the computer, our specialists project who has won. But the whole thing depends on the conscientious women in our key precincts, and their record through several elections with us has been all but perfect, and we are very grateful to them. We want to give you the national popular vote at this point. Carter has 51% of that vote, 31%. 1,478,000, and Ford 48% of that vote with 29,583,000 and so on. We want to, at this point, just tell you what the popular vote is in California. California still, uh, we're not ready to call California, but the, the popular vote in uh, California is 100 and, uh, I'm sorry, I'm finding it difficult to read that vote. They are there. There you can see it clearly yourself. The Democrats 50%, Carter 50%, the Republicans 49%, Carter 803,000 some, almost 804, and Ford 794. Now there are breakdowns of the votes that we've had tonight uh, so that we can tell perhaps how things have gone. It was said that if there was a large black turnout, it would help Jimmy Carter. And to give us a picture of what the national lookout is on the ethnic vote, we'll turn things over now to Lou Harris and he'll tell us the results. Uh, Barbara, what we've got here is a curious pattern. Uh, Jimmy Carter tried, after the Democratic Convention, to put together the old New Deal coalition. He's only partially succeeded tonight. He's done very well in the big cities. He's done extremely well with the union vote, where he has a 19-point lead. But it's among the ethnics where you begin to get some splits here. Uh, what you've got are the blacks and the Spanish-speaking coming in very heavily for Carter, but you've got the white Catholics, mainly in the north, in the east and the midwest, where Jimmy Carter's been hurt tonight. There's no doubt of that. The reason it's close in states like Ohio and Illinois right at this moment is because the Catholic vote did not come in for Carter, such as old-time majorities would dictate. He's also been off and what made New York very close tonight is that the Jewish vote, for example, was 54 to 44 percent for Carter, way off what should have been at least a two to one margin. So you do have a kind of breakup of that old New Deal coalition and made up again by Jimmy Carter being very strong among uh, white Protestants. I hate to put it on such a bald basis, but you see this break in the vote. And when it's there, I think we have an obligation to report it. It's a curious kind of division. I'd say probably this uh, New Deal coalition likely won't last through another election. Barbara? I just wonder, Lou, how close does this come to what you have predicted? Do you feel very confident about your predictions? Is this well, the way Barbara, it's broken down? Barbara, let me say, we reported our final poll, I'm proud to say, uh, did show uh, Ford ahead by one point among the Catholics. And by gosh, it's come out that way. We showed the Jewish vote softening up in the last 10 days. That's the religious issue. There is a religious issue, but there's a reverse religious issue that it's helped Carter. Lou, I uh, uh, have only one argument with you. I remember, um, I remember being in the old Stockyards Amphitheater in Chicago in 1960, uh, when with, working with Walter Cronkite, and he said, well, this is the last time we'll be in this old building. And uh, so they built McCormick Place, and it burned down. And sure enough, they were back in the, the Stockyards Theater in 1968. And it seems to me, I have heard people, not you, but I have heard people say for a number of presidential elections, well, that's the end of the old New Deal coalition. Yeah. We'll, well see. Harry, Harry, it still has some life, and if Jimmy Carter wins this, he'll owe his life to major portions of that. Make no mistake about it, the black vote came in for him, the Spanish-speaking and the Union people 
Uh, let me say their turnout, turnout was about the same this time, maybe one point better nationwide. Our figures show the union did, unions did get out their vote. Well, isn't it possible that eight years, say, if you had eight years of a president heading the New Deal coalition and a Congress giving them some of the things they wanted, it might be stronger than it is now? Well, you might, but I'm not sure that uh, the Catholics, the Jews, who are getting pretty affluent these days, are going to really uh, go back to that old pork chop type politics. I think, uh, in a way, we see the impact of affluence, which does tend to knock out some of these old-fashioned ties that people seem to have. <laughs> Did the union get up? And the Excuse union. me, we're going now to the Carter headquarters where Mrs. Coretta King is about to speak. I just got that message on this earpiece. Country. There are thousands of people, perhaps millions of people gathered in halls across this country tonight like we are here in Atlanta. But there's no doubt that the spotlight is on Atlanta, Georgia. I think it's remarkable that this campaign has involved so many people across this country who have given so much of themselves. And I certainly want to commend you because many of you have worked long, hard hours giving of your time and your talent and of your means because you know that there must be a change in this country if this country is to survive. You know, what has already happened has been historical. And I would say that starting from 22 months ago when Jimmy Carter began his long trek toward the White House, what he has accomplished in bringing people together throughout this country has been truly remarkable. Don't let anybody tell you that it has not. When I look at the composition of this audience and when I have watched the composition of the campaign and its workers, the staff, as I have traveled across this country, during the last two months. I don't think we've had a campaign like this in the history of this nation. That represents real progress. Mrs. Martin Luther King, Jr., that is Coretta King speaking from Atlanta. She has, of course, been a supporter of Jimmy Carter, as you've heard. And she has been involved primarily in her own life in uh, working towards a center in Atlanta for a great variety of social activities and other activities in memory of her husband and uh, in his name. We will come back with more of our continuous election coverage right after this. We're back at our election night headquarters just to bring you some uh, news on how California is going. Overall, it's a standoff at this hour. The election is still too close to call, but Jimmy Carter is leading in the farm, rural, and metropolitan areas, and Gerald Ford has a substantial lead, almost 60% of the votes cast in the suburbs and the small towns. Still too close to call. We are going to have in this country two women governors. We already have one, the governor of the state of Connecticut, Ella Grasso, and we now have another one in the state of Washington. Washington has elected a woman governor. ABC News projected Dixie Lee Ray, a winner in that race, over John Spellman, her Republican opponent. And this is what she had to say to her supporters. And as we move back along the road to getting our government working for its people, all I can say is that success 
If indeed that's what it is tonight, and I'm very confident, success is due to the support, to the hard work, to the belief, to the confidence of the people that are in this room. It's you and many people like you throughout the state that saw to it that the experts were wrong. The citizens did go to the polls and voted, and you confounded all of them, and I think that's great. That's great. And it's the people that are electing your representatives. You, the people, are electing your representatives. They're not being elected by the publishers and the editors of the daily newspapers. Dixie Lee Ray, who's the next governor of Washington, a woman who keeps five dogs. Yes, and in Washington, she didn't live in a house. She lived in a trailer with her five dogs the whole time she was the head of the Atomic Energy Commission. Once we got honorary doctorates at Ripon College and there was a demonstration against her, so I manly stood between her and the demonstrators, but she took my place and she did a much better job than I did. <laughs> uh, just to bring you up to date a little bit on how the races are going, we said we will now have two women governors. This is the Dixie Lee Ray is the first woman elected in this election. In Congress, we're going to have at least two new uh, members. They're both Democrats. One is from Baltimore. Her name is Barbara Mikulski. She is described as flamboyant, and some say she will replace in personality Bella Abzug. And the other, Mary Rose Okar, and she is from um, Cleveland City. She was, a, she was a former councilwoman in Cleveland City. So uh, the account had been 19 women in uh, the House of Representatives. I don't know. At, right now, it's at least 18. So it looks as if uh, there will be very little change, or there may be a couple more. Okay, we'll bring you more of our continuous election coverage right after this. We heard just a few moments ago from Ford headquarters in Washington. Now we want to go uh, to the Democratic headquarters in Washington. Bill Matinee is there to bring us a report. Bill? Barbara, I'm here. Uh, we've got a party going on here. In fact, this party has been going on for 7 hours and 15 minutes. Rather than a party, I might describe it as organized bedlam. Two rock bands have been blasting away during the entire time, and the libation has been flowing quite freely during that entire period. This is the Democratic National Committee headquarters party. It's called a victory party, and everybody here uh, is celebrating a victory despite the closeness of the race. Not once during this evening uh, have the spirits of this uh, crowd of, uh, oh, a thousand or so people uh, been flagged uh, by the closeness of the race. This band uh, earlier played um, an old Bill Haley rock tune from the 1960s called Rock Around the Clock. Well, they've rocked away the night, and many of them tell me they will rock, rock, rock till the broad daylight of at least until Jimmy Carter's hand has been raised in victory. So from the Democratic National Headquarters Victory Party here in downtown Washington, Barbara, back to you. Bill, you're just gonna learn how to rock. Jack, can't you stand there? You gotta, well, we'll stand up and show you how to do it later. We wanna give you the national, I wish I knew how to do it, the national electoral vote. Carter has 257 at this point and Ford has 160. That's how the electoral vote looks at this time. I still uh, have some states. We've divided up our states among the three of us, and we'll come back and uh, go through all our various states, tell you where they are now. That's the national election night story at uh, 52 minutes after the hour. ABC News presents Political Spirit of 76. The final chapter of this bicentennial political year. Tonight from ABC News Election Center in New York, the results. Election night. Good morning. 2.30 in the morning in New York. The results are indicative but not yet conclusive. 78% uh, of the precincts in this country have now reported. And Jimmy Carter, the Democratic candidate, holds a 51% to 48% lead over Gerald Ford. That 51% to 48% has been constant throughout the evening in popular vote. 
But the electoral vote is not yet uh, decided. At the moment, according to ABC's projection, uh, Jimmy Carter has 257 electoral votes, Gerald Ford 160. Carter is within 13 votes of the 270 that would make him president-elect. He is in the situation where uh, almost any combination of the remaining seven states that have not been projected would give it to him. And Gerald Ford's in the situation where he almost has to win five or six of them, uh, even if they're all the big ones, in order to win. But at the moment, nobody has won. Well, as of right now, to put that in another way, uh, Ford's uh, viewpoint, we have not projected seven states that have a total of 121 electoral votes. For President Ford to win, he has to take 110 of the 121 votes remaining, electoral votes. Carter needs only 13, as you said. Well, let me bring you up to date on, on a couple of them. Of course, the big prize is California, which is one-sixth of the electoral vote, 45 electoral uh, votes there, the largest population of any state. California at this point has an edge towards Carter, 51% for Carter and 49% for Ford. Now the uh, highly respected Fields poll, which is usually the definitive poll for California, had been saying that Ford was going to take the state, I believe it was, by six points. At this point, that doesn't seem to be holding up, but it's still too soon to tell. The votes coming in show us that uh, Jimmy Carter is leading in the farm and rural areas, and that's usually the last vote to come in. Gerald Ford has a substantial lead, almost 60% of the votes cast in the suburbs and the small towns, but we still don't know what the story is in Hawaii, in uh, California, rather. In Hawaii, which is uh, traditionally a democratic state, we have Carter leading with 51% of the vote to Ford's 49%. Hawaii has four electoral votes, and if, for example, Hawaii went to Carter, and let's say Wisconsin with its 11 votes, uh, electoral votes went to Carter, well, that's the race. 272 votes, but Wisconsin is still very close. Wisconsin, in Wisconsin, 81% of the precincts have reported. Carter is holding a 50% lead over Gerald Ford's 48%, but there are also votes for uh, uh, Eugene McCarthy in Wisconsin, which have... Uh, uh, probably mostly come from people who would otherwise vote for Jimmy Carter. And ABC News regards Wisconsin as too close to call. We want to hear about the House races now from Don Farmer. Don? <clears throat> well, Howard, uh, the Democrats have been in control of the House since 1954, and they are still in control of the House tonight. Their majority would appear to be uh, uh, well safe at, uh, by, at almost two to one. But some things have happened in the House. I think it, uh, it shows what's happening to the leadership there, for example. The majority leader, Thomas Tip O'Neill from Massachusetts, uh, has been reelected, of course. He will be the new Speaker of the House, we are told, as the leader of the majority party. O'Neill is an irascible uh, Boston old-style politician. He's a tough guy. He'll be tough on Mr. Ford if he's elected. He might even be tough on Governor Carter if he is elected. The Republican leader will be back, John Rhodes of Arizona. He's the majority minority leader, and he's been uh, re-elected without too much trouble. He'll be back again. It's interesting to point out, I think, that uh, none of the House leaders have been in their leadership positions now for more than four years. In fact, 15 of the 20 House committee chairmen have served at the helm of their committees for less than six years. The House is, in fact, getting younger. Some more examples of that, of course, the freshmen of those 49 freshman Watergate Democrats. 43 have been re-elected so far. Only one of them is lost. Tim Lee Hill of Illinois has lost. The other races are still in doubt. The average age of the House now seems to be have dropped under 50 for the first time since World War II. In fact, the average age of the 94th Congress, I'm told, was just about 50 years old. It may even be a bit younger than that for the 95th Congress, which takes office in January. There are some famous names, or relatives of famous names. Albert Gore, the son of the late senator, has been elected to Congress from Tennessee. John Nance Garner is the grand nephew. Go ahead, Harry. You have a... So you. We have a, a spot development coming up. We want to go out to Bill Redeker in California, where uh, uh, Dr. Hayakawa is coming into the ballroom. For all the work you've been doing, thanks for your generous support, and thanks for, especially for the warmth of your enthusiasm. It's not yet time to crow or to exult because we're only a little bit ahead and only 23% of the results are in. 
But in enormous results are still due in from San Diego County, Orange County, and other places where we know that the support for our campaign is very, very strong. So I don't have any doubt as to the final outcome. But nevertheless, in the meanwhile, let's be patient. Let's watch the figures come in from all the counties. Because it was only, as I say, 23% in yet. 50% are in. And we, I know we're going to be farther ahead. And then when, more, when 75% are in, we're going to be way ahead. <laughs> What can I say to you beyond this to say, let's all be patient and thank you, thank you, thank you. I love you all. That is well, while Mr. Hayakawa is waiting patiently to find out about his own future, I'm sure he'll be fascinated to know that John Nance Garner, the grandnephew of the late vice president, ran for the Congress from the state of Washington, and he lost. And to recap right now, there are only 13 House seats still in doubt in three of the western states. And right now, it's dead even in terms of net gain. Neither party has made a net gain. We're right on where we were when the House adjourned uh, this fall. Now for a look at the Senate. Frank Reynolds. The only Senate race that we're still uh, waiting for is the uh, one you just saw there, Dr. Hayakawa, making his uh, statement. He said that 23% of the vote is in. We have it uh, considerably further advanced than that, 38% in. Dr. Hayakawa mentioned that he expected strong support from Orange County and San Diego County, and the uh, very uh, inconclusive returns that we have from those areas indicate that he is doing quite well in uh, both those places, but they're still quite early. I want to uh, propose uh, that uh, whether you plan to drown your sorrows or celebrate, you might consider raising your glass tonight or this morning to uh, four public-spirited citizens who undertook a rather hopeless task. Uh, they are not exactly household words. Who is Michael Robertson? Well, Michael Robertson is the man who went on the ballot in Massachusetts against Edward Kennedy. There he is, your moment in the sun, Mr. Robertson. He had no chance and he knew it, but he ran anyway. And who is Gerald Brucky? Gerald Brucky is a professor. He is also the Republican candidate for the United States Senate, and he fought hard, but somehow it just wasn't in the cards that he would win. He had the bad fortune to choose to run against Hubert H. Humphrey of Minnesota. I want to tell you that a year ago tonight, as a matter of fact, a year ago tonight, I was on a plane with Senator Humphrey. We were zooming off somewhere. He went to Illinois to give a speech, and I said to him, Have they, uh, are they lining up out there to run against you in uh, Minnesota next year? And he said, no, they'll find some professor who wants to impress his students. That's exactly uh, who they found. And Mr. Brecky deserves a hand for at least trying. I hope he did impress his students. Who is George M. Brown? Well, George M. Brown is a courageous soul who went into the lists against Senator Scoop Jackson in the state of Washington. George Brown, an airline pilot who will now go back to flying high. And what about Stanley York? Stanley deserves a cheer. He uh, took the field against uh, William Proxmire of Wisconsin, and there was never any doubt that he was going to go down to defeat. But when you think about all these people who did this, I'm reminded of, a, of an incident of some 20 years ago when I was a uh, young reporter fresh out of grade school and uh, went to the uh, announcement ceremony when Adlai Stevenson declared that he was going to be a candidate again against Dwight Eisenhower in 1956. And some uh, irreverent reporter said to him, well, you don't seriously think you're going to beat President Eisenhower, do you? And Stevenson looked at him with uh, great disdain that he was capable of summoning, and he said, young man, it is important that the dialogue of democracy be maintained. Well, it is important. It is important. And these four people uh, have helped to maintain it, so I guess that they deserve our thanks. Now for more... Uh, Beautifully phrased and eagerly awaited revelations about the governors, here is Ann Compton. Frank, there is an upset in the making in Missouri, and you can uh, probably blame the energy crisis and consumerism for it. In uh, Missouri, the 
Incumbent Governor Chris, uh, Christopher Bond is running reliably, steadily, 50,000 votes behind Joseph Teasdale, the Democratic uh, challenger who, in fact, tried four years ago. Now, just in the last few minutes, the margin has narrowed up from uh, 52 to 48 to 51 to 49 percent. Uh, but it's a very long, drawn-out uh, call. Teasdale is the older man in the race. He is all of 40 years old. Teasdale, a Democrat who tried four years ago when he was a bachelor and wore turtlenecks and sauntered around, in fact, walked across the uh, state of Missouri. Got a lot of publicity, but not enough votes. This time, Teasdale saved his money, waged a three-week media blitz at the end of the campaign, and has made the utilities his big issue, saying that uh, the people in Missouri are tired of paying high utility rates, which, of course, are regulated by the state. And he said that if elected, he would fire all of the Republicans on the State Utility Commission and replace them with consumer advocates. The incumbent, Christopher Bond, is uh, the young man in the race that is uh, seeking a second term. He is all of 37 years old. Bond is tonight at the uh, governor's mansion in Jefferson City, Missouri, burning the midnight oil as he watches the returns. Uh, in fact, uh, United Press International in uh, the state of Missouri has said that he has lost the state house. Bond was considered a shoe in and he was considered something of a prospect for national office in the future. We will still have to wait and see. It's too close for ABC's news to project uh, now. There is an upset in uh, Puerto Rico in a governor's race there. The victorious party is the statehood party, the party which wants Puerto Rico elevated from a territory to a state. The winner is the mayor of San Juan, Carlos Romero Barcelo, and he has apparently upset the incumbent governor, Rafael Hernandez Colon. The big issue was not, however, state, uh, statehood. Uh, instead, the uh, victorious candidate, Mr. Romero, criticized the corruption and abuse of power in the current administration. And those are the only two results we've got again of the 14 uh, governor's races still waiting for the very slow returns in from Missouri. Everything else has lined up pretty much as expected. Harry? Thank you, Ann. And just to avoid some uh, phone calls that we might get, we should note that Puerto Rico is not a territory. It is what they call a freely associated state. Uh, it's most nearly the nearest thing it would be to be a commonwealth they hate the word territory. Uh, most Puerto Ricans don't want independence. They do want statehood. But the majority of them at the moment want this freely associated statehood that they have now. I should have said that as well. Professor uh, Reisner. Uh, <laughs> uh, we are now sitting in a situation where ABC has projected 257 electoral votes for Jimmy Carter and 160 for President Ford. We are waiting for seven states, which can uh, end that suspense with the odds at the moment heavily favoring Jimmy Carter. We'll be watching those seven states when coming up next we have more of our continuous election coverage right after this. We are here waiting for seven states to get enough votes in and enough key precincts in so that uh, ABC News can make a projection. Uh, seven states and almost any two of which could give the victory, uh, could make Jimmy Carter the president-elect. Uh, seven states of which President Ford would have to take six unless he got all the big ones, in which case he could do it with five. In any case, a situation where the odds are at the moment in favor of Jimmy Carter, but where it is very definitely not over. Uh, it's obviously not going to be a landslide, and either popular vote, which is stuck with a 3% lead for Carter all evening, or an electoral vote, which cannot go very much above the the minimum that he'll need, no matter uh, who gets it. And uh, Theodore White, our expert, says that landslides are not all that good anyhow. Is that right? Well, I was so morbid last time, Harry, that perhaps I should bring some cold comfort to the viewers right now. The squeakers aren't always bad. Uh, anything over 60% of the vote in a popular vote seems to drive a president power mad, or he gets drunk with power. The three men who've gotten over 60% of the vote in recent times were Roosevelt in 36, who went on to pack the Supreme Court. And that was his greatest political defeat. LBJ got 60% plus, and he went on to Vietnam. And Richard Nixon got 60% plus, and he went on to Watergate. So perhaps a squeaker is not entirely bad. And this squeaker, I think, really reflects something very deep in the American people. There's a riptide going. You've had eight years of liberals and they got us to Vietnam and eight years of conservatives and they got us to Watergate. And the next president who has the power 
and can set the rules for this country or make the departure points, we'll have to proceed with caution. He's got an amber light, and however tight the margin, the power is real. Teddy, let me tell you a story. I did some commentaries saying landslides are a menace because they do give presidents exaggerated ideas of their power. One shortly after the last election, Nixon talked to me. I met him in the White House, and he said, I've been listening to what you say about landslides, but you don't have to worry about me. I've got things under control. Two weeks later, Watergate broke wide open. <laughs> well, uh, I flew back just four years ago today with Richard Nixon from San Clemente to Washington. And as we flew over the eastern states, I went up forward to talk with him. And I've never saw, um, seen a man more somber. And I said, you can't, tell, but you can't tell from up here, but there's a landslide building below. And he said, who remembers landslides? He says, who remembers Harding? He said, landslides don't mean anything. And then he went into the most somber and depressed mood which I've ever seen him. And there he was sitting on top of his landslide coming into Andrews Airfield in Washington. <laughs> Thank you, Teddy. Uh, in this election, which we're not going to have a landslide, we probably should at this moment take a look at uh, the states that have been uh, projected by ABC News to see how each candidate has built his strength so far. For Jimmy Carter, if we can get that board up, the top of his triumph in numbers is New York, the second largest number of electoral votes, 41. Pennsylvania, a big one. Texas, Florida, uh, somewhat of a surprise. Massachusetts, North Carolina. Then the whole string of uh, southeastern states and a possible surprise in Missouri, Louisiana, which could have gone the other way. Minnesota, which Walter Mondale uh, assured for him. Tennessee. More south and southeastern states. Mississippi, which uh, took a long time to go for him, but went there. Rhode Island, Delaware, and Washington, D.C. That makes up his 257 projected electoral votes. President Ford's 160 involve uh, almost as many states, but his top number is so far is Michigan with 21. Still up for grabs are Ohio, Illinois, and California with big numbers. He picked up the uh, mountain states, some of the Midwest states, but uh, a lot of the states where there is more space than people. Idaho, Montana, well, New Hampshire is really neither space nor people when it comes in there. Alaska, lots of space. Nevada, North Dakota, Vermont, and Wyoming. That's how it stands as we wait. Coming up next, more of our continuous election coverage right after this. California, of course, still remains a prize with 45 electoral votes, the largest number of electoral votes still up for grabs. It is too soon uh, at this point still to say how it's going to come out. 38% of the precincts uh, are uh, counted in, and Carter has an edge. He has 51% of Ford's 49%, although it had been predicted that Ford would take this state. We don't know yet what that prediction uh, will turn out to be. It is still too close. We want to go now to Frank Reynolds. There's a very important Senate race, of course, in California, Tony versus Hayakawa, and Frank has some news on that. Well, Barbara, the uh, Senate race between Tony and Hayakawa is even closer than the presidential uh, contest in California right now. There's only about a 3,000 vote edge uh, here for, well, a little more than that now, for Tony with 38% uh, of the precincts in, but you see they're both 49%. So uh, that is really even, and it's much too close, much too early to, uh, to call. Uh, I want to point out just one thing about uh, the California race right now. We have some rather interesting statistics. The uh, Democratic candidate, uh, Senator Tunney, is getting 80% of the black vote. He's getting 73% of the Chicano vote, too. But he's also getting 80% of the Japanese-American vote. And that is uh, rather strange, because Dr. Hayakawa is a Japanese-American. Harry? Of course, Frank, he's a Japanese-American from the Middle West, and there aren't very yes. many of those. And that's the national election story at 52 minutes after the hour. ABC News presents Political Spirit of 76. This is the final chapter of this bicentennial political year. Tonight, from ABC News Election Center in New York, the results. Election night. 
The uh, national count goes on. 82% of the precincts have now reported in, and Carter has 51% to Ford's 48%. The electoral votes remains the same. It won't budge on our boards. Ford, 160 electoral votes. Carter, 257. I, uh, you were talking about Mr. Hayakawa, who's running for the Senate in uh, California a while ago. I wonder if you know what his main distinction is. He is the nephew-in-law by marriage of Joe Stalin. He married a Caucasian wife. Her brother married Svetlana Stalin, made him the nephew-in-law of Joe Stalin, but he's not using that as a campaign <laughs> slogan. <laughs> well, two states still give us a great deal of trouble in the Middle West, Ohio and Illinois. If you look at Ohio on the boards, 93% of the precincts have reported in, and the, it's a tie. A Ford, a slightly bigger, uh, 49% than Carter. Illinois, 50% for Ford, 49% for Carter. And then Oregon, which is another difficult state, 50% for Ford, Carter, 47%. Barbara? Let me talk a little bit about what is happening in California. It is still too close to call at this point with 41% of the precincts in. Carter has the edge with 51% to Ford's 49%. If you look, you'll see that Maddox has 1% of the vote in California, and that seems to be the only place in which he did get 1% of the vote. Um, Eugene McCarthy is not on the, he was not allowed to be on the ballot in California. He has asked for a write-in vote and uh, he, he's had already an impact in several key states. He's making himself felt in California even with that write-in vote. The early returns from Los Angeles County show McCarthy with 5,643 write-in votes. As we said, he's not on the ballot anywhere in California. And since write-in votes have to be tabulated by hand, the McCarthy votes may mean it will be some time before we know who is the winner of California's very important, very large 45 electoral votes. Hawaii, the state of Hawaii, um, at, which is usually a Democratic state, shows Carter with the lead 51% to Ford's 49%. It says 100% of the precincts. That doesn't mean that. It means that 100% of the precincts have been reported some votes, some partial votes. Carter leading at this point in Hawaii. In Wisconsin, the other state, which is not yet, uh, which is not yet close enough, or which has not yet reached a decision, 87% of the precincts have really reported, and uh, Jimmy Carter holds a 50 to 48% lead over President Ford. That lead has been fairly constant, but for a number of reasons, including the presence of Eugene McCarthy in that vote, that it is not yet it is not yet possible to call Wisconsin one way or another. There was uh, little no or no surprise in the victory of James Thompson, Big Jim Thompson, the Republican, in the race for governor in Illinois, even though that state has not decided its presidential decision. A crusading former U.S. attorney, Thompson ran against the hand-picked candidate of Chicago's Ma Mayor Richard Daley. And in this case, that was in favor of Thompson, too. This morning, Greg Dobbs was in, uh, is in Thompson's campaign headquarters in Chicago, where there's a feeling of triumph. I tried to point out to the people of Illinois that uh, almost everything that a governor does that's, that's substantial, that's important, involves uh, the legislature as well. If you want a highway, a governor doesn't go out there with a wheelbarrow and a shovel. You know, he waits for money to be appropriated by the legislature. If you want uh, more resources for mental health, the legislature has to provide the funds. If you want a rational plan for school financing, the legislature has to cooperate. There are very few things that a governor can do by himself, and I just thought it was morally dishonest and politically foolish to promise the people of Illinois that A, B, C, and D would be done without even knowing who would be elected with me to the General Assembly. And I think the people of Illinois realize that. Now, it's one thing to state what your intentions are, what your priorities are, and I did that all through the campaign, but I refused to give my word or my promise, and to me they're the same thing, on matters that were the province of both the governor and the General Assembly, and I think the people of Illinois thought that was a refreshing thing. Given that you've just uh, ended a rather bloody campaign and you've beaten uh, a daily picked Democrat, Michael Howlett, how difficult might it be for you to govern? if some of the daily forces in this state are embittered? Well, I don't think they're embittered. Uh, I think they're pragmatists. And I think they've known for some time that uh, their candidate, Mr. Hollett, was not likely to be accepted by the people of Illinois. The uh, straw polls have been very strong and very lopsided. And uh, the mayor is a realistic man. 
Uh, he is the popularly elected representative of more than three million people, and I think he wants uh, the best that he can get for them. And as I've said throughout this campaign, uh, I'm not turning my back on my neighbors in the city of Chicago, and I'm not turning my back on uh, my newfound friends in uh, central and southern Illinois either. I'm going to be a fair share of governor, and I think uh, the accommodations that have to be made in the General Assembly to achieve that can be made. Daley does not control the General Assembly. He may have a dominant voice there, but he does not have the only voice. That was the uh, governor-elect of Illinois, who has won a substantial victory uh, over Mayor Richard Daley's machine there, although Mayor Richard Daley's machine may be part of the reason that Illinois has not yet been uh, projected for either Ford or Carter. The votes are a little slow coming in from Cook County. They do have problems there. But, uh, and the votes are a little slow coming in from six other states. We still have Jimmy Carter with 257 projected electoral votes by ABC News. Gerald Ford with 160. Seven states in doubt, including uh, one for which Barbara is responsible, California. What's happening there now? Well, California, we still have it as uh, too close. At this point, Carter is leading with 50% uh, to Ford's 49%. 43% of the precincts have, the precincts have been reported in. But at this point, it is still uh, too close to call there. It's now what time there? Uh, what is it? About 12 o'clock? Three hours earlier than 3.15. Than, uh, 3.15. So to, it's 12, 12. 12, 12.05, roughly. Mm -hmm. right. We'd like to now go to Cleveland, Ohio, where Ron Miller is with the apparently successful Senate candidate, Howard Metzenbaum. Ron? It appears... It appears, Mr. Metzabaum, that you're here to proclaim victory. Uh, no, that is not the case. You're not ready to I will proclaim? make a statement. Do you think that your coattails will provide sufficient refuge for Jimmy Carter? I wouldn't say anything of that kind. I think that he's made a great race, and I hope he still comes in in Ohio. You've hit the economy very heavily here. Uh, do you think that's been enough for you to win? I think so. I think that speaking to the econ economic issues has been a major factor uh, in my... Uh, the position that I stand in this evening. But you're telling these people you're not ready to proclaim victory? That is correct. You've all been so wonderful. I just didn't have the heart to hold you after three o'clock in the morning. And uh, <laughs> I'm not here to make a victory statement. I'm here to indicate that at this point, on the basis of the projections of the major networks, it appears that we're in a very excellent position as pertains to the possibility, maybe even the probability of a victory. <laughs> A bulletin from United Press International gives the election to Jimmy Carter as the next president of the United States. Uh, Carter required 13 more electoral votes, and UPI gave him Hawaii and Wisconsin, which provided 14 electoral votes, to the best of my knowledge, or 15, 15. electoral votes. And that put him across. Our key precincts in those two states say they're still too close to call, but we're investigating. Coming up next, more of our continuous election coverage right after this. Well, we stand with, uh, well, we don't stand, we sit <laughs> with, with something yet to be decided in this presidential election. ABC News has projected 257 electoral votes for Jimmy Carter, 13 short. United Press International believes that he is over the top. We are waiting until our key precincts in the seven states and some of the seven states, which are still outstanding, can uh, give us the confidence to say this is the way it's going to go. Interesting, you know, that that map that we show from time to time shows a pretty clear delineation with uh, uh, Ford winning almost all the West and uh, Carter winning vast sections of the East and South. But um, uh, the states that Ford is winning, though large, are not populous. 
and that's the reason he doesn't have those electoral votes he needs. And we're still waiting to hear from California. One name that we haven't mentioned, every time we say Carter, I guess it should, we, it should just automatically be there, of course, and uh, Fitzmondale should be getting to the point where he is a very happy man. We don't know as yet how much of the vote for Carter was a result of the popularity of Fitzmondale. It was said that uh, he would very much be helping the Carter ticket, that there were people who were going in to vote for the Carter-Mondale ticket who might not necessarily vote for the Carter period ticket. The Democrats counted on Mondale having a big influence on the Wisconsin outcome for, in favor of uh, Kent uh, Carter because he's considered the third senator from Wisconsin as Hubert Humphrey was for a long time. The western part of Wisconsin is very close to Minnesota. They think of Minneapolis and St. Paul as their metropolis and they, uh, they do think of themselves, they, they do pay a lot of attention to Hubert Humphrey and Walter Mondale. That may be the reason that uh, Carter, with other factors going the other way, Carter is holding a 2% lead in Wisconsin with on 88% of the precincts in. That may be due to Walter Mondale. The polls indicated before, uh, before the election, Lewis Harris uh, indicated that uh, when you presented people with the idea of a Carter-Mondale ticket, it did 3% better than just a straight Carter ticket. Uh, and that's quite a bit for a vice president to bring. You want to bring us up to date on how we tell people how we get our voter returns? I think that would be a good okay. idea. We do it through cooperation with the League of Women Voters. After the polls close in a state, volunteers from the League telephone us with the early vote counts from certain key precincts that we've selected as typical of various categories of voters. Our computers already have the voting histories from those precincts. Our political specialists study the combined data, and when there's enough data, they decide who is won. At the heart of this process are the volunteers from the League of Women Voters in our 3,000 key precincts across the country and at our computer center in Connecticut. The League, you'll recall, sponsored the presidential debates. Now, one of the reasons that we cannot pre project the victor in the seven states yet to be projected is because the keys, keys are in, but they are too close to call. The keys are in the raw vote that we're still uh awaiting from these various states. Well, it's, if, you get, if you get from key precincts, which is a carefully constructed model of a state, if you get a verdict, even if they're all in, and it's within one or two percent, that's within a margin of error that you would not want to go out on a limb on, uh, which is one of the reasons why all of these projections at all of the network through the years have been so accurate, is that we wait until we're sure, or reasonably sure. When you mention the League of Women Voters, there is no way of knowing, uh, since women are persons, uh, how the women's bloc voted uh, tonight. However, before uh, the election, it had been said that women seemed to favor Jimmy Carter and men seemed to favor uh, Gerald Ford. Exactly how that will turn out, we may know at some point. We won't know that tonight. Well, we'll come back to this stalemate. Coming up next, more of our continuous election coverage right after this. An unusually large number of uh, members of Congress, the Senate and the House of Representatives, are retiring voluntarily this year. Frank Reynolds has a report on the senators who are retiring. Frank? Well, Howard, there are eight of them who are retiring. Most of them have served for a good long time, and uh, undoubtedly that was a factor in their decision not to try to seek re-election. Some of them are quite well known, and some uh, have managed to serve in the Senate without attracting much attention outside their own states. For example, there's Paul Fannin of Arizona, he served two terms, deeply conservative. Uh, Hiram Fong of Hawaii served uh, three terms. He too was deeply conservative, uh, but was credited with representing the people of uh, the island state very well. Phil Hart of Michigan served three terms. Probably there was nobody more respected in the United States Senate and nobody more independent too, of very powerful interests within his own state. Phil Hart, a senator from Michigan, nevertheless managed to do battle with the automobile companies and the people of Michigan kept sending him back to the Senate all the time. Roman Ruska of Nebraska will not be back. Uh, he served three full terms. He's deeply committed to the law. He's a member of the Judiciary Committee and worked very closely with former Senator Sam Irvin on the uh, Judiciary Committee. He, unfortunately for him, will probably be remembered for the remark he made at the time of the Supreme Court nomination of uh, G. Harold Carswell, who was a accused of being rather mediocre and uh, poor Senator Ruska said something to the effect, well, there are a lot of mediocre people in the country and they deserve representation on the court too. Mike Mansfield of Montana, 
uh, served four terms as the majority leader, most of that time, really, and he will not be remembered as a man who ever cracked heads. He was an exponent of gentle persuasion, much loved, but uh, not really all that forceful as a majority leader. Hubert Humphrey and Robert Byrd are bidding for that uh, job now, and there might be a change in atmosphere in the Senate. John Pastore of Rhode Island uh, served four full terms, perhaps best remembered for his stirring keynote speech at the Democratic Convention in 1964, one of the few keynote speeches of any time in history that ever amounted to anything or that people might even remember. Hugh Scott of Pennsylvania, the minority leader, served three terms, decided not to make another try again. He's in his 70s now. Uh, Scott uh, has become familiar over the years as the man who would come out of the White House and say that the president's policy was of course right and that the only thing wrong uh, with the country was that the Democrats were trying to torpedo him and so forth. He's a, uh, was and is, I guess, a very partisan uh, man in the sense that he believed in speaking his views quite forcefully. Also something interesting about Hugh Scott, he was a staunch defender of Richard Nixon. He was given some of the uh, tape transcript tape transcripts in the latter stages of that whole tragedy and asserted that on the basis of that uh, he had been shown evidence that indicated Nixon was innocent. He later discovered that he had been shown only partial transcripts and some of the most damaging statements had been left out and he forthrightly declared that he had been betrayed. Stuart Symington of Missouri is not coming back. He served four terms in the United States Senate. Even before then he had been Secretary of the Air Force. He goes back a long ways one of the things that uh, Symington will be remembered for, one of the few senators still around who was involved in the McCarthy years. So was uh, uh, Scoop Jackson of the state of Washington. And both of them uh, more or less cut their teeth in the Senate in doing outright battle with McCarthy and all his works in those days in the 50s. So there are eight of them retiring. Uh, they'll be missed uh, to varying degrees. And some of them uh, certainly uh, probably are irreplaceable. Howard? Frank, I'm struck by the fact that Italian-Americans play such a large role in this country. They discovered the place, as they said, and they built it, and they own a large part of it. Yet there's only one Italian-American senator, and he's now leaving, John Pastore. There is no other. Yes, that's true. Now, I, what would uh, Dennis D. Concini, who's coming in from uh, Arizona, would he be... I don't really know whether he's Italian-American or whether he's a Chicano or... If your pronunciation is accurate, he's Italian, De Concini. The I'm one not I've sure. heard. Maybe it's De Concini. De Concini, if he's not <laughs> Italian. <laughs> but uh, Symington will be a great loss. He was a man with great clout. He was the only senator who was a member both of the Armed Services Committee and the Foreign Relations Committee. He was a member of the CIA Oversight Committee, too, remember? The Mansfield, Mansfield was a likable, a lovable man and a fine man. He served in the Army, the Navy, and the Marines, in addition to being a miner. But he was not an effective leader of the Senate. You could ne never find out what was going to happen in the Senate the way you could with Lyndon Johnson when he was there. I well, the apparently, I, I think everybody agrees that Mike Mansfield was not the sort of fellow that would threaten people. He would not say, uh, friend, you better come our way this time, or there could be problems with some well, of your own pet projects. That's the national nature. election night story after, at two, 22 minutes after the hour. <laughs> we are back, Barbara Walters, Harry Reasoner, Howard K. Smith, and we have a very important return, two returns in. Harry, you begin. In Wisconsin, which has taken a long time, but now uh, ABC News projects that in Wisconsin, Jimmy Carter will win that state's 11 electoral votes by a close margin. The popular vote in Wisconsin with 90% of the precincts in, uh, Carter holds a 50 to 48% lead. With those 11 electoral votes, I think Barbara has an important announcement. Yes, I do. In the state of Hawaii, with four electoral votes, those votes have gone to Carter, and that does it. ABC now projects Carter is the winner with 272 electoral votes. We had wondered which one of us was going to make this announcement. It was the one who got the last projection and it's the four Hawaii votes that on our account has put Carter over the top by our projection. James Earl Carter, the next president of the United States. You know, that uh, Hawaii vote is not surprising. That is Miss Lillian, the 78-year-old mother of the next president, uh, listening to, to probably to so many well wishes, people applauding her. She has said that she will continue to live in Plains 
She said earlier tonight, I'm just a hick, but she's a hick with a son who's going to be president of the United States. The, there she is. Oh, <laughs> you can't keep Miss Lillian down for too long, though. Carter, 272 Ford, 160, and now we'll go from Miss Lillian to Sam Donaldson in Atlanta. Sam? Well, Barbara, I can tell you that upstairs they must be uh, very happy and uh, must be very relieved. There was some nervousness tonight, but I don't think on the part of the candidate or perhaps even on the part of uh, some of his key staff uh, members. I, I really believe Jimmy Carter has thought from the very beginning that he was going to be the next president of the United States. There have been moments during the primaries when he suffered setbacks. Uh, there have been things that he has done uh, to himself. I think he would agree in uh, words that he's used or situations he's gotten himself into that have caused him setbacks. But all along, you just had the idea that here was a man who had a purpose and had a goal and uh, began by pulling himself up by his own bootstraps in this matter and uh, with the help of a few close aides, uh, mapped out a strategy and stuck to it and just kept going and uh, now has uh, apparently uh, reached his goal. Uh, last week, uh, I thought he was nervous in the middle of the week. There were some days it went badly, Wednesday and Thursday in New York, things that were done to his campaign that he really had no control over, but they, they set a tone that was uh, injurious to the final stretch drive. And yet on Friday, it was as if the sun uh, just sort of broke through. They'd uh, lucked over their numbers. Uh, Pat Cadell's uh, polls were beginning to show that they had bottomed out in the erosion that had been taking place. And uh, he uh, seemed to be confident uh, from that moment on, uh, even more so than usual, that he was going to come to this moment. Sam, I once asked Jimmy Carter, I said, uh, a pre new president has nine months of honeymoon before he gets into trouble with Congress. Are you prepared to use those nine months? And he said, I absolutely am. What's he going to do now? What's he going to do tomorrow? Will he start uh, hunting for... A cabinet or what? Well, Howard, he's going to be off and running. I'm sure he'll take a little rest, uh, a day or two. But uh, uh, once on the stump in the last few days, he said rather exuberantly that uh, uh, the moment he became president-elect, within two or three days, he would ask the uh, leadership of Congress, the Democratic leaders, to come down to Plains or at least meet with them somewhere and start mapping out a program. He's already said that he would present a proposal for welfare reform very quickly and uh, that uh, before uh, long he would have proposals for uh, other things. Well, we want to go to Miss Lillian again now, Sam. We understand she's very near you there in Plains. She's been wearing that T-shirt, obviously, under her coat almost all of the evening. It says Jimmy Carter in 76. Well, from this jubilant mood of uh, Miss Lillian, we go to Washington to a very different mood. Tom Jowell reporting on the White House right now. Yes, Barbara, unless someone wakes up the president, uh, he has uh, told his aides he thinks he's going to win, and he's gone to bed and apparently gone to sleep. Uh, he did that on the basis uh, of the... Uh, situation uh, of uh, about 15, 20 minutes ago uh, when UPI had indeed uh, called the uh, election for uh, Jimmy Carter, but uh, none of the major television networks had yet called it. And uh, he told his uh, aides uh, to go out and tell the reporters that he still thinks he's going to win. And he went to bed on the basis uh, of the election being undecided, uh, as his press secretary put it. Uh, he is sending word over to his supporters in a nearby hotel, uh, supporters that have been gathered by the thousands all night waiting for a victory celebration, uh, to tell them that they can go home. And uh, he is not planning on going over there and issuing a concession statement uh, tonight. 
Instead, we're told that uh, he has retired. But I might add a, a small footnote to that. Uh, we've had a lot of developments here in the last five minutes or so, and uh, it's entirely possible that uh, Mr. Ford may have been lingering just a bit longer, or some of his aides uh, may feel now that the news merits waking him and giving him the late-breaking developments as far as the electoral vote counts. Uh, so we may have some type of statement from him tonight, but so many races are so close, and because the White House wants to contest at least a recheck of that uh, return in New York State, uh, I would uh, guess at this point that he wants to have uh, more returns and a more definitive answer to the election, probably coming in the morning after he's had a good night's sleep. Okay, back to uh, New York now. We want to go to Ms. Lillian again. She's talking. She's talking in Plains, Georgia. Can we pick her up? I, I was invited to come to Atlanta tonight, and I wouldn't have gone for anything because you're my folks, and you have been with me all the time, and I'm sticking with And who's going to stay till Jimmy comes home? <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. I tell you, I don't think I'll be at the White House much. But in case I am and y'all come, I'll know who you are. <laughs> My granddaughter, ha! <laughs> we walk in, we walk in, we walk in. Not that it matters any longer, but we have a projection of a victory in an individual state. ABC News projects that uh, Carter will win by a close margin in Illinois. So that, uh, if he already has the victory, that seals it. I beg your pardon, I've made a mistake. Uh, it was Ford who, whom we projected as the victor in Illinois, not Carter. We should uh, probably take the time now to look at uh, how Jimmy Carter put together his so far 272 projected electoral votes on the little scorecard that we've been keeping all night. His biggest victory was in New York, 41 votes, and that's, of course, the state that is possibly going to be contested by the Republicans. There's been a court order issued to impound voting machines in New York City because of suspicions that there may be something wrong with them. He also took Pennsylvania with 27 votes. In a way, that's remarkable, Harry, because the worst demonstration against Jimmy Carter was at Scranton, Pennsylvania, on the subject of abortion. So he uh, was worried about Pennsylvania. Well, he took Texas with 26 votes. That took a long time to come through, but in the final uh, way that the, the popular vote is going there, he's winning by a strong 7% in Texas. He took Florida. And Florida was predicted that it would go for Jimmy Carter, but it was one of those states that could have gone to Ford. Uh, and Ford sure would have wanted to have that, but uh, as we see, it did indeed go to Carter. As did Massachusetts. And Massachusetts, of course, was expected uh, to go to Jimmy Carter. That would have been amazing if it hadn't. Massachusetts, the only state that went to George McGovern, a strong democratic state, and Massachusetts early on went for Carter. North Carolina was uh, considered all the time leaning to Carter, but could have gone the other way, but Carter pulled it out uh, by a close margin. And that marked the destruction of George Wallace's uh, presidential ambitions. In the primary, yes. Georgia, uh, not unexpectedly, went to Carter, his home state. Missouri was a surprise, or at least it was something that was uh, could have been a toss-up before the actual vote came in. Wisconsin, which was one of the last two states, one of the states that put him over the top with its 11 electoral votes, he would have had it earlier and more surely, except for uh, Eugene McCarthy, who took about 2% of the votes in Wisconsin. Wisconsin vote surprises me a little, Harry, because he almost lost to Udall in the primary there. A third of the state is Catholic and worries about him. And uh, the Democrats have carried a presidential election only once in the last quarter century in Wisconsin. Well, he did very well in the cities, and he barely took the Catholic vote, according to our early analysis. Louisiana, he won. But uh, keeping the South solid for him, Maryland, Yes, Maryland, he won almost in spite of the machine. The machine didn't like him. They were for Pat Brown, and indeed gave Pat Brown his, uh, Jerry Brown, and gave Jerry Brown his biggest success. Minnesota, there was not much doubt of. Uh, his vice presidential candidate comes from there. Hubert Humphrey comes from there. It's Democratic territory in presidential elections. Tennessee, 
Tennessee was an important uh, border state for him to take, and he took it convincingly. And carried along a, uh, a, a senator named Sasser, whom no one had ever heard of in Tennessee five months before, but Carter had his 52nd birthday in Tennessee with Sasser and put Sasser on the map. In Alabama, where uh, George Wallace gave him his support, went for Carter with nine votes. Kentucky, another border state. South Carolina, which uh, again had been considered leaning to him all the time, but which uh, was important for the solid South. Mississippi, which took a long time. Mississippi took a very long time. It was quite late in the evening that Mississippi came through for Carter, and there was a question of, of the, the Southern, the, the Southerner in Mississippi uh, being the, the winning reason, because Mississippi has been in the past a Republican state, but they couldn't resist having a Southerner there, and so Mississippi, with its seven votes, went to Carter. Arkansas, strongly Democratic, no particular problem there, no particular suspense. West Virginia. There wasn't any particular doubt that that would go Democratic and go for Carter. Hawaii, uh, by ABC's count, was the state that put him over the top. That's right, but there really wasn't very much doubt there. Hawaii has been traditionally Democratic, but they do have, by, at least by ABC, the distinction of uh, making the next president the winner. Rhode Island and Delaware were both toss-up states. They could have gone either way, but uh, they went for Carter. And Washington, D.C. is just overwhelmingly Democratic for anybody, Carter or anyone else. So that's the vote, 272, two more than necessary to put him over the top, 272 to so far Ford's 186. And not that it matters at this point, but we still haven't heard from California, we still haven't heard from Maine, at least on my lineup. We'll come back and we'll try to give you some profiles of Carter and the people around him and what might happen to some of the Ford people, where they might go uh, after January when they're no longer in office. More continuous election coverage after this. It is Jimmy Carter, 52-year-old Jimmy Carter, whom ABC projects as the next president of the United States, father of three sons and one daughter. We're going to see a lot of that now. Nine-year-old Amy, she was eight years old when we first began to uh, pay very close attention to her, by 272 elections electoral votes, two more than he needed. Jimmy Carter projected as the next president of the United States. Well, Jim Kincaid has been lounging around in Plains, Georgia, having a very quiet, soft time, but I'll bet it isn't quiet and soft there right now. Jim, you're not lounging at this moment, are you? Not at all. <laughs> Miss Lillian, I suppose I don't have to ask you how you feel. You're going to tell me, aren't you? Oh, yeah, I feel wonderful. I've been through so many wins and losses tonight, I'm just sick. I'm just so glad he is he had last his run. Everybody here is so happy because I'm the happiest mother in the world right now. You've been up a long time, Miss Lillian. What do you plan uh, to do the rest of the evening? Go to bed, I hope. <laughs> I don't know. I'm going to stay here till Jimmy comes. Miss Lillian? Uh, Miss Lillian, Barbara would like to ask you a question. Yes, I'd like to ask Miss... I don't hear a thing. Miss Lillian, can you hear me? I she can't hear me. Jim, Barbara, can you Ms. hear me? Lillian is unable to hear you. Jim, Just suppose I give you the question. Okay, you? fine. I'll relay it. All right. Would you ask Miss Lillian if at this point she has talked either to her son or daughter-in-law? Has she had any communication with them? Have you talked to uh, either Jimmy or Rosalind? No. Uh, my sister called me about two hours ago and, and told me that Jimmy told her to call me. But said he'd be late getting home, but he said wait for him. Do you expect to be here when he gets back? Yes, I do. You're going to stay down here? Oh, yeah. If anybody does, I will. I haven't heard a thing. You have me there. Can't hear a thing? Well, the, the nation is hearing you, Miss Lillian. Right. That's all. No, that's all that matters. Perhaps we'd like to hear about your plans once uh, your son has moved into the White House. Uh, well, what I'm going to stay in Plains. Okay. The rest of my life, I hope, I'm tired of traveling. And I hope I never do have to help anybody else in a political race. And I want them. This is Jimmy. Thank you, Miss Lillian, very much. Barbara? Thank you, Jim Kincaid. That's Miss Lillian, the 78-year-old mother of Jimmy Carter. Rosalind Carter's mother is also living. She's 70 years old. Miss Lillian has said that she's going to help her son take care of the problems of the elderly. Well, we're going to have more coming up next, a good deal more of our continuous election coverage right after this. We are back with our election coverage. ABC has projected Jimmy Carter the winner with 272 electoral votes. 
Jimmy Carter has already uh, said some of the things that he will do with his first 100 days. You see the electoral votes there, Carter 272 and Ford 186. California still has not come in with its 45 votes, but it won't make a difference now. Anyway, as I started to say, Jimmy Carter has said some of the things he will do those first 100 days in office, and these are some that he promises to do, to have a blanket pardon to draft dodges of the Vietnam War, and also to set up review boards to decide the cases of the war-era deserters, and perhaps pardon those who went AWOL. He's going to ask Congress for authority to reorganize the executive branch to cut 1,900 federal agencies down to about 200, and he's going to launch a year-long study of the federal tax system to simplify it and eliminate loopholes. Those are some of the things he said he'd do those first 100 days. And on July, uh, whatever the day was, at Madison Square Garden, when Sam Donaldson talked to him as after he finished his acceptance speech, and asked him how long it would take to do all these things, he said, oh, he'd have them all done by the end of his first term. He's modified that some. Presidents tend to modify what they would think they're going to do. You remember when uh, there was a great debate as to whom uh, Jimmy Carter would choose as his vice presidential candidate, and when uh, Mondale's name was announced, Ms. Lillian turned around to Sam Donaldson and said, thank God it wasn't you, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, she, she probably didn't mean it, she was teasing Sam. Well, she wanted us to keep a good reporter. Of course, Rosalind Carter has said that she's also going to have her projects. What she cares most about, she has said, is uh, mental health. That's something that she wants to work a good deal in. Um, Joan Mondale cares particularly about the arts, and she wants to uh, encourage the arts in this country and perhaps uh, implement what she calls a civil rights bill for artists. So the women who have played an important part in the primaries hope to play an important part when they actually get, uh, get to... Uh, president and uh, vice presidential wife positions. I suppose one area where it won't make much difference is in foreign policy. There will be obviously a new Secretary of State. Secretary Kissinger won't have to decide now whether he wants to stay on for two more years. But in actual policy, it won't make that much difference. Uh, in foreign policy, no. I shouldn't. I think in domestic policy, it will. I think Democrats are different from Republicans. I think that they will. Uh, they do believe in more government action, and Republicans believe in less. And I think that uh, Jimmy Carter's indicated that with several specific proposals, some of which Barbara mentioned, while Ford has vetoed many, many actions that uh, Carter would have taken. Two but possible uh, conjectures for Secretary of State, uh, Zib Brzezinski, who's a professor at uh, Columbia, and Cyrus Vance, who is a lawyer, but Jimmy Carter has been his own man about this, and nobody knows yet who the, uh, he's not uh, in any sense given any direction as to who it might be. That's the National Election Night story at 52 minutes after the hour. It's now 4 o'clock in the morning in New York, 1 o'clock in the morning in California, where they have not yet decided who they want to be president of the United States. But uh, ABC News believes that that's academic, that the rest of the country has decided that Jimmy Carter will be the next president of the United States. 88% of the nation's precincts have now been counted. And Mr. Carter is holding a 51 to 48% lead, which has been, been going on since 8 o'clock. It hasn't deviated one percentage point since then. Uh, about 36 million votes to President Ford's about 34 million votes, about a 2 million vote margin. In electoral votes, according to ABC News projection, uh, Jimmy Carter has got 272, two more than the 270 minimum needed. Gerald Ford has 186. There are a couple of big states still to be decided. One little footnote to the evening, Eugene McCarthy, the independent candidate, the hero of 1968, who may have been decisive in a couple of states that went to Gerald Ford by drawing votes away from Jimmy Carter. He spent the night on a commercial airline flight from California to Washington. There were only a few reporters and no election backers on hand to greet him at the airport when he hit Washington. They asked Eugene McCarthy for a comment, and he said he had nothing to say. You know, this is uh, going to be a very tough period, of course, for Jerry Ford. We have not had an incumbent uh, who has uh, lost since uh, mm -hmm. Herbert Hoover, and that was back in 1932. Only seven times in American history has uh, an incumbent president not been re-elected. It's a sad historical footnote for Gerald Ford. Oh. And we're, Go ahead, we're talking here, yes, as we are waiting, uh, we understand that Jimmy Carter is shortly going to make an appearance, and we're waiting for that. Barbara, a republic is very unkind to its politicians in office, but once they're out of office, it tends to be very kind to them. So Jerry Ford can choose 
between running for Congress and getting $47,000 a year or becoming a lawyer for a big firm and making $100,000 plus a year. He had said that he was going to uh, retire from Congress. Now it will be interesting to see whether he indeed does that. And right now, down at the World Congress Center in the Omni Center in Atlanta, Georgia, we believe we can call in Bill Wordham where they are having a victory celebration. Well, Jimmy Carter has just entered the hall with his uh, family and his close friends. He's just up on the podium now. And at least, in spite of the lateness of the hour, there's still a good 20,000 people here to welcome him. His sons. I can see uh, over the heads of the crowd his sons and their wives standing on the podium, looking expectantly down toward the uh, VIP aisle where uh, Jimmy Carter and the uh, Secret Service escort will be passing at any moment. Uh, it's been a long wait. It's 4 o'clock in the morning here in the East. Uh, the last hour or so, I've seen several people dozing off, several people going home. Presumably, they have jobs to go to tomorrow morning, or this morning, rather. But the vast majority of the people have stayed here. Ah, we're now uh, seeing some more heads pass across the top of the crowd. I'll see if I can identify them for you, if I can. Hamilton Jordan, the uh, campaign director, is there. Greg Schneider is one of the uh, campaign brains, one of the men who helped direct this campaign to victory. Just approaching the uh, platform now is uh, Carter's press secretary, Jody Powell, who is more than just a press secretary, he's a confidential aide. And now it would seem that Carter himself is entering the hall. These final steps tonight must be the lightest he has taken on this 22-month long journey to the presidency. He said over and over, and especially in the last few weeks, that he did not intend to lose. And uh, there were some of us who doubted that, but apparently he knew better. I believe you can hear, Harry, the, uh, the ovation he is getting here from this tired but very, uh, very gleeful crowd. Everybody's on their feet, standing on whatever they can stand on. Chairs. There is Jimmy Carter now, up on the platform. That's his wife, Rosalind Carter, and the press wife, Jess, standing next to him. Greeting friends, relatives, his sons. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Let me say just a word. Let me say just a word to you. This This tremendous crowd at four o'clock in the morning represents hundreds of millions of American people who are now ready to see our nation unified. And I want to congratulate the toughest and most formidable opponent that anyone could possibly have, President Gerald Ford. As I've, as I've said many times throughout this nation, he's a good and decent man, and no one could have 
a campaign that had to be so thoroughly organized, hard fought, and which has marshaled so much cooperation from hundreds of thousands of people around this country who've had confidence in me. And I pray that I can live up to your confidence and never disappoint you. We have a great nation, as you know, and sometimes in the past we've been disappointed at our own government. But I think it's time to tap the tremendous strength and vitality and idealism and hope and patriotism and a sense of brotherhood and sisterhood in this country to unify our nation to make it great once again. It's not going to be easy for any of us. I don't claim to know all the answers, but I have said many times in my campaign around all 50 states that I'm not afraid to take on the responsibilities of President of the United States because my strength and my courage and my advice and my counsel and my criticism comes from you. And if I can tap the greatness that's in you and in the American people, we can make our nation's government great and a source of pride once again. Are you proud of our nation? Do you think we can help to unify it and bring it back together? Do you think we can put our people back to work? So do I. And I'll do the best I can. I'll do the best I can during this transition period from now until next January to continue to learn how to be a good president. And I've learned in the last 22 months, I believe as well as any human being could have learned, what our people are, what we have been in the past, and what we can be. And I believe that this next four years, that we will have a sense of purpose, a sense that the government belongs to us, a sense that we participated in this campaign, and now I welcome all of those in the United States, whether they, like you, supported me or supported Mr. Ford or someone else, it's time for us to get together, to correct our mistakes, to answer difficult questions, and to make our nation great. I want to thank all of you. I love everybody here. You've been great to me. Thank you very much. It's a remarkable it's a fact that uh, in Let's January, to this to man could have walked great once again. I'm depending on you like I have in the past. I'll try not to disappoint you. Thank you very much. I've not been recognized by anybody, and now, within the year, he is president-elect of the United States. I think there are some of us here at ABC, Howard, who might take some small pride. Three or four of us talked to Jimmy Carter uh, in this building just about one year ago, and after the conversation said, uh, we may have talked to the next president of the United States. Mm -hmm. but, uh, it's just that there aren't enough people at that time to talk to him, but he clearly stood out from the mob of Democratic candidates at the time. So, Jimmy Carter, 
Jackson with his three sons and his daughter and his sisters and brothers-in-law surrounding him. Down at, uh, in the building in Atlanta is Sam Donaldson, who's been almost a member of the Carter family for the last eight or nine months. We're right here at the uh, steps. Uh, Governor and Mrs. Carter with Amy uh, between them, uh, uh, giving his famous victory sign to his supporters down here. And they're standing here. Uh, they have just, as you know, delivered uh, to the crowd uh, his uh, speech of uh, victory, saying that President Ford was a good and decent man, uh, that he was a worthy opponent, uh, but that he uh, now felt that he was in a position to uh, learn to be a better president himself as the days went on. Hamilton Jordan just coming up, his campaign manager. Jerry Rafshoon, the man who brilliantly ran his advertising campaign. Pat Cadell, his pollster. Uh, Frank Moore, who uh, helped him in the southern states and was a coordinator just now embracing him. Uh, Jody Powell, his press secretary, who started out with him as a driver. Phil uh, Lewis, uh, who uh, helped him out in several key states. Phil Wise, rather. Uh, many of his advisors uh, and some of his key members coming on the stand with him. We're all in it together. We're partners. And I'm looking forward to the next four years. Thank you very much, everybody. And uh, some of his family friends uh, from Plains in the background. Of course, most of the people on the stage are his family, except for those advisors who came up here at the last. Uh, Mrs. Uh, Carter's uh, traveling companion and uh, press uh, secretary coming up in the red dress to say hello. Uh, now let's see, perhaps uh, they're looking for some other people to thank. Vicki Rogers, who was the first uh, scheduler for the campaign and scheduled us all into those horrible hotels in the uh, 18-hour days, but apparently with some efficacy. Other members of uh, the governor's uh, family and uh, staff, and, uh, he's coming down here now. Governor, congratulations on your victory. I'm sorry? Congratulations on your victory. Thank you very much. What's well, your next uh, step? I'm going to go home and uh, celebrate in Plains. When do you think you're going to start putting your cabinet together, Governor? I don't know yet. Well, that wasn't much, but at least we have some idea that I think we all already had, which was that he was going to go home and rest and Don't celebrate there, of course, in the early morning hours. Don't and then uh, maybe in a couple of days, uh, put the family together. Or rather, put the cabinet together. I guess the family is together. Sam, uh, it should be noted that this is a celebration without a concession. Uh, the last we heard from Tom Darrell was that President Ford had gone to bed, believing that he was still going to win in an undecided election. And so far as we know, there has been no statement from the president. Right. that relationship and that's Charles Kerbo, the Atlanta lawyer who first encouraged Jimmy Carter when he was uh, had lost the, the uh, race for state senator. That's a long time ago. Some time ago uh, someone noted that at 3.15 this morning President Ford went to bed thinking he will win, the White House reported. I hope he's not subject to what happened to Charles Evans Hughes in 1916 when he ran against Woodrow Wilson. He had a big lead in the night, so he went to bed. A reporter banged on the door in the middle of the night. The butler came out and said, uh, the president's asleep. And the reporter said, well, when he, you wake him up, tell him he's not president. <laughs> uh, we're coming up next, more of our continuous election coverage right after this. We now have a president-elect, Jimmy Carter, but a president, Gerald Ford, who has not conceded the election and may indeed have uh, been asleep for the last couple of hours. That was the last report. And also standing by in uh, Arizona, the man who was Jimmy Carter's probably most indefatigable opponent in the primaries. Now we're going to talk to Morris Udall, but right now in Minnesota, we have the vice president-elect, Walter Mondale, coming out to make a statement. Walter Mondale, who may have had something very substantial to do with Jimmy Carter's close victory. Mrs. Peterson, do you hear me? Mondale was picked by Carter after uh, a rather elaborate search through the possible candidates. 
designed to wipe out the memory of some recent unfortunate right vice now. presidential selections. Hello, Senator. What are you feeling? Great, great. Everything's much easier. He's making Here's his going. way slowly to a podium. Roger Peterson is in Minneapolis with him. Roger? Yes, sir. Senator Monitor uh, has just arrived here in the uh, uh, ballroom. The crowd has been waiting very anxiously for the past uh, 50 minutes ever since the victory was protected. There's the senator up on the platform now. This group has been waiting very patiently all night, and it's been up for grabs for about the last 35, 40 minutes. Uh, people who had left earlier seem to trickle back in, and the place is jammed wall to wall with people. That chant of We Want Fritz that you heard coming in, that was the senator's son throwing some apple cores out to the people. The senator and his family up there on the podium, and listening to the cheers, pretty soon we'll have a statement from him. I assume it'll pretty much echo what we heard from uh, Governor Carter down in Georgia. That was piped in here, and the crowd reacted here just like they did down in Atlanta and at Plains. Here is the senator. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. In the in the proudest, we we got to get this over with sometime. In the proudest moment of my life, I am proud to say that I'm I've never been more honored than to be the vice president with one of the greatest men in American history, Jimmy Carter. Thank you. President Carter, President Carter, no, no, President Carter, President Carter is going to be one of the great presidents in American history. He will help unify this nation. He will help gain momentum again. He will help us return America to full employment and to the kind of compassionate and caring nation that we want to be. He will need all of us, regardless of political party, he needs the help of every American, and I know that he will have it in the great task that's ahead. I want to just thank everyone for their help, for their kindness, for their understanding, and for their love. There are so many in this nation that have helped make this victory possible, and I'd like to just name a few. First of all, my family. Joan and I are terribly proud of Teddy, of Eleanor Jane, and of William. They've been great through this whole campaign. <laughs> and
And the best campaigner in the Mondale family is standing to my left. She went all over this nation tirelessly, effectively, in my I had the best staff that anyone could have. <laughs> and three of them are on the platform with me tonight, but they represent the whole staff. Dick, 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 Dick Moe, Mike Berman, Jim Johnson, And while he's not here tonight, he's been with me every day of the campaign and every moment of my public career. And tonight, Minnesota showed what they think of that great man, Hubert Humphrey. And I want to especially thank everyone here and the citizens of this marvelous state of Minnesota. You've been kind to me, you've been understanding, and I'll never forget what this state has meant to all of us. Now, now the job of running this country is ours, but we cannot, we cannot do it without your help and without the help of all Americans and without the help of Republicans and Democrats and all Americans. We must reunify this nation. We must get back to work. We must do those things that show that special dimension that we call America. We must do it again, and we will. And with that, I want to thank all of you. It's after curfew. You're all supposed to be in bed now, but I can tell by the look on your faces that might be a little while off. Thank you all, and we'll see you all at the inaugural. Thank you very much. We've been watching Senator Walter Mondale make his uh, victory speech in the Lemington Hotel in Minneapolis. Uh, he is also uh, uh, making it in the absence of a concession statement from the incumbent president. But uh, he is part of a state which now be, might be called the mother of vice presidents, Humphrey and now him. And uh, we're, we're going to talk more about the results of this election after we pause uh, briefly for our stations to identify themselves. 4.30 a.m. in New York, and the first president of America's third century has been elected. Jimmy Carter, a Southerner, a Democrat, uh, has at the moment 272 electoral votes according to ABC News projection, and there are still some states to be decided and a couple of important races to be decided. We had started to talk briefly a little while ago before we went out for Walter Mondale's talk. We had started to talk to Congressman Morris Udall, who kept at it longer and in, overall with more general success in the primary competition against Jimmy Carter than any other Democrat. He never quite beat him, 
but he came close a number of times. Congressman Udall is standing by in Arizona. Can you hear me, Congressman? I'm with you, Harry. Still uh, alive out here in Arizona. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that uh, has interested people, including the pollsters, is uh, Jimmy Carter's selection of Walter Mondale. There's a suggestion that it may have helped. Do you think it helped him win in this narrow election? Yes, uh, when you win by this kind of a narrow margin, uh, anything that has any appreciable impact helps. Fritz Mondale was, uh, was Jimmy Carter's first big decision. It was the right decision, and uh, I'll always believe that he added one or two percent to the margin, and we might be having a different story here tonight if he hadn't picked him. Do you think, you think uh, Senator Mondale will be an influence on the administration as a part yes. of the election? No, oh, I think he will be. Uh, you know, all the presidents say, I, I'm the, for the first time, I'm going to make the vice president really an important part of this operation, and they never do. But uh, Fritz Mondale uh, knows how to get attention, and I think he's going to demand attention, and I believe Jimmy Carter will maybe give him a little bit uh, larger role than we've seen in the past. In the case of a president who has no Washington experience, I should think Mondale will be more valuable to him than in, in other cases. He'll be even more uh, critical, as you, as you indicate, and... Uh, Jimmy Carter's going to learn some things about Washington. We're all going to have to help him. And uh, I, I think he's a good man, and I think he's going to do well. It's, this crazy system of ours worked. It's kind of a poignant evening for me to sit here thinking where he was and where I was a year ago. But Let me ask you something. Uh, is it ironic to you that in the one state where you almost beat him, it is, that is the state that put him across and gave him the presidency? Wisconsin? Yeah, yeah it really is. Uh, you know. Uh, the, it was only six months ago we were in Wisconsin that night. It seemed like six years, and 1% or less than 1%, Jimmy Carter won and out of there got the momentum that gave him the wins in Pennsylvania and so on. But uh, this is a skillful politician. He's a good man. He's a skillful politician. He had uh, the right kind of game plan, the right kind of hustle, and he got the right kind of luck at just the right point uh, all throughout the year. Mr. Udall, you said a moment or two ago that Jimmy Carter is going to have to learn a few things about Washington. Uh, it, what advice would you give him about having to deal with the Congress? Work with the Congress, take him into your confidence, uh, learn how it, how it operates. There are key people in the Congress, not only in the leadership but in the committees, uh, that you're going to have to have. My second piece of advice would be to use that honeymoon. There's going to be about 90 days, 100 days early next year when uh, he's fresh in Washington, when people will listen, when they'll give him the benefit of the doubt, when the Congress will go all out. And that thing can pass, as Lyndon Johnson saw very quickly, and I hope Jimmy Carter will use that 100 days. Congressman Udall, what about your future? You're a young man still. You look like, uh, you look healthier and less tired than you did at the end of the primaries. <laughs> Do you look forward eight years from now? No, you know, the generations come and go. I was thinking of the Republicans tonight, Reagan, Rockefeller, Goldwater, now Gerald Ford moving off the scene. The struggle for the succession in the Republican Party starts this morning with the younger generation coming aboard. We give our presidents eight years, and Jimmy Carter's going to get eight years, and uh, at that point, uh, you'll have a whole new generation of Democrats. Tonight, uh, Muskie, Humphrey, Jackson, George Wallace, uh, some of this generation move off the stage. I don't expect to be much of a factor in 1984. I'm probably over the hill, and if there's one thing worse than being over the hill, it's being over the hill and not knowing that you're over the hill. Congressman, you know, I don't think you're over the hill. Thank you very much for talking to us. Okay, good luck. Good. <laughs> sure. We were talking to uh, Congressman Udall, and we have talked before about the, uh, the impact of the vice presidential candidates in this election. It's something Lou Harris has measured. Lou, do you, uh, you agree that uh, Walter Mondale may have been a smart decision on Jimmy Carter's part? Yes, Harry. Uh, our polls throughout the course of the last two months have shown that Senator Mondale, when we mentioned him in the ticket, that is a Carter-Mondale versus Ford-Dole ticket, consistently added two points to the Carter column. And these two points were in the north. I think all night we've seen this three-point margin that Carter's been running ahead. But in the north, outside of the south, it's been dead even. Now, if Jimmy Carter had been trailing by those two points all night long, that Senator Mondale, we can prove, added to the ticket, uh, he might have lost this election. I'd say that the debates between Carter and Ford didn't seem to have much effect, but the debate for, for vice president between Mondale and Dole, Mondale won decisively, 55 to 29 percent. So that debate might have been very critical. 
I'd say that uh, Jimmy Carter owes Fritz Mondale a lot tonight, just maybe the selection. But then Jimmy Carter had the good sense to pick him, Harry. <laughs> Thank you very much, Lou. We'll be continuing our summation of this long and interesting night when coming up next we have more of our continuous electric election coverage right after this. We still have some states which have not decided who they want to be president and not only who they want to be president but in some cases who they want to be represent themselves in the Senate. And beginning with Howard K. Smith, let's sum those up. Well, I think the foremost of those states uh, that are undecided, I think California will be decided when time comes, but is Ohio. Ohio with 97% of the vote in. Now the two candidates have less than a thousand votes between them. 49%, a big 49% for Carter, a small 49% for Ford. And in Oregon, with 78% of the votes uh, precincts reporting, Ford is ahead, 49% to 47%. And that's where we leave them. Well, going from east to west, Maine is still undecided. 49% uh, of the vote for Ford and 48% of the vote for Carter with 97% of the precincts in. And then going all the way across the country to California where it was predicted that Ford would win. At this point with 70% uh, of the precincts in, Carter is leading with 58% of the vote to Ford's 49%. And if Carter takes that, then the pollster in California, Fields, who's uh, uh, very highly respected, will have been wrong. Speaking of being wrong, there are uh, three bellwether states, that is three states that have been right in so many elections that people look at them, and they have all been wrong in this election. That's New Mexico, New Jersey, and Connecticut. They went to Ford. And, and now we're going to go, we're going to go to, uh, uh, to we're Frank uh, Reynolds. No, we're to going Lou to Lou Harris. I'm sorry to tell us why the election went uh, as it did. Lou has some thoughts. Lou, the question is, what are the three reasons why the election turned out the way it did? Harry, I mean, Howard, uh, <laughs> the three things really going for Jimmy Carter in the end were, one, he wasn't out of Washington, D.C., which was thought to be out of touch with the country. Seventy-two percent thought he's a man of high integrity, and he consistently showed real compassion for the underdog. Sixty-nine percent felt that. And in the end, those gave real substance to Jimmy Carter's claim that he should be president. Thank you very much, Lou. There's uh, at least one big senatorial election as yet undecided and an interesting uh, story of those races tonight. Frank Reynolds? Harry, it's the uh, only senatorial contest that uh, ABC News has not been able to project a winner, and that is, of course, in the state of California. All the others, all 32, actually, we've... Uh, projected uh, the victor but in california now with 71 percent of the precincts in you can see how incredibly tight this race is it's just opened up a little bit now uh, even as we speak with hayakawa the republican candidate uh, moving ahead now by one percentage point 49 percent over uh, the incumbent democratic senator john tunney the key precincts report that we're getting is a little bit ahead of the uh, raw vote uh, total which is reflected on the board here and according to our uh, uh, key precincts, uh, Hayakawa still has a two-point lead in the uh, key precincts uh, throughout the state. Also, the returns are coming in rather slowly from certain Republican areas of the state, where Hayakawa is expected, of course, to do quite well. He is winning very big in uh, Orange County and in San Diego, and in some other Republican counties, uh, they seem to be having problems in getting the votes uh, counted. So Hayakawa's strength on the raw uh, vote total boards there may not be uh, truly indicative of uh, his final strength. And at this point, although it's been seesawing back and forth all over the place tonight, uh, Hayakawa seems to be in a fairly good position, and certainly he's within striking distance of unseating a Democratic incumbent, John Tenney. Now, there, as I said, all the others have uh, already been determined as far as ABC is concerned, and there are quite a few of them. We'll run down the list for you very quickly. Moynihan in New York, unseated Jim Buckley. Metzenbaum beat Taft in Ohio. Heinz beat Green in Pennsylvania. Sasser beat Brock, another incumbent ousted in Tennessee. Uh, Don Regal won in Michigan over a Republican candidate, even though President Ford carried the state. Uh, Zorinsky, a Democrat, won in Nebraska. That was not uh, widely expected. Stafford, uh, Senator Robert Stafford, the incumbent, won as uh, expected, really, in uh, the state of Vermont. 
In Connecticut, Lowell Weicker won re-election. An upset in Utah, Orrin Hatch, a Republican, defeated a Senate fixture, uh, Frank Moss. In Indiana, Vance Hartke was defeated by Richard Luger. In Montana, the Democratic candidate, uh, John Melcher, won as expected. In New Mexico, Joseph Montoya was retired by Harrison Schmidt, the former astronaut, who now moves on to the floor of the Senate from walking on the moon. In Arizona, the Democratic candidate, Dennis DeConcini, won. In Texas, Benson took it without any problem. Sarbanes won, as expected, in Maryland. And that uh, removed uh, J. Glenn Bell, the Republican incumbent. In Missouri, the Republican candidate, John Danforth, won. Even, yes, he won there, even though the governor apparently is having some difficulty, the Republican governor. In Delaware, Senator Roth won re-election. In Rhode Island, John Chafee, uh, the Republican candidate, won, taking the seat now held by John Pastore. Massachusetts, Kennedy, no surprise there. Minnesota, Humphrey. And let's see, is that the rest of the list? No. Pete Williams won in uh, New Jersey, as expected. Jackson, Muskie, Proxmire. Uh, Harry Bird Jr. in Virginia. Lawton Childs, as expected, in Florida. But a surprise in Wyoming, where Gail McGee was defeated by uh, Malcolm Wallop, a state senator. Still some more. No uh, surprise about Cannon. Burdick won in North Dakota. Matsunuga won in Hawaii, taking a seat now held by a Republican. In West Virginia, and in Mississippi, uh, both Byrd and Stennis had up, uh, no opposition. The count, as the way it goes right now, shows 62 Democrats and 37 Republicans. The current count in the Senate, 62 d d Democrats and 38 Republicans. But we're still waiting, of course, for that one a very important state with 71% of the reports in, with a very tight race between Hayakawa and Tani. All right, Ann? There's racist Frank. Uh, Republicans may lose one seat. It's still a neck-and-neck -neck battle in, in, uh, sorry, in Missouri. Kit Bond, the uh, incumbent Republican, can't get any closer than about two percentage points behind uh, the Democratic challenger, Joseph Teasdale, still running a good, uh, oh, it has been 20,000 votes ahead all evening. Taking a quick look at the states which have come out uh, with uh, winners or losers this evening. Beginning in Illinois, Jim Thompson got he, what he wanted, the governorship as a Republican and a comfortable one million vote uh, margin. Washington State has Dixie Lee Ray. North Carolina's Lieutenant Governor James Hunt moves up uh, to governorship. West Virginia has a Rockefeller. This one's a Democrat, John D. Rockefeller IV. North Dakota is hanging on to its fiddle playing Governor Arthur Link. Vermont is uh, taking a Republican this time, Richard Snelling. Uh, Montana, it's Thomas Judge hanging on despite uh, a Watergate that has hit him and his state incumbency. Utah, a Democrat, Matheson. Scott Matheson beating a Republican. Rhode Island will have its Lieutenant Governor, Joseph Garrity, move up to Governor. New Hampshire, Meldrum Thompson hanging on, the Republican who uh, has a comfortable 58% of the vote. In Delaware, a Republican takes over from, an in, uh, from a Democrat, Pierre DuPont, the congressman. Arkansas, David Pryor, no trouble being reelected as the Democratic governor there. And in Indiana, the same is true of Otis Bowen, the uh, Republican comfortable margin of reelection there. Again, only one uh, state in jeopardy, that is uh, Missouri, and that would be the only change of hands. If uh, Kit Bond loses in Missouri, that will be the one gain by the Democrats. Don Farmer has a lot of race to say grace over in the House of Representatives. Well, I will surprise you by not running down the 435 uh, newly elected members of the House of Representatives. I can tell you, however, however, that the Democrats have kept just about the same number they had before, almost a two to one majority. Even so, the 95th will not be a veto-proof Congress because Democrats being what they are, a diverse and diligent bunch of characters. So when President-elect Carter, as president, begins his effort to reorganize the government, for example, he will find that the Democratic-controlled Congress will not roll over and play dead for him. Uh, he will have problems with government reorganization, he will have problems with tax reform, and with energy, perhaps. One thing that is significant, I think, that Watergate Democrats' landslide of 1974 has become the landfill of 1976. The Republicans can't uh, kick around those Watergate freshmen anymore, calling them simply uh, aberrations. They're there to stay now, at least uh, for the next two years. They are important. The Congress then, uh, with five seats left undecided, still too close to call. Two to one Democratic majority in the House, important for Jimmy Carter. They're going to enjoy working with him, but he'll not find them totally cooperative at all times. And that's the way it looks in the House right now. Harry? Thank you, Don. Throughout the evening and the morning, uh, Theodore H. White has been with us. And uh, 
Do you have some final thoughts, uh, Theodore H. White, on what has happened to us in the last 10 hours? Well, what, I, what we've seen tonight, I think, is a rupture of historic dimension in American political life. This is the first president in 50 years who's not come up through the corridors of the East Coast in Washington to national fame. This man has come totally from the outside, as no one has done since Woodrow Wilson. It's been a small town band of men who've analyzed the North and the East as if they were picking apart joints and reaching nerve pressure points. It's been a spectacular performance, cleanly and well fought. But I think the real test comes now, whether these people who have taken apart the old system can somehow translate politics into power and make a government, make a government work. That's their real test, and we're on the threshold, possibly of the greatest change since the New Deal in 1932. Back Thank to you, Harry. Thank you, Theodore. Eddie, we, we have some time now for some final thoughts among uh, Barbara and Howard and myself and the man who has actually been on the air more than any of us, uh, seven minutes out of every half hour, who sits up at a direct, uh, at 12 o'clock high for me, Steve Bell, who's been <laughs> handling uh, a portion of this broadcast throughout the evening. I have only one final thought, and it's this. I, I, don't, I don't want to reveal how I voted, and I'm not revealing how I voted. But I will say that... Uh, there is a tremendous disappointment for me in Jimmy Carter becoming president, and it relates back to something somebody said to me in 1960, and I didn't understand the significance of it then. He said, you know, for the first time in my life, the president of the United States is going to be younger than I am. Now, in this case, Jimmy Carter will be less than a year younger, but I hate it. <laughs> Barbara? I just think of some of the familiar names, names we've grown so used to. Men who are going to be looking for jobs in January. Uh, the Secretary of the Treasury, William Simon, he's talked about running for governor of New Jersey. Of course, Henry Kissinger, maybe he'll write that book for which it says that he may receive $2 million. Ron Nesson was a reporter at NBC. Will he go back to becoming a reporter? Will he, will he write that book? What will happen to Press Secretary Ron Nesson? Jim Lynn, the budget director, well, he can go back to being a lawyer. Alan Greenspan has a business in New York that he can go back to, an economics business. Dick Cheney, the president's chief of staff, uh, he does not have a job. At one point, he was a broker. Donald Rumsfeld, at one point, was a congressman. He can go back to that, but there are going to be a lot of names. It's taken us a while to get used to, and now we have a lot of new, fresh, and primarily young faces and new names to recognize. Earl Butts had already retired. But, uh... I'd like to get from Steve Bell you know, the thoughts that he's gotten by being 30 feet higher than the rest of us during the evening. Steve? Harry, it's been a real education up here in the ABC Crow's Nest, looking down and listening in on the rest of you most of the evening. But as you know, I also am an Iowan, and I think I got uh, my first revelation on Jimmy Carter during the Iowa caucus last January when we were out there. And I went back to my hometown of Oskaloosa, because uh, I wanted to see what all this attention was doing to a typical small town in Iowa. And I knew the people there. I knew who ran the Democratic Party. I knew who the real workers were and what should have been happening. And we went into Oskaloosa and spent three days and found out that something very different was happening. This guy, Jimmy Carter, had come in and he had attracted people who were not necessarily political traditionalists or activists, but he had gotten them convinced that he could do something special. And Jimmy Carter carried the town, the county, and of course the Iowa caucus. And I think that one thing we should note in these final moments tonight is not only that he had a good organization, that eventually he had the Democratic Party, uh, that he had Walter Mondale to help him with a couple of percentage points, but Jimmy Carter was the only candidate who from the very first said, hey, I realize we've all got a political pain in the stomach. There's a crisis of the spirit in the secular sense in this country, and I'm here to help you do something about it. We're good people, we're a good country, and if we just love each other and get together, we can do something. And it sounds maudlin coming from anybody but him, but I think it was a factor. And now he has to deliver on it. I'd, I think like, that's true. I'd like for our final, final comments to turn to our Dean, Howard K. Smith. Well, Harry, the <clears throat> historic feature of this to me is that a Southerner, not being anyone else's vice president, has made it on his own for the first time since Zachary Taylor, since long before the Civil War. I don't think people who have not been raised in the South 
realize how regional the South is, and the rest of the nation unconsciously looks on it as the most regional of regions, and the South looks upon itself as the most regional of regions. There's a separation between the South and the rest of the nation. It's been there a long time. It's caused complexes. It's caused some magnificent literature by people who have exploited those complexes, like Tennessee Williams and William Faulkner, but those complexes have not helped. And now I think they'll go because we have now a president who is a southerner who made it on his own from the south. Thank you, Hard. I'd like to mention the uh, literally hundreds of people, it looks like hundreds of them just in this room and at all the remotes and all the other places who have helped ABC News put this evening on and who have helped us. I'd like to say good night for them and thanks to them. And good night for Barbara Walters, for Howard K. Smith, for Howard K. Smith, and for me.